Good morning, everyone. This is Dana Rhodes with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And I would like to welcome you all to the third annual Spotted Lanternfly Summit. Uh, this is our first time doing a virtual summit, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We still have several people joining, but this is the day that we will have research highlighted. Uh, so it will go until 4.50 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, we will have extension and communications. And then Wednesday, we will have operation and also um, our stakeholders talk. So if you have not signed up, there are spaces still available for Tuesday and Wednesday, and we hope that you will join us. But again, thank you all very much for um, um, being with us today. We are recording the session and it will be made available um, after uh, this week. And we will let you know when that is available. We do ask if you have questions that you please use the Q&A uh, for our panelists. We have people who are uh, monitoring that and we wanna make sure that we get your questions answered. If we do not have time to answer during the speaker's time, uh, they will be able to answer those questions and that will also be included in the link for the information that you have. Um, so please, again, use the Q&A and not the chat. Uh, the chat can be uh, for all of you to, to use uh, for conversations on the sidebar. Um, but again, all questions should go in the Q&A. Greg Parra is going to be the lead today, so he will be introducing our researchers as they come in. And so, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dana. I don't know if everybody can hear me okay or not. Um, today is, as everybody who has received the agenda or, or registered knows, today is the research day. Um, so we're definitely going to try and fill up, we should be able to fill up the entire day with research presentations from a variety of speakers from a lot of different institutions and organizations. So uh, we're gonna start off with um, Penn State University. And even though I um, only have three speakers listed here, there's quite a lot of research going on at Penn State. Some of which you'll probably hear some of the crossover or mention of um, some of the mm. other work being done too in some of the presentations. So now it's a little bit early uh, before the 9.15 start. Um, you know, after the introduction, but we can go ahead and get started. I see there's still people joining and uh, coming in. So I'll try and keep up with the um, questions as they, as they go along so the uh, presenters don't have to. And after each presentation, we'll take a few minutes to answer questions. Um, I'll try and pick out, uh, I might not be able to get to all of them, but definitely try and pick out um, some of the questions that come in on the Q&A. And again, as Dana said, it'd be really helpful if you'd definitely use the Q&A and not the uh, the chat uh, section. All right, thanks. So I don't know, if, Julie, are you are you ready to go? Yep, so, I'm all, re all ready. So we'll start off with Dr. Julie Urban from Penn State to begin with. All right, thanks, Julie. All right, thanks, Greg. Can everyone, can you hear yep. me and see my screen? All right. Yes. Great, so good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present here today. So I'm the first of three speakers. Um, Dr. Joe Keller will be um, following me and then uh, Dr. Rick Rausch after, after him. Trying to have an all day symposium. <laughs> good morning, hi Julie. <laughs> so, um, so basically the work I'm going to present today is, uh, is work that I've been doing, um, but also uh, a lot of it has been led by Dennis Calvin with the help of John Rost. And so Dennis Calvin, many of you know, he's, um, you know, uh, after 18 years of being um, head of extension and, and then a longer time period after being a faculty member, today is Dennis's first day of retirement. So um, cheers to Dennis and I'm presenting his work. <laughs> okay, so to get started, I want to share with you um, the life cycle of spotted lanternfly. This is something we're all familiar with. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but as I shared with um, those of you who attended the spotted lanternfly 101 um, day last Thursday, uh, I, I, I think about this in a little bit more of a complex way. And this is what I'd like to share with you today because I think that uh, this kind of summarizes 
uh, the additional complexity and challenges we have and we're experiencing with spotted lanternfly that you'll see in the work I'm going to present to you today. But I also think this rings true, certainly for what Joe Keller and Rick Roush are going to present, but hopefully this can um, be like a cognitive aid for you to integrate uh, across all the different studies you're talking, we're studying, you'll be hearing about today. Okay, so we have, you know, our, our univoltine spotted lanternfly life cycle. And, and basically what I'm trying to do here is just to overlay a few of the known um, preferred hosts of lanternfly on here, just to show there's a, a certain complexity involved. So take, for example, grape, okay? Grape is one particular uh, host that spotted lanternfly feeds upon in all of its life stages and can be found upon, it can be found in all of its life stages occurring in grape. And so you say, okay, well, can we, you know, what if we just did, had great uh, control efforts, highly targeted to grape, would that, would that work? And, and basically what you know, if you spend any time in vineyards is that, yeah, there's lanternfly in vineyards, but they're always moving constantly in and out of vineyards. Similarly, you know, it's most preferred host, we would say is Ilanthus. And so certainly, you know, in the uh, early adult period, if you have, you know, lanternfly in your yard or your researcher going to places where you want to find lanternfly for your studies, you know that in, you know, July, early August, these things aren't moving at all. They're very sedentary and you can literally get thousands off of an individual ailanthus tree. But I, to me, I think that that um, sedentary period of their life maybe has made some of us a little bit complacent because they might not be moving then, but they're moving all the rest of the time. And so even then, you know, there's a period where in um, early September, we see them take off and likely that's because Ilanthus is starting to senesce at that time, but also it seems to have something to do with their mating behavior. And so we see it move off of Ilanthus, but again, moving in and out throughout, at that time, we'll see that red maple is often a preferred host, but even still, it's not on maple all year round. And similarly, walnut might be a preferred host for fourths. So I guess my, my point here is that even if we're considering only a very limited number of hosts, that still this movement across them and consequently across the habitats that these that other hosts are found in, be they agricultural, um, disturbed, habitats, uh, railways, roads, um, industrial, agricult uh, agricultural, natural, and, and fragmented forests, that, that there's a lot of complexity here. And so what I'm going to talk with you about today are some of, some of our studies that I've been involved with that um, basically look at tracking um, lanternfly movement and behavior across these different life stages. And it seems to me that really one of the keys that we're missing and that a lot of the work that uh, we're doing at Penn State uh, is trying to provide is to better predict when and where lanternfly are going to occur to, to improve our control. And, and a lot of what I'll be talking about today are models that we're developing to predict when lanternfly occurs in different stages. And so uh, the first that I want to mention is that a student of mine, Dr. Erica Smyers, um, uh, basically uh, did some work to predict uh, hatch and to develop degree day based models for spotted lanternfly hatch. Uh, I misspoke, She's, she hasn't defended yet. I, I want her to be Dr. Smyers so badly, but it's uh, Erica is a, a PhD candidate. And so anyway, um, Erica in 2017, she uh, caged over 100 individual um, lanternfly egg masses and daily recorded uh, the numbers that have hatched. She also did a series of um, uh, reared lanternfly using growth chambers in the lab under a, a series of, uh, of temperatures. And, and from that, she was able to um, develop uh, predictive models and, and fit those to what she observed in the field. And so one of the take home here, take homes here is that we're interested in whether or not um, lanternfly development occurred at a comparable rate as uh, what was documented to, to occur in South Korea. And so here, what you can see is when we fit those, uh, you know, the data to, the, to these curves from Erica's uh, work and from the Korean models, they're not statistically significantly different. We see similar developmental rates. And even if we're using, you know, each of these studies uh, had a different um, base threshold, but all pretty much matched um, what we observed in the field. And then Andy DeShane and um, Doug Pfeiffer at Virginia Tech 
um, also observed field hatch and recorded it, and we validated our data against that. And so basically what we have now is a publicly available model um, that you can go to PestWatch and put in, dial in your calendar date and look at what proportion of eggs would have hatched based on the growing degrees for that particular year. And so this has been available on PestWatch, but as we speak, um, Steve Crawford uh, at Penn State is expanding this to include all of the US. So for those of you in other states where you don't yet have lanternfly, well, that's not very optimistic, where you are fortunate to not have lanternfly, but are concerned or suspect that there might be a new infestation, you can use this map in order to uh, determine when hatch would be expected to occur. And hopefully that can be useful to you to um, target any searching you might wanna do. Um, so this map, uh, it ultimately will be available on the Penn State Extension Spotted Lanternfly site. Um, but before that, we have our USDA NIFA funded SCRI grant. And so um, hopefully this week, uh, that national map for hatch will be available on stopslf.org. And so we're currently working on predicting the timing of other stages of lanternfly, um, of lanternfly life cycle. And so with that, I wanna move on to, okay, tracking um, the other stages. Again, uh, this is all field-based um, work. And so this is a study that was led by Dennis Calvin and John Ross, who's at Penn State Berks, um, helped collect uh, insects and data for this. And so for this particular study, it was done over the course of 2019 and 2020. And so basically what they did is they tracked um, lanternfly in a, um, in a residential development in the suburban area of Wyoming. And so what you can see here is that it's a, it's a housing area where when it was built, um, red maple, were, were planted. And so these are all similarly aged red, red maple. And uh, Dennis and John put sticky band traps on these trees and, and went out weekly to um, record those numbers, replace the traps and to record and then actually collect uh, individuals for, for me. And so in 2019, here, what this is showing you is the average um, number of lanternfly per tree. And so in this development, uh, 2019 began with an average of 475 eggs, not egg masses, but eggs per tree uh, that had been laid in 2018. And so if you look at then the numbers of first, seconds, third, and fourth instars that were, that were trapped, um, certainly this looks like the population was suppressed. This was a study that was doing trapping. And so you know, this could have been a combination of trapping, natural mortality, um, migration, insecticides were applied um, in that housing development by others, it's not part of the study. So it certainly looked here like the population was suppressed. And so what do you know? As I pointed out before, these suckers move, okay? And so basically once the adult emergence was completed, you had really high numbers of adults moving onto those trees. And so um, by the end of 2019, so if we, if we look at that and we say, okay, this is the same scale, how many, all right, if you look at this, you have 615 average adults per tree. And then that scale, that still says 615, but that scale jumps considerably when you look then at the average number of eggs laid per tree. And so, so basically these females came in, um, it seems that they moved quite a distance looking at the area around the subdivision. Um, and again, that's, that's not something that was measured at the time and this is kind of you know anecdotal, but basically they had to come from somewhere and they came in and, and laid a lot of eggs. And so essentially what you see here is the number of eggs laid at the end of 2019 was seven times the number that had been laid in 2018. And so this suggested two things. And the first was that, wow, it really looks like 2020 would have the potential to be a boom year, you know, that would see a, a major um, 
outbreak of lanternfly in this area. And then the, the second question was, well, where exactly, you know, besides speculating that they came in from a distance, you know, out of this housing area, where did these females come from? And so that's what they set out to uh, look at the following year by looking at individuals on uh, Tree of Heaven, as well as on Red Maple. So Tree of Heaven in the area um, next to this housing development. And so what you saw here is now this is a, a cumulative number, but basically what you see then is if you have a lot of eggs, certainly you know on those trees, you're gonna have a lot of nymphs on your sticky bands. And so again, this is, this is cumulative, but you see a lot of first instars. And again, you see that dropping off. But if you look at the 2020 is blue and 2019 is gray, um, you don't see an appreciable boom overall in lanternfly. By the time you get to uh, adults and eggs, you have, you have a comparable number. And so with this, then, okay, again, we saw that um, likely due to trapping, natural mortality, local movement, you know, they moved away from those natal trees, but came back again as adults. And so here, uh, what, what Dennis and John did is they tracked a number of females and males separately uh, that they collected and observed in red maple, which is the, the um, basically the orange and the blue um, versus Ilanthus, which is yellow and green. And so what you see is that something that uh, other researchers have anecdotally observed, you see a, a difference based on sex in terms of where these insects are. And so it basically you see earlier in the season in mid August, um, most of the males, the proportion of males are predominantly found on red maple versus few females on red maple. Most of the females at this time are on Ilanthus. And then that crosses. The males ultimately like drop down likely because of male mortality in that late season, but then you see this movement of females onto red maple. And I think you can kind of see it better here in this graph, where if you look at the total number um, of insects on Ilanthus, okay, as these dash lines, you can see that earlier in the season, most of those are female. And then you see males moving onto red maple followed by the females. So again, this is an interesting sex-based difference here. And so what Dennis did is then he basically looked at the timing of the emergence of each of the life stages of lanternfly over time. And it's a busy graph, I'll walk you through that. But, but basically um, looked at uh, second, third, fourth adult instar emergence um, as a function of host in this case and developed, uh, you know, looked at that in terms of degree days. So what you see here is, you know, this first is the um, hatch period. But what you see is um, a slight shift in, in the timing of emergence for insects, depending on whether, and again, whether they were collected on Tree of Heaven or Red Maple. So what you see here is that you get a peak of second instar emergence on Tree of Heaven, just before you see that on red maple. You similarly see that in third instars a little bit earlier of a peak compared to red maple. It, it looks like that, that staggering is getting a little bit um, wider where you see fourth instars in Tree of Heaven versus red maple. And then here you see adult emergence on Tree of Heaven prior to this dark red line over here, adult emergence on red maple. And so, Overall here, these are just multiple lines looking at males and females, reflecting that you have this um, adult activity on Ilanthus across this range. And Dennis's assertion that this period of adult emergence is influenced by the host that they're feeding upon. And then where you have this earlier period on Ilanthus, then red maple. But interestingly, the fall egg mass deposition seems to reset synchrony for this location. And so certainly, you know, we're, we're working to develop these models further, and, and I'll show you that in a second. But basically what we think is that, you know, by having these timings, uh, having this worked out in a degree day model, that, that basically this can target our management. So if we want to deploy stickier circle traps, we want to have them ready before first, first instars hatch. And then, you know, perhaps um, we would use sticky traps 
traps for the earlier instars, but we would perhaps target systemic applications to fourth instars and, and whatnot. And so again, if we have better models for predicting when these insects occur at the various stages, that can help our management. And so this is what Dennis uh, has handed off to us. He worked out um, these logistic equations to predict a percentage of completion of each of the different life stages. And, and with that, that will be the basis of, of some models. And so here you see this is preliminary. Again, this is just based on uh, those collections of insects from Ilanthus versus red maple. But basically this is um, showing you predictions of um, what degree of uh, adult emergence on these two hosts versus egg deposition, what percentage of the population hits those landmarks at how many degree days. And so then the another useful application here is that we can say, okay, um, how does this compare for red maple versus Ilanthus in terms of percentage of completion of adult emergence? So um, these maps, again, they're not publicly available yet, but this is what we're working on. And here then looking at um, how much oviposition we could expect by a certain period of time on red maple. And so here, again, these insects, they weren't controlled, they weren't necessarily known to only be feeding on red maple versus Ilanthus. These are our wild insects. And so um, basically this is then where some of my work is plugging back in. Oh, here, actually, um, this is actually uh, hot off the press as of yesterday that Steve Crawford is, is going to expand these maps then once we have them for the entire US. So you'd know what to look for when. And so what's going on in this late season? And, and here, this is where um, rather than uh, counting on um, what the insects are feeding on based on where you collect them, uh, my take on it is if we can look inside the insect through dissections, the insect can better tell us how developed it is. And, and we could see then if there's a difference based on host, but this might be a more stable indicator. So certainly in that period of late season movement, uh, the insects are feeding, okay? And so you have two lanternfly females. If you've seen me present before, you've seen this picture because these females were collected only one month apart. And that gives you a sense of, of how much they're feeding and how much they need to fatten up to develop their eggs. And so taking uh, live weights of adults, males and females over the course of five weeks at a vineyard, um, we see that uh, you know, across five weeks, females will increase their, their mass by over 50%, males by 26%, so also still large, and that's just within five weeks. But here, what I'm trying to do is with the insects that uh, Dennis and John Ross collected from red maple and ailanthus, um, I'm looking at this area of yellow, um, lateral yellow on the uh, the abdomen, also on the ventral side of the abdomen, to look at that area and connect that with internal indicators of female development. And so here, uh, what I do is these are um, insects where I imaged them and took the area of this exposed degree of yellow. And here, I'm plotting this out by host. I have, um, I will be able to overlay onto this uh, insects collected from grape. Uh, from vineyards that I've done, and this extends out into November. But just to give you a preliminary view, basically in doing these dissections, I'm looking to determine um, how many have made it or, and at what time does mating occur. And so here is a photo I took of a spotted lanternfly spermatophore. Uh, that was um, a male and a female uh, in copula were collected and uh, by, by our Brian Walsh, who works for Penn State, and uh, I was able to um, collect that spermatophore uh, right right at the time. And so here, if we if we look at uh, preliminary data from my vineyard samples, we can see that um, I would expect, as I dissect these out, we'll see that most of that mating occurs um, near the end of September. And here I had some samples that were collected by John Ross from Walnut. And, and actually that very large female in the previous picture was from Black Walnut. So, so with this, we'll be able to determine um, whether or not we see a difference based on host in terms of that uh, degree of development. 
Um, similarly, in these dissections that I'm doing, I'm looking at degree of egg development, uh, spermatheca development, that's basically where the, um, the spermatophore is housed. And, and so with that, we'll try to get at some of these questions, you know, when are um, lanternfly mated and females at a greater risk of infesting new sites with new clutches? When does egg laying start and end? How many eggs do females produce? And how many egg masses do they produce? And so Tracy Lesky, who will talk with you later today in her colony of spotted lanternflies, she sees evidence of, of them laying between one and three egg cases with an average of more than one. And, and here, um, what's important is that we have Tracy's work, you know, rearing them in a colony. Uh, Kelly Hoover it has been um, testing the extent to which they might need ailanthus um, in cage studies. And, you know, that's all fantastic work. But what we want to know is um, it, it's hard to rear a lanternfly in captivity. So we don't know if under those artificial conditions, they might be nutrient deprived. And so from the work that I'm doing, uh, this is going to give us an index or, or, or a sense of what is the reproductive capability um, or of quote unquote wild lanternfly, um, because that can be like provide somewhat of a landmark to help us interpret these more um, lab and, and field reared uh, lanternfly. And certainly um, I'm interested in whether or not development changes by host. And interestingly, are there degree day limits on female reproductive development? And so this is what's kind of interesting that I'll close with is that putting together um, some of what I'm doing with what Dennis is doing. And if we look at this degree day pr progression, we see that, um, you know, it basically you get adult emergence, you know, over a pretty big time window here. And, and it essentially to go from, for 50% of the population to go from egg hatch to adult, that takes 1150 degree days. But then to go from adult to egg laying, that takes another 820 days. And so that's extremely interesting. This is based on, again, those data that, that Dennis and John collected um, from the land and fly they picked up on red maple and tree of heaven. But certainly uh, this is what I'll try to validate with the dissections because if it is the case that it does take that relatively long time window um, for lanternfly to become reproductively mature, potentially that would limit uh, the northward expansion of lanternfly in the US. So certainly we're working on that. And finally, just to wrap up, uh, the, the work that I'm doing with the dissections and characterizing kind of this ground plan of lanternfly reproduction is it, it all started uh, to, to try to determine um, uh, the mechanism by which lanternfly transmits its obligate endosymbiotic bacteria to eggs. And so like many other sap feeding insects, plant hoppers in general and lanternflies in particular um, are feeding on uh, nitrogen poor sap. And so they have some elaborate uh, co-evolutionary relationships with bacteria that they actually house in organs that provide them with amino acids that are missing in their, in their diet. And so um, the lanternfly family, Fulgority, has two species of these bacteria uh, that synthesize amino acids. And then this third one is one that I'm describing. It's unique to lanternflies. And from genome assemblies that I've done, we know those two other symbionts are synthesizing amino acids. This third looks to be synthesizing lipids and fatty acids. And what's cool about this whole system is that, as you can see here in the scientific name for this bacterium, which we call the sausage, it changes its color and it actually moves. As those legs, eggs develop, these endosymbionts become um, their morphology changes and they migrate into the developing eggs so that they're transmitted vertically through the eggs. And so as I work through female reproductive development, try to characterize when these are, these might be sensitive time periods for um, easier control of lanternfly potentially, but also we might develop some either chemical or other means for disrupting symbiont transmission. That would be a highly specific way to target lanternfly. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank folks in my lab, um, USDA, APHIS, NIFA, um, Penn State, 
and PDA for, for funding. And I want to point out, um, we have our SLF SCRI CAP project website, stopslf.org, if you want to see updates on our research and that um, a catch model for the country. And so with that, that is exactly 25 minutes, my share of the of our talk, I'll hand it over to Dr. Joe Keller. I, I could, uh, I could okay. there's just a couple of questions there, Julie. Okay, cool. First. I was answering some of the others, but I know there was just one in there now about, I know Dennis had talked to me about this, so, but you can answer this is, uh, why was the, you know, the base temperature uh, 8.14 degrees Celsius uh, to calculate uh, degree day development, but um, the 10.4 was in that map, 10, it was being used for geographic model. So, so the 8.1 came from the Korean studies, but then um, based on the work that uh, Erica did, and we combined all of those data sets, and, and there, uh, that's where we came up with the 10.4. And so all of these models now have been shifted to the 10.4, because that represents the, you know, the, all of the data taken together. Does okay. that answer? Yeah. And then, uh, there was also the quite that um, there was a question about Wolbachia too. I know it's come up before also. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so Wolbachia, um, I, I've done a lot of, of sequencing of the abdomens of, of lanternfly, and there is some degree, sometimes there is Wolbachia, but but basically it's always less than one percent of the total sequences. So, so pretty much if you know, in, in a lot of these that work, I would get maybe 40,000 DNA sequences, you know, after cleanup and rarefaction and, and 98, 99% are those three endosymbiotic bacteria. And so they're just the majority of who's there uh, because um, basically those colonies are so large, you can even see them in those organs, right? And so um, Wolbachia does not seem to be prevalent at all in lanternfly that I've detected. All right, and I, I had missed one also from there, but there was a uh, from Sam Barnett asking that there was seemed to be uh, an estimate of a reproductive rate of around 17. And is there a better estimate of the reproductive rate? Seven. Uh, I'm not sure with seven, 17. Is that? Yeah, I wasn't sure about that either. So, so basically, um, uh, egg, egg masses with, you know, range from about 30 to 60 eggs uh, in, in one case and um, females can lay between one and three. And so, so if you're saying um, how many, you know, how many uh, offspring are you going to get from two lanternfly? Um, I would, I would put it more toward the, you know, 30 to over a hundred. Um, one of the things that I'm very interested in is, uh, you know, in, in looking at um, the uh, lanternfly that have laid multiple egg cases that Tracy's lab, you know, is collecting for me. And, and the question becomes, you know, lanternfly don't lay all their eggs at once. You, you look inside and you can see that they'll eat, 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 develop a clutch and then lay it. And then subsequently the remaining, uh, you know, uh, ovaries develop further, you know, into more mature eggs again. And so the question becomes if they move south or move to um, warmer regions and you have uh, you know, warmer temperatures and more plants available to feed, how long can you keep feeding? Because uh, other lantern flies or other plant hoppers in the family Fulgority um, in the tropics, they'll lay one egg case and that has well over hundred individuals. I've counted as many as 200. And so this, the size of an egg mass of 30 to 60 for Lycorma is kind of low for what we know from other fulgorids. All right, thanks, Julie. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention at the top too, just for, cause I've gotten one or two questions to remind me of this, but these sessions are being recorded. So if there's slides or things that people are interested in, you will have a chance to go back and look at those. Um, and if I remember correctly, that eventually they'll end up where Julie had referenced, you know, the um, the egg hatch prediction will end up at it, stop slf.org. So I know Dr. Joe Keller is all, all ready to go. So uh, I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Joe Keller, who's also with Penn State. Okay, is that sharing okay? Yeah, good. looks great. Okay, great. Yeah, so today I'll talk about a couple projects uh, we've been working on, focused on sampling spotted lantern flies, and then touch on a couple other pieces of work from uh, Dr. Kelly Hoover's lab. So first we'll talk about a project focused on quantifying 
spotted lanternfly egg mass dispersion patterns and thinking about sampling egg masses. And then next I'll talk about sampling across densities and throughout the year at outlier satellite populations of spotted lanternflies. And then a couple of other projects, this uh, cage experiment investigating spotted lanternfly performance without access to Tree of Heaven, Alanthus altissima, what's preferred host, and also a community science project focused on predation by natural enemies in the United States. So this first project is focused on egg masses, and egg masses are an appealing target for sampling to estimate spotted lanternfly abundance because they persist throughout the winter months. So once they're laid in fall, they're available for you to go count throughout the whole winter when there's less other field work to do. And uh, also old and new egg masses are visually distinct and we can hopefully apply some methodology from other pests with similar egg thing, have it possibly some gypsy moth methodology might be useful here. So just for people new to spotted lanternflies, I thought I'd show a few pictures of egg masses. Here's one very freshly laid on the left here that start off pretty bright. Uh, this, the white one is fresh laid and there's old egg masses also there. So they really piled egg masses on this particular branch. But then over time, they kind of darken in color and become gray like you see on the right here. and get some, uh, the waxy coating on the eggs can kind of crackle sometimes. And new egg masses can be laid uncovered. You see on the left here, a bunch of egg masses or several egg masses laid without a waxy covering or on the right, you can see egg masses laid, new egg masses laid with a waxy coating on them. And they lay eggs on a variety of uh, substrates, some of which they're easier to see against than others. So this left one's a slightly harder to spot egg mass against a bark that more closely matches the coloration of the egg mass. And then you can see an old egg mass here on the right with the exit holes where nymphs have hatched down of those eggs. So our objectives with the study was first to characterize uh, egg mass dispersion in the across the landscape, and then second to determine the height distribution of egg masses on uh, spotted lanternflies preferred host tree of heaven. So we were interested in egg mass dispersion because the dispersion pattern determines the sample size that's required to estimate the abundance of egg masses uh, with a given precision. So egg or any organism that you're interested in quantifying the abundance of can have a dispersion pattern that ranges from uniform, so spaced down evenly across the landscape, to random to a clump dispersion pattern where they're uh, clustered together. And as you move from uniform to a clump dispersion pattern, you uh, generally require more samples, the more clumped the dispersion pattern is. So in order to do to quantify the dispersion pattern for egg masses, we looked in five woodlots and set up four five by six, four meter radius plots per woodlot. And in these woodlot plots, we counted all egg masses below three meters in height on each tree and also on other surfaces, the way eggs on rocks and on fallen branches and logs as well. And we found in these woodlots that egg masses were aggregated, more aggregated than random. So they require relatively large samples to precisely measure the abundance of lanternfly egg masses. So this is the, the sample requirement curve with 25% precision across a range of egg mass densities. And uh, for a broad range of egg mass densities, you require about 80 of these plots to accurately or precisely estimate the, the number of egg masses the density of egg masses there. And this, the second goal here is measuring the height distribution of egg masses on Tree of Heaven. So in order to quantify this, we went to three different sites and felled Tree of Heaven at these sites. So we looked at 71 trees across these three sites. And after trees were cut down, we looked in three meter sections at the height of the tree, counting all the egg masses that we could find in those sections. And we found that most egg masses were laid above three meters high. So you can see here, this is uh, the distribution of egg mass heights in three meter chunks uh, at the different sites. So sites are shown in different shades of gray here. So you can see it's really a very small proportion of egg masses that's laid uh, under three meters in height. And the bulk of the egg masses are laid higher between nine and, and 18 uh, meters high on these trees. 
we did find that larger trees had a smaller proportion of egg masses laid under three meters, which is maybe not a surprise. Small trees where more of the surface of the tree is located under three meters have a, about a 25% on average of the egg masses, total egg masses on that tree will be available for you to see under three meters. But as you get up to trees with larger diameters, these are fairly big trees out here uh, on the right side of the x-axis, you get basically zero egg masses on the smooth trunk, which is all that's available under three meters. So you, very few of the total egg masses are found down low there. And we did find a weak but significant relationship between the number of egg masses under three meters and trees total count. So the idea here was, if we count the egg masses just looking up to three meters, how reliably does that tell us the total number of egg masses on that tree? So if you look at just small trees or relatively small trees, so trees under 25 centimeters in diameter at breast height, you do see a significant relationship where the more egg masses you find under three meters, the more egg masses you find on the whole tree. So there's, there's some indication that you, you can get a, a rough estimate of the total number, but it's not a very uh, tight relationship there. So in conclusion, uh, thinking about sampling egg masses, we, we found that egg masses are aggregated and demand a fairly large sample size in order to precisely measure their abundance. We found that many egg masses are laid over three meters high in trees. So if you're aiming to, to scrape egg masses as a, a way to remove uh, individuals, you're, you, you need to think creatively about how you'll get up high into trees if you wanna scrape a large proportion of those eggs. And uh, also the egg mass counts done with the naked eye may correlate with the actual egg mass counts, but you'll miss many egg masses that are up higher in trees and not available for you to see under three meters. So the next project I'll talk about is thinking about other ways of sampling um, across a range of lanternfly densities at these outlying spotted lanternfly populations. So we know from the history of lanternfly spread that long distance dispersal events can lead to the establishment of uh, isolated populations uh, beyond the, the bulk of the invasion. And these, uh, these isolated populations are interesting places potentially for sampling to occur. So our goal here was to compare the sensitivities of sampling methods at these sites with a, uh, a range of spotted lanternfly densities, and also to track the expansion or decline of these outlier spotted lanternfly populations uh, year to year. So we focused on outlier populations because they can be important targets for management. Stopping the spread of spotted lanternfly may depend on controlling these outlier populations. And in order to manage these populations, it may be important to accurately delimit how large they, they are. So we focused on three isolated populations in Pennsylvania, a very small population in Huntingdon, where we've got five plots where we followed spotted lanternfly, uh, or sampled for spotted lanternfly throughout the season. Shippensburg, uh, slightly larger, where we had 14 plots. And Altoona is a, the largest of the isolated populations we focused on, where we've got 28 plots where we sampled. And at each of these sites, we did egg mass counts up to three meters high, similar to what we did in the egg mass dispersion study, although we used a 20 by five meter transect rather than a, a circular plot here. And we measured the DBH of all stems greater than one inch in diameter and counted all the egg masses present on those stems. We also used binoculated egg mass search to look over three meters. Uh, we, so we looked uh, over the whole surface of trees standing on at, at least two sides of the tree to, to search the tree surface from below. And then once individuals began hatching, we used duplicate visual search for nymphs and adults. So a five minute time search where individuals walked to the same 20 by five meter area where we had done our egg mass counts and counted all the individuals that they could see. And we used two observers making independent counts. And we did this June through October every two weeks. And we also set up bug barrier sticky bands. These are inward facing sticky bands uh, on trees there, one, one trap per plot. And we installed them on Tree of Heaven if it was available. And if not, we used sumac, black cherry, red maple, and box elder. And we left them in place June through October, replacing them every two weeks. And we also installed circle traps once adults began emerging. So we had one trap per plot and we used this, the same 
order of preference for trees on which to install them. So Tree of Heaven was preferred, and if it wasn't available, we used sumac, black cherry, red maple, and box elder. And we installed them in August and left them in place through October. And we also checked these every two weeks. And so we found from uh, this, these observations, we found that egg mass counts were moderately effective at detecting the presence of spotted lanternflies. So of the sites where we eventually saw nymphs or early instar nymphs before August, we, we had previously seen egg masses at those sites under three meters, just the uh, unaided visual search at 11 of 22 sites. So 50% of places where we saw early instar nymphs, we had previously seen egg masses there. And we did slightly better using binoculars. So we we found egg masses at 13 of 22 sites or 59% there. And so to evaluate the other search methods that we used, we we considered observation dates where any one of the methods detected spotted lanternfly. So if one of the methods said there was spotted lanternfly there, we compared the others and said, did they agree? Were they able to detect them when we know that it was present? And we analyzed the, whether the probability of correctly detecting spotted lanternfly presence was affected by the seasonal timing of observation and or also the density of spotted lanternfly at that site on that day, which we approximated by averaging the two visual counts. We found that circle traps effectiveness increased with increasing spotted lanternfly density and didn't vary throughout the adult season. We had a limited time span over which we had circle traps installed, but we did see no effect of uh, the time of year here. But we did see kind of not a surprise that as you get more and more spotted lanternfly present at a site, you have a greater chance of catching them in the circle trap here. So the effectiveness there ranged from at very low density to about 25% chance of correctly detecting the presence up to about 100% once you get to very high densities. We found that the bug barrier sticky bands effectiveness wasn't strongly affected by density, which is a bit of a surprise, but it did vary throughout the season. So they were very effective early in the year for the early in stars, least effective uh, as adults start to emerge and then slightly more effective again later in the year. Uh, so I think we're interested in trying to think through why this might be occurring, what behavioral changes occur throughout development that might underlie this change in the effectiveness of sticky bands, but an interesting pattern there. And we also found that visual search was very effective even at low densities and that this did not vary over the season. So we did have some instances where either one observer saw a spotted lanternfly and another didn't, or where one of the traps uh, caught a, an individual, but neither observer saw them. So a visual search wasn't 100% effective, but it did uh, was very effective across a broad range of spotted lanternfly densities. And so this is switching over to thinking about uh, tracking the, the the spread or decline of these outlier populations. So this is just data from Altoona. And this is a look at uh, on x-axis distance from the center of the population in Altoona. And on the y-axis, the number of egg masses that we saw at our plots. So each point here is a plot. And in 2019, you can see we, we, we saw highest densities near the center of the invasion there in Altoona. And then as you move out, you get down to eventually no lantern fly present once you get to a certain distance away from the center. And so we returned this winter and repeated these counts in 2020. And so we can see across the board pretty much higher densities of spotted lantern fly egg masses at these sites. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so larger numbers at the center and also indication of population spread as these sites that were farther away from the center that previously did not have any spotted lanternflies. Now we do see them there at those sites. So some future directions working at these uh, outlier populations, we're going to investigate possible factors that explain the differences in population trajectories. So thinking about whether nearby treatment, either by removing tree of heaven or establishing insecticide treated trap trees changes the, the population trajectory at these locations and also whether the presence of Tree of Heaven has an influence or the surrounding landscape composition as well. 
And hopefully we're aiming to incorporate these detection efficacies into recommendations for carrying out surveys for spotted landfly. And we're also thinking of adding more possible sampling methods, including these pole traps, which uh, kind of exploit the lanternfly behavior, climbing up tall objects, and use insecticide treated netting to kill in lanternflies. And you'll hear more about these from Brian Walsh tomorrow at 10. He's, he'll talk a bit more about these pole traps. And then a couple projects that I'm maybe, yeah, so, from the Hoover Lab, other people in the Hoover Lab have been working on these projects. So this is a project focused on how spotted lanternfly perform without access to Atlantis, Tree of Heaven, their preferred host. And this is led by uh, another postdoc in the lab, I'm sorry, Yikin Nui. And uh, this, for this, to answer this question, we established 10 large enclosures, with, which each held four whole trees, five enclosures with Tree of Heaven and five enclosures without Tree of Heaven. And we found that spotted lanternflies had better survival when they were uh, raised in these cages with Tree of Heaven present. So they can see here across time on the x-axis, the proportion surviving in cages without Tree of Heaven in this greenish teal color and those with Tree of Heaven in this red color. We can see higher survivor uh, ship throughout the most of the season in cages with Tree of Heaven. And we also found that spotted lanternfly developed to adults earlier and may, and they lay more eggs when they have access to tree of heaven. So this is the proportion of the individuals in each cage that had reached adulthood. And we show that across time for the tree of heaven cages in red and the cages without tree of heaven in teal here. So they get about a, a week advance in the timing when they uh, become adults, when they have access to tree of heaven. And they also lay many more eggs. So they lay nine, in these cages, we found they laid 96 egg masses in cages with Tree of Heaven and just 14 cages without. So they are capable of producing eggs, viable eggs when they go their whole life without access to Tree of Heaven, but potentially they, they're going to lay fewer if they don't have Tree of Heaven available to them. And partly that might be just because they have a shorter time window in which to lay eggs because development is slightly delayed here. Uh, before a hard freeze hits, they have slightly less time to lay their eggs potentially without access to Tree of Heaven. And another project led by Ann Johnson, who's a PhD candidate in Kelly Hoover's lab, is a community science project uh, coordinated through Facebook aiming to gather records of predation by natural enemies in the United States. And she's gathered 660 unique reports. And you are invited to submit any in images or reports of something feeding on spotted lanternflies yourself at this Facebook group, which you can get to at facebook.com slash birds biting bad bugs. And she's found the most of the reports that she's gathered are uh, bird, birds feeding on spotted lanternfly, but she's also gathered reports, or uh, birds and arthropods make up the bulk of the observations, but she's got reports of mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish feeding on spotted lanternfly as well. So with that, I'll say thank you to uh, the collaborators and help in the field and our funding sources. And I think that's it for me. All right. Thanks, Joe. I yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, there were just a couple of questions that came up. Uh, and if you would have an answer for this or, um, or Julie had thoughts on, I know Kelly weighed in on the, um, in the answer section, but you know, why, why some of the egg masses ha are covered and some are not. I mean, it's more like why are some are not covered, that's all. <laughs> I don't know an answer to yeah. that. Yeah, I, I don't know. You see, like that one case, you can see a lot of them laid together uncovered. So it's interesting, but I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, do you know about, they were asking also about the percent hatch of an egg mass. I know it's pretty high, but I don't know if you would know that. I don't know offhand. Yeah. But do you know, Julie? It's it's really variable. Um, so so I my my sense is that it's it's higher in the field, and I think that might be some data that Brian Walsh is collecting now um, by you know mark you know basically uh, chalk marking some or crayon marking some in the field, and then going back in the spring and, and counting. Um, but but certainly 
you see like across like Erica's study and, and across like other things that are published like by Melody and whatnot in terms of percentage hatch uh, under, you know, in growth chambers, it, it's hugely variable and, and kind of a problem at that. Yeah. And then uh, the other part of that was, um, I mean, there's there's no evidence currently that any of the unhatched eggs go into the following season, is there? Because I, I have not heard about that. Not reported in the field, but we we did have hatch in the lab um, from an egg case, like uh, not that year, but the following year. So eggs could remain viable for longer. Yeah. And then, uh, for Joe, again, going back to the bug barrier, the, the dip in the bug barrier, does it, there was a question, did it line up with adult emergence or the mating flight? It does kind of line up when, it, I think maybe slightly before mating, but it's like end of August into September is really when we get the lowest uh, effectiveness for bug barrier there. So that's when adults are around, but okay. not, not actively laying eggs yet, yeah. And you know, in searching for egg masses and you find one, is there some type of rule to find the nearest neighbor egg mass? We had not done something like that, no. Okay, that's fine. I'll just do one more question real quick. Do, um, uh, do nymphs hatch all at once or over an extended period of time? So is there hatching synchrony in an egg mass? There's a pretty broad spread, I think. Probably Dennis's data that's more relevant here, but there's like, yeah, the first hatch, to last hatch probably is a weeks in between, I think. I don't know if for individual egg masses or not, whether that's, they hatch at similar times, but to hear Julie, I saw you on mute, maybe has a better answer than me. No, I, I would agree. I think in the field it can be wide, but I think that maybe this is something that Melody Kina will speak to because I think that that synchrony might depend upon um, exposure to chill and, and other factors there. So I, I think that um, she's found differences related to the degree of chill they're exposed to with, think, with certain periods contributing to greater synchrony. Okay, thanks. And then there was another question too about the gypsy moth parasitoids, but I think uh, Ho Ping Lu is going to be speaking later and um, like at 2.15, so you probably could answer that question a little bit more. Not any further observations then. But I think that's it, Joe, unless you have something else you wanted to add. No, that's good, thank you. All right, thanks. So we'll go next to uh, Dr. Rick Rouse from the College of Agriculture at Penn State. I think he's all ready to go. Sure, if I can just get uh, screen share up. There we go. Okay, yep, it's up. Yeah, I'm just gonna put it on projection into presentation mode. There we go. Okay. Uh, um, let me say first, I'm really grateful for the opportunity and for the rest of our team to participate in this and how impressed we are that 320 people are interested in research on spotted landfly. That's, that's really fantastic. And it says a lot about how appreciation of how great a threat this pest is has um, increased dramatically over the last couple of years. So thank you all for participating. W what I'm gonna address today is a lot of our work about looking at insecticidal controls for spotted lanternfly, and particularly trials that we ran at the Norris Tryon Farm Park, which is about 20 miles southeast of, uh, pardon me, 20 miles northwest of Philadelphia, and the Blue Marsh National Recreation uh, uh, Area, which is um, about um, 10, miles, uh, 10 miles away from uh, Redding, which is also to the north, uh, northwest. So, one of the philosophies we're looking at is to see if we can develop tactics so the control can be applied year round. Because we realize that everybody working on this pest is pretty busy. Um, landowners, farmers, and so forth are going to be challenged about this, particularly those that are near grape vineyards, as will be discussed later this week. And so given that labor is always going to be limited, we were interested in trying to find out not just the question of what's the best time of the year to control spotted lanternfly, but what are the options you had throughout the year so you could fit control efforts into the, into the time frame that was available. So this give better use of staff time and so forth. So we were looking at strategies to um, go after egg masses, which I'll talk just a, a little bit about today from uh, borrowing on some work from Greg Krychek and Brian Walsh. Um, but we were also interested in looking at ground or aerial applications of dinotefran, um, a neonic insecticide, before or after flowering of the pollinators 
pollinator plants might affect uh, bees and so forth. We were also interested in kind of evaluating bifenthrin as a late season control tactic for reasons I'll explain as I go along. And, and we think at this point, we've got some pretty strong evidence about good um, pathways forward, but there's need for much more extensive comparative trials head to head of Don Tefron and Bifenthrin. So I'll start off first with some of the oil work. So these are data from um, Greg Krychek, and essentially it shows it's uh, oil, stylet oil, dam oil, and a product we learned from about from a uh, landscape manager, Lesco, all seem to be pretty effective at, at uh, killing egg masses, which would be done before the rest of the season gets started. But we got very excited because in March of, of uh, 2019, Ann Hayek and Eric Clifton presented some research at this meeting showing they were picking up a very bassiana, fungal disease, in spotted lanternfly in the field. And we also knew the commercial products were available. So rather than just focus attention on small plot trials because of the urgency of getting something done about this pest, we, we managed to we look for a site where we would have significant populations of spotted lanternfly, also a site that would uh, um, be compacted or would be broken up in various ways, I'll explain later from a map, that could be broken up to make it easy to set up plots that wouldn't easily be reinfested. Um, so we, we settled on the Norristown Farm Park to do this. It was a collaborative effort between Cornell and Penn State. And we were really looking at this as try to develop a, a means, even if this compound didn't give really high control, that we have a tactic that could be applied a lot through suburban areas and areas of high um, conservation value. And because it was non-toxic to vertebrates and really Bavaria's, even though it can have broad effects on invertebrates, um, tends to be much more effective on some than others. So we really did this work in July of 2019. We, we put together plots that were about 50 foot by 30 foot, which at the time we were doing the experiments, thought would be big enough to avoid uh, interplot movement of nymphs from one plot to the next. Only after we got this work going did we um, get results from Kelly Hoover that showed in fact the nymphs could move considerable distances. And that if anything would underestimate the impact of Bavaria in these trials. So we made the application and um, two weeks later when we were able to go measure the densities again by um, time visual counts, we found about 50% control of nymphs. And this was also backed up by impact of uh, other studies that looked at effects on adults, looked for the presence or absence of, of um, Bavaria in the, in the field and so forth. I'm leaving the slide up for a bit because if you wanna follow up on this particular study in detail, it's recently been published by Clifton et al. And the key thing is this in, in 2020 in volume 49, starting on page 854. So that's that place where you can pick, find out a lot more about this. One of the points I want to make about this, though, is to, to do this, we needed to develop a sampling technique. We went to the field initially with sticky cards and realized that we'd have to come back a second or third day in order to get up enough nymphs on the sticky card, just as we made preliminary observations of movements. So we pivoted to our secondary sampling technique, which was to use time visual sprays, pardon me, time visual counts. And what we do in this is um, we try to make sure that there's essentially 20 to 25 uh, minutes of person time involved in counting, where the counters will go to a site, um, try to find a place that looks within the plot that looks to be good spot of light and fly habitat, count for two or two and a half minutes, depending on how we did it, um, and then stop and move to another site and do the count again. So these kinds of counts were done with one, two, and four, and five samplers at various sites during the uh, Norristown trial and in the trial at Blue Marsh I'll talk about in a few minutes. So this just gives you an idea of what was attracted to us in part about this site at Norristown. As you can see that the spotted lanternflies could be, um, we could mark off plots which tend to isolate them, or at least they wouldn't have invasion from all sides because of these, these strips we had. So we had four plots we thought looked good. Um, we did split plot design. We did a pre-count visual. And in fact, on one of these plots, this one, we actually moved the plot over from where, from where it was originally because the pre-count uh, showed that the plot that had been targeted for the control spray was already lower because it had a big oak tree in it. So one of the advantages of the visual counts is you can do pre-counts and in real time adjust the plot sizes and so forth so the plots are more uniform in terms of their initial pest density and then treat. If you do this with sticky cards, you have to leave them out for two or three days to get an accurate measure. 
And if it's wrong, then, then you have to, have to think about moving it again and so on. And it obviously becomes complicated trying to do that. So the treatments were made with a wand sprayer and days later we could recover, or weeks later, we could recover clear evidence of Bavaria infestations. And these were genotype, most of them were the ones that, that was released or the serotype released. So um, encouraged by that success, we decided to try something much more ambitious at the Blue Marsh site um, where we, because we had a lot of treatments involved, we didn't go with split plots. We had seven different treatments we wanted to follow with six replicants each. So we thought we'd bulk up in the size of the plots, bulk up the number of replications and try to look at a comparison of a number of different treatments. We, um, and the applications were tied to specific instars. In particular, we wanted, because, the, um, we, because we'd only gotten 50% control at uh, Norristown, we thought that we might have to make as many as three applications of the Bavaria to drive the populations down to something less than 90%. And if in using the, um, the insecticide I'll talk about, we wanted to try to avoid uh, exposure to pollinator plants. And we set out to try to measure not only the impact on spotted landfly nymphs, but also on non-target species from the different um, tactics that we used. So this gives you an idea what the Blue Marsh site looks like. Um, we, we were scattered across several places to get enough samples. And each individual site looks something like this, that the site, um, which is basically a flight control area, um, has these windrows of, of trees and so forth that are in between cropping fields. So as you can see, you can treat a section of this and not wor be worried too much about uh, invasion from other plots except on the edges, at least in most places. If you look at plots three and four, for example, there's a much greater problem of site invasion. So for that, and that was a challenge for some of our plots despite our best efforts to avoid it in terms of plot design. So the insecticides we wanted to try included two Bavaria formulations, one in oil, because we, were, we had an eye in these, these trials to being able to do something that could be applied aerially over broader areas to greatly improve the efficiency of control tactics. Um, and then we wanted to include an insecticide, Dinotefron, as a positive control, and also look at its impact of use only in the early season. We wanted to be able to apply by both ground and air, as I alluded to earlier. And we conducted the sampling via sticky traps and the time visual counts and tried to compare both of them during the season. So many of you out there will wonder, why did we want to use Dinotefron as a neonic? And wouldn't that be a terrible thing? In fact, one of the uh, um, issues we had with Blue Marsh is it is a conservation area and we had to get special permission to use any chemical insecticide in the site. And we also, um, really were restricted to use it in as small an area as possible, which we did. But why did we go with this? Well, David Bittinger and I made the decision about what compound to try. We couldn't try, we didn't feel like we could do lots of insecticide trials at this site for reasons I just mentioned. And we, we both have had a long history with um, pyrethroid products causing flare-ups of pests. Um, and Dave in particular, pyrethroid very disruptive to apples. Um, this was really known for the 1970s. And in fact, my very first scientific paper was a comparison of the toxicity of pyrethroids to predatory mites and spire mites and showed that the um, predatory mites were an order of magnitude more sensitive, which helped to explain the disruption that people were already observing in the initial chemical trials in the field. So we were interested in dinotefron because we both had experience with neonics, which when applied foliary instead of soils or injected, had relatively short persistence, often less than a week. Um, because the surface residues would be absorbed in the plant where they were less available to insects walking across them and so forth. But, but more importantly, that they seem to degrade pretty quickly. We know the neonics are quite, um, can be degraded quite quickly in sunlight. And this is just an example of some of David Bittinger's data where if you, you look at the pyrethroid, um, including treatments, they're between 34 and 80 fold greater um, populations of European red mite than if you look at the, pop, at the treatments that included um, dinotefron type product or neonic type products. So these, these are kind of outline um, the treatments in the experiments. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that the, that the Safari, which is a product used for dinotefron, registered for this purpose, was applied the maximum rate. It was used very early in target against first instar when at the point when Dennis Calvin's models projected we'd have uh, at least 90% um, egg hatch. And, and this actually worked pretty well. We pretty much got the spray on um, after we could be pretty certain almost all the eggs had hatched. 
Um, and then we made um, two different formulations of Bavaria applications on a second and third um, try, uh, treatment later in the season, hoping that we would be, get a cumulative effect of mortality. And then also, I also want to draw your attention to the fact that at the, at, by late June, the population was mostly second and third instars. That'll be re relevant to the sampling I'll talk about in a few minutes. So when we looked at, I, and I should just say, I'm pretty much going to skip the rest of the um, Bavaria trials because it was very disappointing. They didn't work as we planned or hoped. Um, there are a number of reasons, including the difficulty of getting statistically significant results out of these plots. In contrast, to the split plot design we used at Norristown, and also we applied it differently in Norristown. But we um, basically we were uh, pretty unsuccessful with Bavaria in these trials. So I'm just going to focus on the safari treatments. And what you can see from this um, slide is that when tested, the, the applications were made on the 15th and 16th of June. And by the time we looked at the 20th of June, um, whether we applied it by air or ground, the air or ground treatments, we got something on the order of 90% control within a few days. And that level of control continued for, for a few weeks, um, but then started to drop off into July. So that was um, somewhat encouraging. And, and I should say, well, and I'll just show you. So this was done by the sticky cards. And again, we had counts right after the treatments. Um, in contrast with the visual counts we took, we, we had to really wait till we got to um, the end of June before the insects were big enough that we could reliably count them. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that even um, by the 2nd and 9th of July, the, treat, the results we got with the visual counts for the air treatment were, were the same, essentially the same as they were um, for all the sticky card treatments early in the, um, shortly after the trials, shortly after insecticide applications. And similarly, when we waited into, into July, the control we got was on the orange range of about 50 to 70%, which again, oops, sorry, again was pretty much what happened when we used the counts by sticky cards. So the point I want to make from that is the results we got from both of these sampling techniques were quite parallel. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk to more about the variants later. So, so I should say one of the things we started to think is maybe the ground applications aren't effective for as long, and that maybe the because one of the things we'd hope for the aerial applications is they coming in from the top of the trees that a lot of the nymphs might be feeding on the top of the trees, and we get much better control there without and have less of the residue actually get to the ground where it might affect uh, our, our non-target organi organisms in the lower part of the canopy. Um, and, and we sort of thought for a bit that looking at these data is that look, it looks like the air treatments work a bit better. But I, I have to offer a caveat to this. At, at Dennis Calvin reanalyzed this data multiple times, as did Joe Keller. And one of the things they observed is that these plots, by chance, tended to be backing non treated areas. And so they could have had a greater problem with invasion. So this result might be a bit spurious. I think it suffice to say, though, the data we have shows that at least for the first um, few weeks after the treatment, you get very good control, um, even in the face of in, uh, invasion. So um, just to follow up this train a bit, uh, that was poor choice of words. We did some work at the Altoona, um, Altoona Railroad site. This was some work that Joe Keller did just to look at this idea of bifenthrin treatments against the adults. And, and here we did um, the, the um, uh, experimental tactic of doing visual accounts spraying shortly thereafter and coming back a few days later, in this case, just three days later and looking at the impact. So this saved us tr the trouble of doing pre-counts with um, sticky cards, coming back days later, treating, and then coming days later again to look at the impact. All this could be done in two days and really with just two, two trips to the field. And what you can see is the bifenthrin was in fact, appeared to be very effective in controlling the adults, probably 97.5% control or something on that order. So moving on then to the impact on non-target species, um, oh, David Binger really led this and, and um, he developed two control, two sampling tactics and I, I pushed for um, pitfall traps on the ground. So one of the, one of the things that he did be, on the basis of his experience was look at putting out um, San, Jose, San Jose scale traps, which are, um, have a pheromone on them to attract the adult male scales, but they also attract parasitoids. And what you can see from this, um, figure in terms of the mean number of San Jose scale days that the, that the bifenthrin treatment, safari air and safari ground, did not cause a blowout of scales and were right in line with the controls. 
as well as the other um, Bodega treatments, which were um, Bodega and Apprehend treatments, which were effectively controls as well. In addition, there was very little impact on the parasitic wasp in Carcia. And again, you can see there was really no difference between the, the safari treatments and the controls or even any of the um, Bavaria treatments that were present. So why should we care about Encarcia? Um, a primary reason is that um, it provides a good surrogate for Hymenoptera in general. And importantly, it doesn't move around during the plot. So the plots we had were big enough to really in, in, encapsulate an Encarcia population pretty effectively without too much concern that we were just getting invasion from outside the plot. It was confounding results. So we think it's, it's pretty indicative of what the impact would be on, on other Hymenoptera. Similarly, um, in the San Jose scale tra traps, it was possible to look at other um, groups of wasps, some of which like Chal the chalcids also don't move around very much. And again, you can see there was very little impact on the, on the trap uh, recoveries of these other Hymenoptera. We also looked at, as I mentioned, we looked at pitfall traps to look more broadly at what might be happy to go to ground um, fauna because we thought that um, even if safari applications from air were causing some impact on uh, hymenoptera and other things that were moving through the canopy, that it probably wouldn't get all the way to the soil um, or very little of it would. And so we did ran pitfall traps, three pitfall traps a piece at each of the sites, some of which were torn up by groundhogs and the like. But what you can see at a glance of these data is that both for the safari air and safari ground treatments, population densities were not different. In any case, were greater than we had in the control plots. And this was across all of them, including all taxa of arthropods we could find, including crab beetles, and even including slugs. So there was no apparent impact at all with the safari treatments. We also used, um, David put out blue vein traps, which um, assess a whole range of taxa of insects, as you can see from this, from this uh, a group of photos. And um, so the blue vein traps work pretty well. He collected a massive, David and his, and his team collected a massive amount of uh, data on this. They followed this for all over 20 weeks, starting well before the trial to well after the uh, trial, the end of the insecticide trial, and collected tens of thousands of specimens, which he has um, moved through um, and analyzed. And it's still, no significant differences among the treatments. And, and, and especially so when you focus on the attacks that where you would have strong suspicion that they're not very mobile. So what do we get out of this? What we found was this uh, safari applied by air, reduced the uh, nymph populations and kept everything down for, um, for, for weeks. Uh, and except in plot, cases where plots were probably subject to reinfestation. Um, there was minimal or no impact on non-target ground arthropods caught in uh, the traps uh, or on the sticky cards. And in general, what we find, found was that time visual accounts gave greater variability, gave her greater flexibility in sampling. And they were at least as good as a sampling, uh, as the sticky traps for sampling, except that they're a bit impractical for early instars. So we couldn't really start this until a couple of weeks into the trials at which point the nymphs were much easier to observe. So really what we're looking at here is the possibility of having season-long and area-wide control possibilities by combining a, a range of tactics, looking at control of eggs early in the season, particularly by insecticidal oils, following up um, early right at hatch um, with dinotephron, um, and then reserving later in the season when you might be able to tolerate more disruption of the ecosystem um, because it's it, right after the end of the season when most of the insects have done their thing um, by, by reserving the pyrethroids for control of adults, where they give you very fast um, control um, against a mobile population. So we're trying to evolve into a system that's integrated across the options we have and tries to avoid impacts on non-targets by um, missing uh, pollination periods and by where, we, where and how we apply the insecticide. So there was a large team of people that worked on this. On the spray dates, we had two dozen people out in the field helping us get the sprays up. So these are just some of the people who participated. And I, I particularly thank um, Dennis Calvin and Joe Keller for doing um, a massive amount of uh, analysis of, of literally tens of thousands of data points that were generated during this work. 
so that Greg, I'm, I'm happy to try to field any questions. All right, thanks. Yeah, there was just a couple. Uh, one of the questions was, was there um, any, uh, this is for the egg mass treatments. Was there any phytotoxicity or bark staining observed on the Atlantis or red maple or, or any of the other trees when you were at the 5% oil? Uh, but the, uh, uh, no, not really. Uh, we, we didn't run those here. We ran, uh, those are ran outside of Blue Marsh. So I'm not quite sure, but Brian Walsh has been running some of those and he, he can probably answer that question later. Okay. He's been running, particularly in a case where it might matter. He's been looking at oils and so forth in horti you know, in, in um, you know, nursery and horticulture. Yeah, okay. And uh, I, there's a couple others. Uh, was there, would you happen to know where the forest areas, when the aerial applications were going on, uh, were they opened or closed during that time? Um, we, we, we talked in working with the people at Blue Marsh, we sort of, I mean, we made people aware that sprays were going on and we sort of, you know, put up signs in some area, but we had very little, um, we did these very early in the morning and we had very little um, public engagement. Okay. And then uh, with the dinitefuron treatments, is there, um, just because of its uh, water solubility and uh, possible groundwater contamination, was there um, concerns about how to uh, possibly alter the aerial application such as you know, taking into account when it was either too windy or rainy or. Oh yeah, well, we wouldn't, we, we, we do that in, with any kind of aerial application anywhere, but the primary way we had to adjust for dinotephron is we could, there were some areas that we'd want to use for plots and they were too close, too close to the water in the reservoir. And so we had to um, adjust our, our sites away from that in order to be able to do this. So we were, I think the, um, you're required to be at least 200 feet from waterway and we kept well, uh, further distant than that. Okay, and then um, with the uh, oil treatments on the egg mats, is, is there any uh, difference noticed with the spring applications versus the fall, and the, and just uh, do you, you know the other information that was provided in terms of the uh, covering cracking or drying coming off that they might be more uh, susceptible to the oil treatments in the spring? Still, that's still a work in progress. Uh, that Greg's, I think Greg has so far been looking mostly in the spring. But I think between uh, Greg and Brian, they're, they're looking a little bit more widely at uh, options at, 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 back in the fall as well. Okay, uh, I think that was covered all the, um, the questions were in the Q&A, unless anybody has something else they wanna type in. I, I saw Brian raise his hand, Brian Walsh. I can, oh, sorry. I can unmute him and let him talk if he wants to answer that question. Yeah. Brian, Brian, you are unmuted. Uh, yeah, I forget what the question was now. I'm sorry. Uh, but, it might have done the oil staining or the on the trees and stuff. Uh, yeah, there. I, it's kind of a little bit more involved with the oils when you go to higher concentrations, depending on the target that you're putting it on. Um, so in my end with horticultural work, you have to be very careful because you can do damage to buds and flowers and. Um, especially with evergreens if you spray in the fall. So it's a little bit more involved. Along the railroad tracks, we don't care if we, we destroy a little bit of um, flower buds for the coming season, if we're gonna get control at those higher rates. So it, 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 it's more involved than just going out and spraying at that high rate uh, when you get into the landscape world. Thanks, Brian. I, and if you hadn't answered to you about the spring applications, there's any we're, difference. We're working on that now. Uh, unfortunately, this winter has been exceptionally cold, and uh, we need nighttime temperatures above freezing. So that pretty much cut out all of uh, January and March. So, but we're working at it. I do have December applications out to, to evaluate. Okay. Was there any other questions? Right. And I if, if, did you have anything else to add, Rick, or not? Or? No, um, uh, just if the work, all this work is moving toward publication. So you'd be able to read this in more detail. There, there's an, we've got a, about a 50 page manuscript that's um, that um, Dennis and Joe in particular have been working on using all the data we generated from these plots to look at sampling designs and so forth. And one of the things it shows is you need uh, it, the popula assuming your population is going to be variable like ours, you need a pretty good uh, number of samples per plot, like 30 sites per plot. 
in order to get a pretty good sampling accuracy. Um, so it's, it's challenging to do this. I mean, one of the things we encountered and probably other people will if they, when they start doing large trials like this is that we've, in some plots we encountered very hot trees, trees that seem to get hundreds, thousands of um, spotted landfly nymphs per count. Um, there'll be one tree out of the plot, even though there are other trees near it that look large and sufficiently attractive as well. So a managing variability in this is a really big problem. And so it's, it's really important to try to do pre-counts of actual populations of nymphs before you start off. We, we looked at vegetational diversity and we thought the plots were sort of uniform in that regard and it still wasn't, wasn't enough. Even when we tried to, to reanalyze the data by an analysis of variance type approach to look at you know, differences in plant composition, we still had a great deal of difficulty resolving differences between plots. So um, the sampling is a big deal and uh, the, the de details of that are pretty complicated to explain briefly, but um, we're getting, trying to get a paper submitted on this soon to make that available to people in the future. Okay, thanks. All right, I think Thank that you. wraps up the uh, Penn State uh, research uh, for today, at least. I know there'll be some other presentations on the other two days by Penn State researchers. Brian will be presenting on one day. I know uh, Heather Leach will also be presenting too. Um, so I, we have a break scheduled for 10, uh, starting at 10.30 and going till uh, 10.45. So we can just keep that as far as staying on schedule, but we could uh, begin the break just a little bit earlier and then uh, reconvene at uh, 10.45. Okay, I have uh, my um, clock at 10.45, so we can get started now. So next up, we had uh, Penn State presenting this morning. So next up, we'll have our USDA Otis uh, lab in uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts presenting on aspects of their SLF research. And so the first um, presentation today will be by uh, Dr. Miriam Cooper Van. All right, thanks Miriam. Thanks Greg and thanks for having me today. Um, is my screen sharing okay? Yep, yeah, okay. coming through. All right, so um, this is my acknowledgement slide at the beginning as well as at the end. But um, today I'm going to try to shed a little bit more light on some of the SLF behavior and ecology that we've been working on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about SLF density and tree DBH, uh, things, that, things that help us predict where SLF will be. Uh, some of the studies that we've done on radio tracking to measure their movements and um, a little bit on SLF response to acoustic signals, which we've started to look at in addition to all the other semiochemical research and um, other studies that we've been working on. So um, in brief, I'm gonna talk about some studies that we did in um, Beijing, China um, with Jacob Wickham in Beijing. And we had um, set out to uh, test methyl salicylate lures for longevity using pairs of trees that were um, uniformly planted on the street in Beijing, on streets in Beijing and seven meters apart. So we took pairs um, and we did a mark release recapture between them and one tree had a lure and the other tree did, didn't. And every two weeks we rotated the tree with the lure. And we were trying to find out how long the lures would last, but we had no differences between any of our trees with or without lures. And so upon further analysis, um, I tried to figure out why this was because our previous studies in China berry plantations showed a nice dose response and significance with methyl salicylate lures. And what we found was if I looked at the two trees in each pair and I categorized them as having a higher wild SLF density or a lower wild SLF density in relationship to each other, um, the marked recaptured SLF that were released between the two trees preferred to go significantly every time, every week, to the tree with the higher SLF density, uh, the background density of the wild population. Uh, and the other thing we did was look at the DBH of the two trees and categorize those into higher DBH and lower DBH. And although the DBH didn't vary a lot between the two trees in the, uh, in the pairs, the average DBH um, was only on the higher ones was only um, 
about 30 and the smaller ones was 23 centimeters. But that was enough to um, show a significant difference in uh, SLF density on the background wild population. So I know a lot of people have been asking about why the SLF uh, lures haven't been showing consistent results. And I wanna follow up on, on that and explain um, that DBH seems to have a very um, important component to uh, choice of trees by SLF. And it affects, um, it seems to have a, a positive relationship with SLF density. Uh, so the lures were not able to overpower the draw to the trees with the higher SLF density and the larger DBH. And which comes first, the chicken or the egg, it's hard to, to know because there's um, some possibility that they're producing their own signals that um, feed back into higher and higher density. But um, when placing traps and uh, trying to detect SLF, larger DBH trees should be um, considered in trap um, placement. Now going on to adults, and I wanna do a little recap on the adult phenology. Um, so we, um, we divide the adult stage into four stage, sub stages. Um, as, as Julie pointed out, the adult stage is quite long and there's a lot going on in that time. So early, early I divide that into two stages. Um, early one is right after they emerge and they're just feeding. Um, early two, they continue feeding, but we see a sudden drop in sex ratio. So it's mostly, um, uh, well, males become very hard to find, very scarce. And we see the beginning of flight. And um, in mid, we, uh, it's marked by the beginning of mating and we continue to see flight. And in late, we, is mar uh, the late stage is marked by the uh, first uh, observation of overposition in the field. So these are roughly the dates that these happen. Um, it's not um, always exact because of degree days and different locations, but approximately these are the dates. So um, I'm gonna talk about our um, tracking studies this, this summer and last summer, or 2019 and 2020. And we looked at two different types of tracking technologies harmonic radar and radio telemetry. And there are some trade-offs between them and this is why we looked at both. Uh, harmonic radar consists of a very small lightweight tag and it doesn't have a battery, which means that it has unlimited field and shelf life. It just simply um, reflects the signal back from the trans uh, transmitter and um, receiver. However, um, <clears throat> radio telemetry has a larger tag, it's heavier, because it has a battery. Um, and it, that battery means it also has a limited shelf and field life. But the, the battery allows it to produce its own signal that can be uh, picked up by the receiver. <clears throat> uh, the, the, the drawback on harmonic radar is that it can't distinguish um, the signal from different individuals. Uh, so if you hear it, but you can't lay your eyes on the insect, you don't know which insect you're hearing. Um, so you don't know if you've done multiple releases on different days, you don't know how far it might have gone. Whereas with radio telemetry, because it's producing its own signal, it can produce a unique signal. And you can tell, even if you can't see the insect, which insect you're hearing. And for that reason, um, you can't really release a lot in one location um, over time uh, for the harmonic radar because it confounds your ability to track and determine uh, what movements you're, you're um, seeing. But with radio telemetry, you can release as many as 12 insects on one tree at the same time and it doesn't, um, doesn't cause issues. Uh, the other problem uh, with harmonic radar is that the range of detection is, is uh, limited to 25 to 50 meters because the signal is much weaker being that it's reflected. Whereas with uh, radio telemetry, your range of detection is 250 to 500 meters. So when you have an insect that moves beyond 50 meters in harmonic radar, you have a lot harder time finding it. <clears throat> And that's what we saw in the field. So in 2019 and 2020, we saw with both harmonic radar and radio telemetry, our technologies improved. 
in both years and our abilities have improved in both years, but um, harmonic radar, we only detected 0.5, um, the number of detections per SLF we released was 0.5 versus 1.2 in 2019 and 1.8 in 2020 versus five in uh, 2020 for radio telemetry. And the average number of tracking days was um, much fewer for harmonic radar than radio telemetry. So, and, and here is a um, graphic of showing um, the recovery rate, how, how, um, how many we were able to recover over time. And the dotted lines are from 2019 and the solid are from 2020. So our, both technologies improved over the year, but um, we also um, <clears throat> were able to recover uh, radio telemetry tagged insects. Um, much longer. This is an example of the distance each insect traveled from its last known location um, in both years for harmonic radar on the left and radio telemetry on the right. And as you can see, um, if they traveled over 50 meters, they just drop off. We didn't find them anymore. And in radio telemetry, we were able to find them up to um, over 400 meters away, almost 450. And um, most of the movement though was in that range um, below 75 meters, but there were some really big jumps. <clears throat> and, um, and so what we decided to do for this analysis is I'm gonna focus on the radio telemetry data. Um, this is the site we used in 2019. And uh, this is the site we used in 2020. In 2019, it was a very high density site uh, with um, a lot of SLF. And in 2020, it was a very low density site near the um, edge of the SLF population. And we um, followed over 40 adult males and females in each year. <clears throat> and what we found was in the high density site in 2019, um, early on, like Julie mentioned, they're not moving a whole lot. And then after um, mid-September, uh, they really start to move large distances. Um, and in the low density site, we saw that too, but the distances were not as uh, large as in the high density site. <clears throat> if you graph it, it looks like this. <clears throat> We also were able to triangulate their position and determine um, how many meters above the forest ground they were and using uh, range finders. And what we found was, um, as Joe mentioned, that uh, they are predominantly over three meters in height. Uh, in fact, so the females were always over three meters, a uh, majority of them, and they really, um, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg when you're looking below three meters during mid, which is the mating period. Whereas males started off, um, majority of them were um, within three meters of, from the ground, but they increased uh, in, in height after that. And their preferred height, and this is really neat because it corresponds with what Joe found, uh, was between six to nine meters. Their average height in the canopy was 10 meters for both males and females. And interestingly, this really seems to peak in the mid uh, time frame when they're um, engaging in mating. And also, um, you can see a little bit also uh, during late when, when overposition is taking place. Uh, they predominantly, uh, well, we, we tracked um, and uh, kept track of what plants we were finding them on. And um, they were found on a lot of different species. Uh, the frequency, the one species that was most frequently uh, encountered was grape, not including the release trees that they were released on. Um, and interestingly, Tree of Heaven was, was not even top three. <clears throat> Black walnut was uh, over here. So <clears throat> they're all over the place visiting lots of different plants, but grape was really a key species. So in summary, we, what we learned was that um, well, first of all, radio telemetry produced um, more results than harmonic radar, probably because, um, well, once they move uh, beyond that 50 meter range, they, they were lost. 
Um, but male movement may have been impacted by the size of the tags because males are smaller. Um, and so they, we did not see as much movement with males as with females, but I'm not sure that that's for real. It might just be because the tags were weighing them down. Um, they generally didn't move much in early one and they, uh, their moving increased in the end of August. More movement um, was found at the higher density site and um, they were they seem to prefer um, the height of 10 meters in the canopy. They were um, males were found below three meters in early one, but then everybody, males and females, were both more often above three meters. So if you're looking at three meters, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, <clears throat> and they were especially above three meters during mid in that 10 meter range. And again, wild grape uh, was very commonly visited. And the last study I want to talk about is acoustic signals. Uh, we, <clears throat> we got a lot of um, anecdotes in the years prior about sound, um, <clears throat> SLF responding to different sounds. Uh, someone sent a picture and said these yellow um, wire, electrical wires that provide all of the electricity to the ship's docked at the port were humming audibly, and during flight time, the SLF, quote, couldn't get enough of these yellow wires. Um, a, a homeowner in Pennsylvania <clears throat> sent a complaint in, or, a, not, or an observation in, that said um, he was cutting Trex board, uh, deck boards, which is synthetic deck boards, uh, with a circular saw, <clears throat> and every time he made a cut and there was a high-pitched sound, SLF came flying. <clears throat> and someone else sent in a video of <clears throat> nymphs apparently being attracted to <clears throat> So we decided finally, after all these years, let's follow up and just do a very simple experiment because um, my lab is not an acoustics lab. Um, but let's just see if, um, if SLF are attracted in this uh, laboratory to sound. And we decided to choose a 60 cycle hum because um, that is often related to electrical sound. <clears throat> so I bought a speak about speakers that were similar to the one in the video of the nymph and recorded a 60 cycle hum and played it back at 50 decibels about 30 centimeters away from a release point which was in a cage that was covered with paper on all sides so there were no visual cues. And the insect was released in the middle and allowed to walk in any direction. And when it reached the line, it, uh, its direction was recorded. And every time we tested this, we, we moved the location of the speaker 90 degrees. <clears throat> and what we found was indeed, there was a significant attraction to the sound. Uh, we tested also on adults and, and, and with 80 Hertz, and there are also trends. So this is very intriguing, and uh, we don't know if it's near field sound or far field sound or substrate vibration that was causing the attraction, <clears throat> but we, we decided to throw it out into the field and try to uh, see if we could attract them to traps, and it wasn't significantly different. But again, um, there's a lot more uh, work we can do. So we're working with Dan Howard and Baruch Road at University of New Hampshire, and they're going to um, do recordings and um, try to identify exactly what it is, what kind of sound they're using or acoustic signal they're using and try to reproduce it. So SLF do appear to be positively phonotactic and they demonstrated um, positive phonotaxis in the laboratory, but we haven't demonstrated it in the field yet. <clears throat> At this time, it's unknown if they're using substrate vibrations, near field or far field sound. <clears throat> and we don't know what they would, if they produce their own sound <clears throat> and what they're um, doing with it and how strong an attraction it would, would produce. So there's a, a lot we just don't know. So we're, we're planning future work to look at this this next summer. Um, and it may be involved in aggregations and courtship. We just don't know. There's a lot to investigate in this. So with that, I want to thank you and uh, acknowledge all the people that helped in these studies and our other studies.
and that's it. All right, thanks, Miriam. Yeah, the, I did have one question, but I think you sort of answered it with the mails, but you might have more information. But there was one question about the weight impacting the distance traveled. The weight? Yeah, probably the weight of the tags and everything. Yeah. Yeah, so there's that's definitely a concern, and and that's why we looked at both radio telemetry and harmonic radar. Was the the main concern was that the radio telemetry tags might weigh them down too much that they wouldn't move very much, and what we found was they still at least some of them were able to move quite far, um, hun over 100 or 200 or even like high almost 400 meters. Um, in a, a day or two. So um, at least some of them were strong enough flyers that they could overcome the weight. And I'm sure that their real abilities are greater than what we were able to measure just because of the weight of the tax. Okay, thanks, Miriam. Yeah, and I, I don't see any other questions at this time. I don't think any, there's any hands raised, but I think Nancy was watching out for that for me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thanks. And so, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Rick. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to get in the Q and A. Didn't work. Aaron, it's great that you've sort of worked out where the adults are. They seem to prefer to be about ten meters. Do we know where the nymphs are in Pudong? So we we started to look at nymphs with the harmonic radar, but we didn't look at um, that question yet. So, um, so no, I don't know where. As far as height goes in the forest canopy, I don't know where they, they prefer to hang out, but we do know what kind of tissue they feed on. So I think that's <laughs> that limits them. So they're going to be upper and edges of the canopy for the, on the base of the tissue. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what we guess, but we don't, it's hard I mean, to figure out how to measure it. That's not, we don't have experimental data showing that, but we do know that, that, that especially first in stars, they feed along the leaf veins. Second in stars on the leaf petioles, and you know it's not till fourth in stars that they can feed through the bark. So um, they have to be wherever the leaves are. We I don't know, you know we, we should investigate that um, the height where the of the which leaves they may prefer, if any. Yeah, but it was on the basis of that that we guessed that they'd be in the upper part of the canopy. But it seems hard to measure where the you know like especially the first. How do we figure out where they are unless somebody's repelled up the tree and is hanging out watching for him. Yeah, that's a good question. And we should look at that some more. We did some uh, nymph work, but I didn't show it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Miriam. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll uh, move on to Joe Francais next, who's also at our, our Otis lab. Thanks, Greg. I'm just gonna... You see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. Last time I forgot to do that. So, um, yeah, the uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the work that we've been doing to um, develop and improve traps for SLF um, over the last few years. So, um, this is done. Um, a lot of the work that's been done has been done um, between um, my group at Otis and Miriam's group, and um, with a lot of the help with a lot of help from um, the uh, the crew in East Stroudsburg. So. Uh, but there's also a lot of other people that I need to thank um, who uh, were able to make things possible for us this year. We weren't able to get out to the field, but we had a lot of help, um, especially in the outlying areas where we um, we did our detection tools study uh, this year. So um, I just want to thank everybody who helped us now in case I miss it at the end. So thank you. All right. So just going to give brief background on what we know. Um, about SLF trapping, and um, this paper uh, came out early last year. Uh, I noticed somebody put up a um, a list of all the papers, that, uh, a bunch of papers from Stop SLF, um, and you can find the paper there if you, if you want to look at it um, in a little more detail. So what we know are um, traditional sticky bands like um, glues that have our face outward are not effective for SLF trapping, but bug barrier sticky bands actually um, reduce debris and escapes. And we saw that a little earlier today. Um, traps placed on the host trunk um, caught more SLF than intercept panel traps. We tried placing intercept panel traps in the canopy and we found that the, um, that the that 
traps on um, hosts actually caught more. And we know that in high density sites, circle traps catch more um, adults than bug barrier, um, but there wasn't any difference among nymphs. So uh, taking all of that in early, in 2019, we wanted to get, um, we wanted to see if we could make a better, work out a better circle trap. So the um, circle trap we had been working with had a jar, had a large, um, almost uh, one and a half liter, almost two liter jar attached to it. Um, but we went to these bags, you can, um, they, they're uh, gusseted bags. So the bottom um, kind of opens up a little bit so that they can be, um, they can stay open when you place them on the trap. And we just made a couple of modifications to the already existing um, Kong weevil trap. So it actually takes less, uh, you have to mess around with it a little less even less than you do with a jar trap. So um, we wanted to, we compared it with, um, compared bag traps with jar traps uh, at tw uh, in 20 pairs of Elanthus at high density sites. We used um, Trexler Nature um, Reserve in, in Lehigh County. And so our numbers were really high. We caught over a hundred thousand SLF that, in that study. Um, we did make sure to rotate all of our traps um, we did a check and a rotation every three weeks. So the um, bag trap was where the, the um, jar trap was and the jar trap was where the bag trap was. And that gave us the opportunity to kind of work out um, if there were any hot spots, so that we wouldn't, so that, that wouldn't um, affect trap catch. And what we found um, was that we caught uh, our mean number of SLF that we caught. Um, we started in, in mid June. So we kind of missed the first instars, but we, we were there for the rest of the life stages um, all the way through um, pretty much the end of flight. And we found that uh, overall nymphs were caught more in the bag traps. Um, we did see um, significant difference at first and second instars. Um, at third, fourth, we, we think that they, we know that the, um, the SLF probably left the trees um, and maybe came back when they were uh, for adult flight. Um, since we were only working in Atlantis. And we know that definitely we catch a lot more um, SLF. This is, I think, four to one. Yeah, it was almost four to one um, uh, bags to jars. So why do we think this um, the bag traps catch more? There's a few reasons. Um, when you leave the jar traps out for the whole season, you get this, you get honeydew, you get sooty mold. The, the insects aren't gonna go up into the traps. And this is in high density. Um, you probably won't see this in, in low density sites, but when we were doing this in high density sites, we know that um, our collection jars um, were covered in sooty mold and that's not, that's gonna reduce the light. That's probably gonna make them less, it's gonna make the insects less likely to climb up into the trap and get caught. Um, we also know that with the jar trap, because of the way it's positioned against the tree, um, that the insects will get stuck in that, um, in that entry port and then they can't get any further. Um, and so you'll have a whole lot of, and you can see that here, you have a lot of insects that are just waiting to go into the trap, but um, they can't get in because you've got this, this insect right here, um, this SLF stuck. Um, the collection devices are, um, because um, the, the bag trap was um, changed periodically throughout the season, um, you don't get the, the, there's a lot more light coming into the trap the bag also tips over. So um, as it gets heavier and heavier, uh, the bag is getting, and the bag gets full, the insects are falling down away from the entry port and they're not clogging up um, the, the, the inside of the, the jar, like, like with the jar, they, they do um, get kind of stuck there. And so you can see there's about a four to one increase in catch. So what we know is that we catch a lot with the bag traps, but how are they as actual detection tools? And so when I talk about detection, I'm talking about the ability to catch at least one insect um, if a population is present. So going out to a site and just being able to find them. And so we know that, you know, in a lot of, because the work we were doing was in high density sites, um, that's not always gonna correspond with um, results that you're gonna find in low density sites. So what we wanted to do was um, take these traps out to outlying regions, um, areas where uh, um, where the populations are emerging or haven't been found yet, um, or are 
you know, there's there's where there might be pockets where there's a presence, but we haven't found it yet. So so um, we we compared three traps. We compared the bug barrier, the jar, and the bag trap. Um, and we did we did this in seventy one replicates, and we placed them in eight states. So that are either that have either been infested or are um, just on the edge of where the populations might be. So um, so within the replicates, we placed the traps on um, adjacent trees. They were spaced out at least so, and then so adjacent trees for within a replicate, and then replicates were actually spaced at least 150 meters apart from each other. But sometimes it was on the other side of the state. So, um, and all traps were baited with a um, methylsalicylate lure. So, one of the problems that happens when you when you put up traps in low density areas or emerging areas is you don't always catch the insect you're targeting because it might not be there. So we did, but we did have, of the 71 replicates, we had 20 positives. So um, I'm gonna, and so those are the, the, the replicates that I'm gonna focus on here. Um, and of those trap, of those 71 replicates, uh, I mean, of those 20 replicates, what we saw was that um, we had higher catch in, um, uh, circle trap, bag traps than we did on, um, at least with early instars. So with the early instars, first through thirds kind of had to be combined just because of timing of when traps got put out and uh, when traps were collected. Um, so uh, for now, we, we may we may be able to, to tease this out some more. We'll try, um, but I'm not sure if we can. So what we know is that um, the, the bag traps catch more uh, than at early in stars than the other two traps that we that we tried, uh, and at adults um, the circle traps catch about the same, um, but but the uh, but the bag traps do catch more than the the bug barrier. So as I said though, trap catch doesn't always tell you um, how a trap works uh, from a detection standpoint. So this is what our detection rates look like. Um, they were actually so this is for all twenty sites, and I'm going to break it down by low density versus high density in a second, or look, I'll look at, we'll look at the low density sites in a second. So of the, um, the 20 reps, um, we had detection rates were actually comparable um, at all life stages, across all life stages um, and at all sites. So we had, um, you know, and when you get to adults, we had one, one trap, one of the reps, uh, in one of the reps, we didn't catch any, um, we only had one rep where a bag trap didn't catch, and um, we only had two reps where um, bug barrier and circle bag traps um, didn't catch. And those were actually those were in low density sites. Um, but you can see you have about an 80, 60 to um, 80 percent um, detection rate on uh, early in star trap on early in star insects uh, amongst all of the um, the traps. So. Uh, we we then we looked at breaking it down by high density versus low density, and uh, when I'm talking about um, low density sites, there was there was actually a we, we there was actually a break in catch uh, where we saw that when we caught less than we, we we're basically saying that low density sites are sites where we caught less than 130 insects over an entire um, season from first in star to adult. So all of the insects that were caught um, on all three traps at a replicate. And uh, it, was a, it was a pretty clean break. It was about 130 um, was where we um, saw, uh, was where, where we're considering low density. And then it was over, almost over 300 um, insects where we've got to medium and higher density. So I'm just gonna, so just, this is just focusing on those, those sites where it was less than um, 130. Uh, insects caught on all traps, all stages, all season, um, in in each rep, and what you can see is that it's the same. Um, it's not significant. There's no significant difference between detection rates at any of the sites, um, amongst any of the traps. So, uh, circle traps with bags do catch more SLF early in star nymphs and adults. Um, three traps that we that we that we tried. Um, had comparable detection rates, even at low density. Um, and then this is just for us and for future research that if people are doing trapping work, 
um, we are finding that you really do need to rotate your traps, your lures, your attractants um, when you're comparing in, in comparison assays because the difference, because um, you do see hot spots where one tree may just have a lot of SLF on it um, compared to a tree that's right next to it and you're putting traps on both of those and you, you will see more in, you know, you will see probably see more in the, um, in the higher, in the, in the more highly populated tree. But when you rotate, you are able to um, to work that out, and um, you know uh, you're you're able basically to um, avoid that. So um, the second thing I'm going to talk about is the um, was our 2020 uh, light trapping comparison. Um, as I said before, bug barrier traps they did in 2018 when we when we used um, intercept panels out in the canopy. Uh, we were trying to look at you know, trying to catch uh, adults flying, um, we we found that bug bear traps still out caught intercept panels. So in 2020, we wanted we have um, a light trap that we're working on to um, uh, that we've been working on for wood borers, and we wanted to compare intercept um, panel light traps uh, with circle traps. And so this trap is basically a um, an intercept panel. It's fluon. It's got uh, some lights attached at the top. And um, when you and we only had the traps out during adult flight period, uh, they were baited with methyl, methyl salicylate. The circle traps were on trunks at one and a half meters, and the intercept panel traps were on branches five to eight meters above the ground. And what we found was that again, the, the circle trap on the tree trunk catches a lot more um, SLF than the intercept panel, and the lights really didn't seem to do anything um, to uh, to change that. But what was interesting, and this was just an interesting um, thing that we found, was that the um, the sex ratio was a lot higher on um, traps placed in the canopy versus the ones that were, you know, out on branches in the canopy versus ones that were um, on the uh, on the, the the trunk. And we saw that we actually caught a lot more male when we caught the proportion of um, males in those in those canopy traps was a lot higher than the um, proportion of males on the circle traps. So that was just an interesting um, thing that we found and might be worth looking at a little bit more, um, but trying to develop a trap for, for these is, you know, it would, it'll take a little more um, effort to develop um, a trap maybe to uh, catch more adults flying. So circle traps on the trunk are more effective at trapping SLF than intercept panels. Um, we did see the significant sex ratio shift, um, and the lights that we tested in 2020 didn't show any increase in catch. So, but uh, one thing that's promising is uh, uh, that Damon Crook in our lab at Otis uh, has been working with, um, uh, has been performing electroretinograms on adult SLF, and I think he's been able to get some late in star nymphs, some fourths and um, some fourth in star nymphs. Uh, going to, and uh, we will be testing um, some attractants this year. Uh, in um, we'll hopefully be looking at visual attractants, lights, and paints and things um, in 2021. So that's part of our plans for 2021. We're going to look at um, answering questions about improving um, survey use of traps. So just helping surveyors making the traps a little bit easier to use, uh, decreasing the trap check frequency. Um, removing the pesticide strips, which we've heard um, from a lot of people, um, they'd appreciate it if we could not use the pesticide strips. So we're going to see if we can get away from um, doing that. And then uh, Phil Lewis, I think either tomorrow or the next day is going to be talking about sentinel tub traps. And we'd like to compare um, those at, some, at low density in the core. Uh, as I said, Damon has been um, working on electroretinograms and with Miriam and Damon and me will be working on, and our groups will be working on um, looking at visual attractants. Um, and the last two things are just uh, comparing detection rates on Elanthus at low density and assessing the um, potential for um, using circle traps actually to reduce populations. We know we catch a lot in high density, so maybe we can um, reduce population, maybe we can use them to reduce populations in places where you can't spray, you can't do, um, uh, Pesticide, we can't use pesticides. So um, with that, I'd like to say thank you again to um, everybody who uh, to help, who helped out this year. Um, 
it was it's greatly appreciated because we couldn't have done it with um with all of our travel restrictions um and wow it was good so thank you all right thanks joe yeah i didn't i didn't see any uh questions pop up in the q a section and if okay. anybody had any specific questions for joe anybody raise their hand okay thank you if you have a question you can send me you know send me a message thanks yeah thanks Greg. all right so we'll move on next to uh dr hannah broadley who is also at our otis lab all right i'm coming you know, on finish everything up for us this morning Hannah. <laughs> what'd you say I said you'll be finishing everything up for us this morning before lunch. That's yes, yes. Yeah, I got my eyes on the, the time <laughs> here so that we don't go past. Um, give me one second. And I know I just wanted to say, too, on the schedule, it says uh, Julie Gould would be speaking, or at least on an earlier version. Um, but this is work that Julie and I have done in very, very close collaboration. But I will be talking about it today. Let's see. I'm just trying to get it to be... Do um I'm not getting the right screen for my speaker view. That's the only problem. Let me see. Because you're there, seeing it still with the slides on the side, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Right. Yep. Is there an option to swap screens? Well, let or... me let me just stop sharing quickly and load it up again and see if I can pick up that correct screen if I already have it. Does that work now? Yeah, it's not coming up yet. It says it's shared on my end. No, we'll give it one more second. Sorry about that. There it is. Yep, you're good. Good. OK, sorry about that. Got it now, though. So as I said, this is uh, work that Julie Gould and I have been doing in very close collaboration, um, as well as uh, Winka Wu at the Otis Lab as well. Um, Xiaoyi Wang has been a close collaborator at the Chinese Academy of Forestry, working on the foreign exploration component, coordinating that component of this. Kim Homer is down at ARS. Uh, Lisa Tewksbury has been working on rearing non-targets. She's at URI. And Charles Bartlett also has been uh, working uh, on rearing non-targets with his student, Tyler uh, Haggerty. So this has been very much a team collaboration with this group here, as well as having a, wow, now I can't switch sides. There, there it is. <laughs> as well as um, a lot of help from others at the Otis Lab, others at ARS, Delaware, Rhode Island, um, in China. Um, we also are working with Mark Hoddle and Francesca over at Riverside in California on doing preemptive uh, non-target testing in California in preparation of concern about spotted lanternfly establishing in, in uh, California. So with that, I'm gonna jump right into what I'm talking about today. So I'm talking about our work on developing classical biocontrol. Um, and we've been following uh, the standard technique for developing these processes of evaluating what's happening with native parasitoids and predators um, in the United States. We're focusing just on some of the native parasitoids in the US to understand where they are, what they are, and what impact they may be having. This has come a little bit later in our studies. Right away in 2015, uh, Julie Gould and Kim started working on conducting foreign exploration. And then when I joined the team two and a half years ago, um, I started working on this component as well. So looking at um, biocontrol agents that are native to Asia. We are developing rearing systems for those parasitoids of interest and evaluating as much as we can about their life history, their life cycle, their behaviors and their genetics so that we can rear them most effectively and so that we can understand how their life history um, is synchronized with spotted lanternfly and we're conducting host specificity um, and host search behavior analysis of these promising parasitoids. We are in those various stages um, for the parasitoids of interest now, so we haven't yet gotten to the last stage of getting approval for release. 
Um, so this uh, I wanted to point out, if you want to look at more details, this is one of the publications in the recent environmental entomology special edition that is shows more of the details of what we've conducted so far with foreign exploration. But just briefly, I wanted to say that with our team in China, we have looked at different regions, different provinces in China um, from 2015 to this past year. Um, we are also continuing to conduct work this year, but this paper just presents up through 2020. We found spotted, uh, spotted lanternfly in 22 of those 27 provinces that we've explored. Um, and generally we found that across China, spotted lanternfly exists at low or moderate densities. Um, it's not uncommon, but it's rarely seen at high damaging densities. Um, but we, the areas that we have found um, that is at higher levels or even outbreak levels, pest levels, are areas where pesticide has been used. Um, so that suggests that there are um, secondary pest outbreaks in these areas. So the pesticide is killing natural enemies, which then means that the population of spotted lanternfly explodes. We don't have specific data on this. This is just observational. Uh, in this work of foreign exploration across China, we're using multiple methods so that we can detect parasoid parasitoids at different stages of the life of spotted lanternfly. So we've been chiseling out spotted lanternfly egg masses from the bark and then bringing those back to the lab to rear them out, um, rear out any parasitoids in them. We've been, um, the team in China has been deploying sentinel egg masses um, in areas where spotted lanternfly densities are low with the idea that those areas where spotted lanternfly densities are low they may be low because of natural enemies. So we've been targeting those areas. We've been using yellow sticky bands to look at parasitoids in the nymphal stages, um, trapping uh, spotted lanternfly nymphs and uh, also collecting and rearing out those nymphs. And these are the two parasitoids that we've detected to date. So Anastatus orientalis is an egg parasitoid and Dryanus cynicus is a nymphal parasitoid. I'm going to be starting in this talk um, going through some of the research we have to date about Anastatus orientalis and then I'll um, at the very end tell you about what we have so far about Dryanus cynicus. So Anastatus orientalis, um, as I said, is an egg parasitoid. It's a eupelmid, the family eupelmid. It was discovered first in Northern China um, and reported to parasitize 30% of egg masses and 40% of eggs within those egg masses. It was also reported to have two generations per year, one in the spring using the egg masses that were still available before emergence, and then another uh, generation in the fall using newly laid, newly laid egg masses. It was collected first um, as a potential biocontrol agent for work in uh, South Korea, where spotted lanternfly is also invasive. We got this into colony uh, right away. Um, and then when I started working with Julie and Kim two and a half years ago, we conducted more extensive studies looking at how to optimize the rearing, how to better store these, understanding the longevity and fecundity of these species and the sex ratio of these. Um, all of that, I'm not going to talk uh, about those details today because I've presented that in other talks um, and also you can look at more of those details in another one of the publications we have in the recent environmental entomology special edition. But briefly, I will say that they are really nice to work with because they're easy to rear. Um, they use egg masses, so we can store those egg masses um, and pull them out as we need. And we've been able to store those egg masses for up to a year, and they're still totally viable for using with anastatus. We can get really high rates of parasitism. Um, and uh, what was the third point I was going to say? Main point, though, they're easy to rear and really nice to work with. Um, but we have some hesitations about them as a biocontrol agent, which I'll go into. 
One of the other series of studies that we've looked at is looking at the life cycle study or the life cycle of Anastatus orientalis. So this comes from those hypotheses from the field in China that Anastatus orientalis has two generations per year. Um, and um, using both the egg masses in the spring and then using the newly laid egg masses in the fall. We wanted to rear uh, egg masses collected from Beijing and from Yantai in conditions that mim mimicked uh, real-time conditions in Beijing where they were collected from and then in Yantai. And then we also wanted to see what happened when we put wasps collected from those two different locations in conditions that mimicked Pottstown, Pennsylvania. So should we release them in Pennsylvania, what would their life cycle look like in Pennsylvania? So we used light and temperature conditions uh, that mimic Beijing, Yantai, and Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And we use collections from Beijing and collections from Yantai. We've now run two studies or two years of studies of this, and we've gotten inconclusive and highly confusing data so far. So with the Beijing samples, um, put in Beijing temperatures, we found that sometimes we see a July generation, which is not good because if they're emerging in July, that suggests that they're using egg masses from something other than Anastatus orientalis. So it suggests that they may be using non-target egg masses. But we didn't always consistently see that. Um, we saw it the first year of study and then we didn't see it the next year. We also found that Anastatus orientalis emerged at the same time as spotted lanternfly nymphs in the spring. Um, so this is also a bit of concern because that suggests that if they're emerging at the same time, they don't have time to come out, mate, and reparasitize before the nymphs emerge. So again, it suggests that they may have to use a non-target host. Um, also, initial populations of Anastatus that were collected from Beijing did not go into a diapause when we reared them under 25C long day conditions, but then later populations that we collected did go into a diapause. So that's something that was also highly confusing um, for us and made it very difficult to figure out how to rear Anastatus, our Anastatus colonies, because we were getting different um, results from the same temperatures tested different years. With the Yentai collections, some individuals emerged in the springs and other, other remained in the spotted lanternfly eggs for the full year. And Anastatus emerged after spotted lanternfly in the spring. Um, again, with that life cycle, that would suggest that they require an alternate host. So this is very confusing um, and obviously the differences year to year and the differences from different collections warranted more uh, investigation. So we presented two different hypotheses of why we might be seeing these year to year uh, variations. It may be that we're dealing with a mixture of multiple strains or potentially even cryptic species of Anastatus orientalis or it may be that Anastatus orientalis is highly plastic in terms of its life cycle and related um, ecology. I will note with the second hypothesis, due to COVID, the collections that we got this, this past year when we were studying doing this life cycle study, they came in a lot later than the year prior to that. So our timing of when we receive those collections is a little bit different and that may change the emergence in this highly plastic way. Um, the collections we got this year were already starting to emerge by the time we got them into our growth chambers, whereas they were prior to emergence the year prior to that. Winka Wu in our lab um, has been working on developing uh, genetic analyses to try to tease apart what's going on with these. Um, and he's used these NJMD primer data sets um, across the groups of across a subsample of species of samples from Beijing and Yantai. And lo and behold, we have found quite a bit of genetic diversity between these collections. So we now know that we're working with four different haplotypes. So 
what we had collected from Beijing and Yantai is representing not one homogenous haplotype. We found that group A um, was found only in Beijing and group B was found only from Yantai, while C and D were found both in Beijing and Yantai. And I'll just point out, so group C, that um, composes what our uh, colony currently is. So we do have a homogeneous population of group C, and that's what is currently in our colony and what we've run most of our studies on in the lab. And that's also what we've been conducting our host range testing on. But we now know that there's three other genetic groups um, that we can investigate further. We also, um, so we found even though this primer set gives us a pretty small, um, a small area of genetic material to look at, even with that, we found quite a bit of diversity. Winka then expanded those analyses um, to with another primer set that he built um, to expand that to a much longer sequence. And he found even more distinct diversity between these groups, which is uh, summarized here. So this suggests that the genetic differences may be what is, can explain these differences in the life cycle. And we're now going back to our voucher specimens in the life cycle studies uh, to pull those out and to get um, data on which of those haplotypes uh, the emergence patterns in the life cycle study represents. And uh, we've now conducted some morphological comparisons. We sent samples from each of the haplotypes to our collaborators in China to look for morphological differences. They did not find any morphological differences. We are working on creating isofemal lines. We have separated out haplotype B. And as I said, we've already separated out haplotype C and I've been studying that. So we're also interested in separating out A and D to understand those better in terms of their life cycle and their host specificity. We are, um, will be conducting a fieldwork study this summer that's going to separate out in the field in China, the haplotypes and their roles in, the, in their life cycle in China. Um, and we'll be doing a corresponding third year of life cycle analyses here in the United States in our growth chambers. In addition, our collaborators at the Chinese uh, Academy of Forestry will be conducting further surveys so we can understand beyond Yantai and Beijing where these other haplotypes are and if there are maybe even additional haplotypes present in the field that we are not yet aware of. The next subject I'm going to be talking about is the host specificity testing that we've conducted to date and this has all been done with haplotype C so far. So we initially prior selected 11 priority species to test. This, these were plant hoppers from the East Coast that are large bodied univoltine overwinter as eggs and lay the eggs on the above ground portion of the plants. So this corresponds to native species that are most similar to spotted lanternfly. However, in the initial year of testing in 2019, we showed that there was non-target attack outside of the group of, of plant hoppers. So our initial testing showed that squash bugs were attacked, unfortunately, and also that an anthorea species, so a silk moss species, was attacked. So because of that, we broadened what we wanted to test. Um, and we ended up having tested 36 different species. Um, this included 21 hemiptera, including seven plant hoppers, plant hoppers as well as lepidoptera, um, mantis species, one beetle, uh, stick bugs, and uh, cockroaches. And from those studies, um, we did find, so here's just a small summary of that. This doesn't include all of those tests, but a summary of that showing what the group of species are, whether when they were attacked, if they produced female uh, wasps or just male wasps. So these are some of those that were attacked and if they produced only females or only male wasps. So you can see that females were only produced in a subset of these 
um, species, but females were produced in all of the silk moths that we tested, um, which was particularly unfortunate because uh, silk moths are a very charismatic species and they're also an example of prior classical biocontrol um, not going very well. So they suffer a lot of non-target attack from prior classical biocontrol work uh, done on gypsy moth. Here too shows it in a slightly different way. The stars do indicate that these are um, species that we're still getting the final emergence numbers. So this graph is not complete, especially down there at the bottom in the choice tests. But what I'm showing here is up at the top, no choice test that we conducted. If those species were attacked in a no choice test, then we move on to the choice test. Um, this data takes a while to get because we, um, need to get the species, we need to expose them, we need to give the wasp time to emerge, um, and then we need to make sure all the emergence happens. So from the start of putting a species in to the end of final emergence is over two months. So that's why so many of these still say that we don't have the final emergence numbers. But this is showing here, again, here are the plant hoppers that were attacked. Here are stink bugs that were attacked. So pretty much every stink bug that we gave them was able to be attacked. And here are silk moths that were attacked. And you can see silk moths uh, were attacked at a rate that was the same as the attack rate of the controls, our spotted lanternfly attacks. So things are not looking good for um, using haplotype C as a uh, biocontrol agent for release. We also looked at um, how size of the egg may affect attack rate. So the bottom here is the size of the egg that we gave. Um, and then whether that produced females and male wasps, whether it produced males but not females, and whether it produced neither. And so what you can see here is that size really matters and what whether it gets attacked or not, especially for whether it produces a female. Um, so this suggests that Anastatus haplotype B is as long as the egg is large enough that it can produce a progeny, um, it can for the most part be used. I do wanna just add to this a little bit more details of behaviors. This is another publication in that special edition. This publication was led by Robert Malik and, and uh, Kim Homer's lab, and they were looking at behavioral analyses of how um, the wasp searches for egg masses and interacts with those egg masses. And we found um, the results from this suggest that the wasps do detect chemical traces left behind by spotted lanternfly adults, um, and that those traces resulted in a strong arrestment response and that the wasps seem to prefer um, to oviposit in egg masses with intact ofica. We also followed up with further work looking at the behavior of how the wasps responded to traces left behind by spotted lanternfly as compared to some of these non-targets. And we found that it showed more uh, attraction behaviors towards spotted lanternfly over the non-targets, which suggests that it does prefer using spotted lanternfly, even though physiologically it can use these other non-targets that we tested. So the takeaway for, for this section is that haplotype C shows a preference for in our host range testing and our behavioral analyses for spotted lanternfly egg, egg masses over non-targets. However, it did exhibit a broad host range, um, including attacking native silk moths that we presented to it. And the life cycle study suggests that it's not well synchronized with spotted lanternfly. However, one of these other haplotypes that we've now discovered, um, and there may be others that are yet undiscovered, these may be may be better suited as biocontrol agents and we're evaluating those. We hope to, this spring, we're hoping that haplotype B will emerge and we're gonna start some um, host range testing of some of the species that haplotype C attacked. 
so that we can as soon as possible see if some of these other haplotypes may be promising. Next, I wanted to point out to sustain all of this work, um, we do a massive amount of collecting of egg masses in the field across the winter. This is a big component of the work that we need to do across the winter. Um, and while we're doing these collections across different areas, we also are keeping track of any notes of any native uh, wasps that are present in the field, um, any observations of these native wasps, and any emergence holes um, that are noted in the fields. In, in any sites that there's any observation of native wasps, we're collecting additional egg masses from those sites to rear out um, for any potential wasps in those areas. Um, and we also are collecting the egg masses that have emergence holes, and we're going to be trying to run DNA analysis of those to figure out what this wasp is. We know from prior work from Hu Peng Liu, Liu that there are, um, there's Owen Sirtis that's using the egg masses. Um, but these images here, we've also spotted something that appears to be an Anastatus species. So there may be multiple wasps in the field using these, um, and we are investigating that further. So here, just briefly, so far, here's some of the observations that we've had. Um, oh, and this reminds me here, Bunker Hill, West, uh, West Virginia, that's the third one listed here. We discovered Anastatus species in these egg masses. Um, we were trying to run the DNA of the egg masses themselves to determine that this new site in West Virginia actually was spotted lanternfly and not um, a native plant hopper species. And when we ran the DNA of those, um, this was work that Winka Wu had done, he actually found that they had Anastatus DNA in them. Um, so we know that there is an Anastatus species that's in West Virginia, and we've spotted an Anastatus-like wasp in some of these other areas. Um, so we're going in and trying to figure out where this wasp is, how prevalent it is, um, and what specifically it is, because we don't know what species it is. Here's a map of some of the areas that we found either wasps or emergence holes. Again, we don't know whether these are Owen Cerdus or Anastatus, but we know that there's an Anastatus out there. Based on images that we have so far, we um, have made a list of potential Anastatus species that this may be, um, and those three highlighted there are the ones that appear to be most promising based on uh, the images, but we are going to be conducting DNA work um, to confirm this and hopefully rearing out some of these wasps. Another study that we have going um, that we're just starting now, if we've now set up a collaboration with researchers at the Seoul National University in South Korea and Kunsan National University also in South Korea. And what we want to do here is, so spotted lanternfly is also invasive in Korea. Um, but recently, while it still can be a pest in growing areas, it is not as notable of a pest. And it's unclear why uh, spotted lanternfly densities have declined overall in South Korea. There's some hypotheses about this, but we want to test this. Um, in particular, we're interested in learning about what happened with the release of biocontrol agents in Korea, and also what other natural enemies, what other parasitoids may be present in South Korea. So Anastatus orientalis, as I said, it was studied in China as a biocontrol agent for Korea and releases were made in Korea, but there wasn't much follow-up work on how far that loss had spread, how prevalent it was, how well it established. And meanwhile, there was also um, detections of another Anastatus species that may or may not be Anastatus orientalis. So we wanna know what that species is and how prevalent it is. So we're working with these collaborators to conduct um, surveys across the country, um, as well as to conduct some more detailed studies in those release areas. Um, and we're starting those studies this summer. So that goes on to, let me just check time. Okay, yeah, so I'm on to the last section now. 
So the last thing I want to talk about is Dryanus sinicus. Um, this is a uh, in the family Dryanid. It attacks second and third instar spotted lanternfly nymphs and uh, appears to be univolting, so one generation per year. It grabs onto its prey and um, paralyzes them. It host feeds and oviposits. Um, and we don't know exactly if it host feeds and oviposits on the same individual or it host feeds on many individuals and oviposits and others. Um, we know it does a lot of host feeding and from our work in the lab, it appears to kill a lot of um, individuals in host feeding. So that's something we're looking at. Um, when it paralyzes, or um, when it paralyzes that species in oviposits, um, as that parasitoid develops inside the spotted lanternfly nymph, it produces this protective sac, which shown here in that middle image, called a thylacium, um, right under the wing bud. Then the larvae emerges out and builds a cocoon um, away from the the nymph carcass that it leaves. In Beijing, um, our collaborators have um, worked on tracking the life cycle of Dryanid, which I'm showing here in that graph of blue, yellow, and red of when the adults, larvae, and cocoons are present in the field. Um, they've reported that it had about 31% parasitism, um, although it could be a bit higher. Prior, it was reported to have higher percent parasitism on the nymphs. It also appears to result in a lot of mortality from host feeding on the nymphs. Um, and we've observed it to feed and parasitize um, within 24 hours of emerging. We have this past year, we received 70 cocoons from China and we stored those for two and a half, three and three and a half months in chill before bringing them out to emerge. Meanwhile, we grew Atlantis from seed and we hatched out spotted lanternfly nymphs. Um, however, this was proved to be very challenging because our nymphs didn't emerge very well until we had the new collections of egg masses. And we had a big problem with mites on our Atlantis. So our Atlantis plants weren't do doing very well. So we had to slow down emergence of those wasps and we couldn't utilize all those wasps we pulled them out again, and we're now working on these studies again. We have 13 female wasps and six males currently out in the lab, and we're hopeful that we'll be a lot more successful with the second trial this winter with them. Um, and we're a lot more prepared to build up a, a colony um, with the new collection that we're gonna get from our collaborators in China this year. Um, we don't have much data to report because we've been problem solving our rearing methods. Um, but we're really hopeful with these 13 females and six males and the new collections this summer that we'll get some really interesting results and start to get a robust colony of these going so we can start host range testing of these. We are starting um, getting the, the background work, the framework of our host range testing um, put in place now so it's ready as soon as we have a colony going. So with that, um, I just want to wrap up. So in conclusion, we have two species of potential biocontrol agents. Um, we are looking at life history studies, ecological studies, behavioral assays, genetic analyses, and our approach to study these, um, perfect our rearing, and figure out if they're going to be good um, biocontrol agents for us to study further. More work is needed on Anastasis orientalis to understand the role of these different haplotypes um, and to understand the host specificity of these haplotypes. And we're still at the beginning stages of our work with Dryanus sinicus, but this species um, has a lot of promise because its parasitism style, um, parasitizing nymphs, means that it needs to be really well synchronized with its host. So that suggests that it may be um, more host specific or it will be more host specific um, and hopefully it's highly host specific. So um, with that, I'm gonna wrap up. We just have a few minutes now before lunch, just three minutes. So if there's time for any questions, I'll take those. Otherwise, uh, you're welcome to contact myself or Julie with any follow-up questions that we don't have time for now. So with that, thank you.
Thanks, Hannah. That was really great. Yeah, I did have one, there's probably some other questions, but there was one question that came up about the storage of the egg masses, like at what temperatures or how, how is that done? Yeah, sure. We've been storing our egg masses at 5C, full dark, 65% humidity. Um, and that has been working just fine for rearing out anastatus. We've been able to store those for more than a year and anastatus orientalis is able to parasitize them with no significant difference than when we use freshly collected egg masses. Um, that is not a good storage method for rearing out nymphs and we know that. Um, so for the dryanid, that storage method is not working and we've been pouring through the literature and we're also looking at different humidities of storage and timing um, of how long we can store things so that we get better nymphal hatch. And I know that others are working that as well. As well. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. uh, is there any other questions? Oh, at, at what point does the nymphs die with the dryanus? And do the nymphs die just from the eggs or do the wasps also eat them? Uh, so we, we don't know exactly the host feeding behaviors with the dryanid. Um, we know we see them holding nymphs and we see uh, bite marks in those nymphs after we see a lot of mortality. We have not yet been able to contact quantify how much mortality um, is causing that. We also don't know if they host feed and parasitize on the same individuals. We don't know how many of individuals that they've host fed on actually survive versus die. Um, so I don't think I can answer that yet other than we see the host feeding behaviors and we see a high rate of mortality that appears to be higher um, than individuals that we're holding without the dryanids in there, but we have not quantified anything yet. Okay. And did you have a question, Rick? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Given the dryanus seems to be particularly promising, is it possible? But it sounds like you have very a great deal of difficulty synchronizing it in the lab here. Is it possible to do the enough host specificity testing in China to evaluate its possible release here? That's a really good idea. Um, I think we wouldn't not be possible to do all of that testing in China, but I think that that's a really great idea to try to do some rearing and host range testing in China, do some here. We also, Lisa Tewksbury um, down at URI was is putting in a permit to also rear dryanids um, because they take a lot of space, they take a lot of plants, they're very challenging. Um, so we're already trying to build an approach of having it reared in multiple locations so that we can go at this um, from multiple sides. Our collaborators in China right now um, this summer are going to be pretty flat out with collections doing further surveys across China for other anastatus, running field work studies, and making collections of dryanid cocoons, which they keep some of them, we take some of them. So they always keep some as well. So for this year, they're going to be pretty flat out, but I think that's a, um, a good idea for going forward um, to just diversify this even more. OK, thanks, Hannah. Are there any other questions for Hannah at this time? But she said you could always contact her or Julie if you had further questions. Okay, so I, I think we're right at noon, so it's time for uh, to take the lunch break, and then we should reconvene at uh, at one o'clock. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Yep. Hi everybody. This is Greg. I just wanted to say, you know, we have about a minute to go before we start up again. But I, I just wanted to, I didn't do it earlier, but I definitely want to thank all the speakers this morning. So they had not only for their presentations, but also it was great that they, everybody was really excellent on staying on time and keeping us on track on our agenda. So for this afternoon, um, before we have the break at around 2.30, we'll have four speakers going. Uh, and the first speaker we'll have up is uh, Dr. Tracy Lesky from our, the USDA Agricultural Research Service, uh, talking about what her lab is doing related to spotted lanternfly. So, uh, it's one o'clock right now, so we can get started with that. And um, Tracy, I don't know if you're all set to go. Yeah, I am, Greg. I'm going to share my screen. 
hopefully will let me share. Yep. Let me see. Greg, can you see my full screen? Yeah. Yeah, it's showing okay. up for presenter view. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. And what I'm going to do is give an overview of what we are doing in, and as part of my lab group regarding host plants, behavior and chemical ecology, as well as some mitigation strategies. So I'll start with some of the host plants and specialty crop risk work we've been going to do, we've been doing over the past couple of years. And I'll, the way these slides will be set up, I'll have a key question, some of the methods, and then the results to date. So the first question that we had with regard to, oops, with regard to host plants are uh, what wild and cultivated host plants can support spotted lanternfly over a two week period of time? So in other words, a single host diet for different life stages, early in stars, late in stars and adults given um, a, a full tree um, and then allowed to feed for two weeks. And the host that we looked at included tree of heaven, black cherry, black walnut, black locust, common hackberry, sugar maple, white oak, mulberry, apple and peach. So these are the results of the study. Um, and what, what you can see for early in stars, late in stars and adults is sort of a change in survivorship. Um, while SLF, we did observe them feeding on all of these hosts, the two-week survivorship was not high except for Tree of Heaven across all life stages and Black Walnuts for early and late in stars. Um, interestingly, by the time we did get to the adult, you can see we had very little survivorship on these coats relative to the early in stars and, and late in stars. So that was sort of interesting and kind of aligns to this notion of host narrowing and also the importance of tree of heaven in the adult life stage. To complement this work, we asked the question, how effectively does SLF complete development on key wild and cultivated specialty crop host plants? And again, we did this at the, at the quarantine greenhouse at Fort Detrick, Maryland. We started with 30 instars per cage, and we had single host diets of tree of heaven, black walnut, apple, peach, and grape, as well as mixed host diets of tree of heaven plus one of these other hosts. In this case, what you can see is that first of all, apple, grape, and peach alone did not support development to the adult stage, um, with uh, very few making it either to the second in star, third or fourth on peach, grape, and apple respectively. But they did complete development on tree of heaven, black walnut alone, and mixed diets. And the things that were really kind of interesting about this were, first of all, um, tree of heaven alone, obviously we had the highest survivorship, but it also was the longest for the um, nymphs to complete development. Whereas some of the mixed diets, as well as black walnut, we saw reduction in time period to the adult stage by up to about 16% for black walnut. But the other interesting thing was survivorship of the adults once they've re re reached the adult stage on black walnut alone. In this case, the adults only uh, survive for about eight days, whereas all of the other diets, either Tree of Heaven alone or the mixed diets, we had good survivorship for around 50-ish days or so. Also, um, Julie Urban is going to be looking at these females that emerged from these. She has the specimens and sort of will be looking at the reproductive development relative to these different diets as well. Another question that has been part of this whole process is trying to develop rearing methods for SLF to create a persistent year-round colony. And so originally we did some work based on some collaborations with Julie Gould's lab as well as with our colleagues at Virginia Tech um, with Doug Pfeiffer and Andy Deshane. And so Essentially, uh, what we found in those initial studies was that, um, you know, uh, sort of cut foliage or apical meristems and epicormic shoots didn't really support development. So we went to this whole tree system where we use tree of heaven alone, and we also compared that to tree of heaven plus grape plant diets in 2020. We also evaluated suitable of a position substrates, and we've been utilizing the work of Melody Kina and Ann Nielsen in terms of um, storing egg masses and getting, um, you know, sort of maximal hatch. And so what we have found is that you can rear SLF in the laboratory 
based on this whole plant diet consisting of probably tree of heaven plus grape, although tree of heaven alone works well. Um, and, uh, but the mixed diet we see reduced development time. Then um, the big thing for us, and I just want to point out so, uh, is that we had to reduce, and when we were trying to elicit oviposition, we, we reduced um, the, the light dark cycle down to about a 12 12, and also um, the temperatures at night to a little bit cooler. And we provided the adults with these bolts of wood that allowed them to, or, or, or at least seemed to stimulate them to lay eggs. And so we had females laying eggs in quarantine. Generally, I just Julie mentioned this this morning, one to three egg masses. And so this is kind of just a schematic showing how we would recommend doing this work. Um, I can say though that, you know, there may be a capacity right now, it's probably about nine months to complete a generation, but we may be able to shorten that a bit with a non-diapausing colony and we're looking at potential growth regulators or as well as some no-chill hatchers to see if we can make that happen. But this is still a work in progress, but we do, I think, have the pieces in place now where we can rear them effectively throughout the year. Uh, we're going to leave the lab now and go to the field, and this is some of uh, Laura Nixon, my postdoc's work, where she's been asking how acceptable are key wild and cultivated hosts based on um, a mark release recapture, where she's looked at early nymphs, late nymphs, as well as adults, marked them with fluorescent dusts, released them under these um, cages that we created that have some... Um, uh, some shading made out of shade cloth. And then we look at how long they remain on these host plants uh, up to 24 hours to get a sense of how acceptable are they to different life stages. Now, this is just a first year of data, so Laura will be adding to the study. But what we saw was, not surprisingly, grape was highly acceptable to early in stars, while tree of heaven appeared to be more acceptable to later in stars and adults. But again, we're going to be adding to this. But grape may be an important early season host, and certainly it seems like it could be another host we could use for uh, as an indicator of spotted lanternfly presence. But as you can see with the early in stars, they were remaining on grape plants for over 10 hours versus um, between three and five hours for the other host. And that pattern kind of continued, but again, you can see this increased period of time on um, Tree of Heaven as they matured to the adult stage. Additionally, under this idea of um, host usage, um, one of the questions that we had that's part of the SCRI grant with, that Julie is leading is asking, can we use gut content the gut content analysis technique developed for potato psyllid for spotted lanternfly. And this was based on work that Rodney Cooper with USDA ARS in Wapato, Washington had developed originally for uh, potato psyllid, but then it was then applied to brown marmorated stink bug by uh, Jim Hepler. And Jim will be joining our lab as a postdoc later this summer and helping with this work. And then of course, I wanna highlight the nice work from Bill Lamp's lab with Alina and Bill, um, where they used a very similar method. Um, Heather Leach has assisted us with this work um, and we took samples in both 2019 and 2020 and they were sent to Rodney where he did the looked for host plant chloroplast genes amplified via PCR and then the amp, uh, amplicons were um, identified using high throughput sequencing. So I just wanted to show you a bit of data from that. Um, and this was just from some nymphal samples that we collected in Virginia versus an adult sample that um, Heather collected in Pennsylvania. And what was great about this is that host plant DNA were detected from both nymphal and adult samples. And so our next step is going to be looking at signal persistence studies. So in other words, if an insect feeds on tree of heaven, how long does that signal persist? Or if we put them on another host, you see both of those signals. And then once we get a better handle on that for the different life stages, we'll also be asking additional biological questions related to host use patterns. So in terms of this work, the plans for 2021 um, in Fort Detrick, as you saw, we had those um, single versus mixed diet studies, but now we're going to do some additional ones where grape and black walnut are really the hosts that we will pair with other, um, with other host plants to see if they can complete development. 
We also have what we call the Viney study where we're looking at grapes, hops, and kiwi host development and survivorship as well. We'll continue some of this work with host retention as a proxy for acceptability of different life stages using mark release or capture, as well as harmonic radar. And you can see our unit there that is being held by Whitney Haddon, a PhD student who was actually doing some brown marmorated work with the, the, the unit this past summer. We have some studies planned looking at spotted lantern fly feeding on young fruit tree plantings, as well as the gut content analysis I mentioned, and um, also potentially looking at um, the effect of SL SLF feeding on microbiomes and grapes. And this, a lot of this new work will be headed up by um, my postdoc, Joanna Elsenson, who recently just joined the lab. Moving on to behavioral and chemical ecology, um, you know, we started out just trying to understand more about the dispersal behavior and asking questions like how far will SLF nymphs and adults walk on vertical surfaces and jump in horizontal planes and We've done this work, uh, we did this work of a couple of years ago and published it. And what we found was that, first of all, spotted lanternfly, not surprisingly, are negatively gravitactic. They have a natural behavior to climb up vertical objects. We also see that nymphs climb longer distances than adults with sort of the post of oviposition adults climbing the shortest distances, but reverse, um, adults actually, not surprisingly, jump longer distances than nymphs. And we think that obviously these traps should be designed to take advantage of that gravita negative gravitaxis. And so the only concern we had was the potential for adults not to be willing to move up the distance necessary to reach unbaited traps. Um, we've done some work uh, looking at these different circle trap designs relative to standard uh, sticky bands, and this work was also recently published. And similar to the kinds of uh, results that Joe found uh, uh, and described this morning, we did find this um, USDA modified trap, which has a larger collection device with a vinyl coated polyester screen to be probably the most acceptable trap in general. These, this trap design either caught equivalent or more adults than the sticky band, but importantly, it also had significantly fewer non-targets. We saw far more non-target captures of both vertebrates and invertebrates on sticky bands again. And so being able to move away from those is, you know, something that will help us in terms of just the overall surveillance programs. To complement what we've been doing with trap development, we really wanted to get at the idea of an optimized deployment strategy. At what height should these traps to be deployed? How often should be, they be checked? And what impact does hostry have? And so this is a collaborative project with um, my lab and Penn State. And so we did a couple of different studies in 2020. We evalu evaluated traps deployed low on the trunk of trees versus a standard height of about one meters to see if that made a difference for those adults that weren't necessarily willing to climb that far. We also looked at trap check intervals of one, two, and three weeks to see if that influenced captures. And we deployed uh, traps on Tree of Heaven and other common hosts just to see how sensitive they were throughout the season. And again, this is the first year of data on these. But what you can see for, first of all, trap height, we saw the greatest numbers and significantly greater actually for the adult stage um, at the standard height. Despite our concerns, it seems like that probably is not a good thing to do to deploy it too low because it probably interferes with the visual stimulus of sort of that upright uh, dark trunk. Weekly checks of traps are likely best, especially for, for nymphs. We saw a numerical decline in the numbers being captured if we waited until three weeks. And we also saw, obviously, sample degra degradation. Not as much for adults, but again, this will be repeated in 2021. And in terms of the different host trees, you can see the captures in both PA and uh, Virginia. We saw in general better captures, not surprisingly, on Tree of Heaven, but we also saw some decent numbers in Black Walnut. And again, this will be repeated in 2021. Moving on to some other behavioral work that we've been um, exploring, trying to get at the question of do gregarious adults display behaviors while mating and foraging, which may provide evidence for sources of attractive olfactory stimuli. Trying to find 
potential attractants that we can use with these uh, traps that we've been deploying. So we've been doing a little bit of this work since 2019, looking at these group-based adult interactions while they're foraging and mating. And these are have been done to date on Tree of Heaven, um, up to about two meters high. And today I'm just going to show you a smattering of data that we collected in late September, early October, where over about a two minute period, we recorded things like resting, foraging, feeding, feeding site competition, male competition for females, courtship, mating, and ova position. And so uh, what we found from these kinds of data, and Joanna is going to be expanding on this study in 2021, is that adults spend time in groups with males outnumbering females early in the season, but then we see a reverse as the feet as the season goes on. Um, feeding, feeding and mate competition, courtship and mating were observed frequently, um, and so you can see that the average size in these particular samples, there were about 7.5 individuals. In this case, it was a little later in the season, so we had a few more females than males. Uh, in the, Just on these dates, we saw 12% of these groups exhibiting feeding competition where one individual would push another out of a feeding site. We also observed mating competition and mating in the field. So. Um, all of this will be better characterized, but all of this and based on these kind of behaviors has led to some work that um, my postdoc, Laura Nixon, has been working on, which is asking the question, can we identify novel attractants for SLF based on behavioral observations made under field conditions? And so in this case, Laura has been looking at um, different sources of olfactory stimuli, including intact tree of heaven, tree of heaven that's been damaged artificially to kind of simulate um, spotted lanternfly feeding, tree of heaven where spotted lanternfly were feeding and then removed, and then tree of heaven with adult male, female, or mixed sexes feeding. And so she's uh, working on the analysis now, and in collaboration with Trace, who we have a cooperative research and development agreement with on the spotted lanternfly work. We're hoping to put some experimental lures out in the field in 2021. So that's the goal for this work. So in terms of plans for 2021, we will be repeating those trap deployment strategy trials. Um, we're going to be doing a comparison of trap captures, um, hopefully with, uh, and you'll hear from Julie Lockwood later where we've been doing eDNA versus um, conventional trap capture samples. Um, we're going to repeat and expand that gregarious or group behavior um, observational studies to provide context for promising sources of olfactory stimuli. And then also based on this work, Joanna is going to start looking at sort of quantifying the short range visual cues used in both laboratory trials with uh, servospheres or ethovision and under kind of semi-field conditions with 3D models to understand how both the nymphs and adults may interact with each other and how important those short range visual cues that they may use in these interactions. So more on that to come. Um, we will continue to analyze headspace volatile samples and evaluate um, some experimental lures in the field. And we're going to use that vertical tree mimicking bioassay system where we have these wooden posts that we put in the ground to sort of remove um, any sort of uh, host plant um, influence on the results. And then continue collecting and analyzing promising data relative to volatile stimuli. And also, hopefully, we have a project with uh, drones or UAVs for tracking brown marmorated stink bug. We have some ideas, but we haven't gotten that far down the road yet as to whether we might be able to use a similar type of approach for spotted lanternfly. Um, next, I'll go on to the last section, um, which is management and mitigation. Um, and in this case, um, I, the question that we had, and this was relative to just understanding more about how key insecticides perform in the field, how do they perform when applied to different substrates, and what is the residual activity? And so we were trying to understand some of the results or, or the observations we were making in the field when we would see them on the bark of Tree of Heaven. And so the way we did this was to compare high label rates of dinotefuran or bivenom, bifenthrin, 
uh, carbaryl thiamethoxam or a water control. And these were applied on different substrates and allowed to dry, over, dry overnight. And in this case, the rates were based on um, some of Heather Leach's work. And uh, the substrates that we looked at were sort of a, uh, one that would be kind of, you know, the most optimistic, which was using glass petri dishes where the residue is very available. And the second was on tree of heaven bark disc to understand how um, that may influence the longevity. And we looked at nymphs and adults exposed to these for one hour. And then we looked at mortality 40, 48 hours later. And then we did a second study where we had tree of heaven where we actually treated full trees and the adults were exposed for six hours at 12 hours after application and then seven days. And so, and then we would look at mortality 48 hours later. So in this case, um, not surprisingly, especially when um, right after treatment, we saw that most materials were pretty effective, especially when you look at things like on glass Petri dishes, but also on the wooden discs from Tree of Heaven Bark, we did see high mortality for all materials relative to the water control. So that was good. Um, when we when we did the whole trees, and um, you can see that overall, most of the materials were still pretty good, but um, after the seven days, you can see a pretty big decline on carbaryl and thiamethoxam. Um, we're planning to do specialty crops this year and assessing actually two and three week measurements. So instead of just measuring them seven days later, we'll look at residual activity over a longer interval. Um, so more of that to come. Additionally, um, we are uh, collaborating on some um, post-harvest treatment trials that are going to be led by Spencer Walls. Um, and these are going to be targeting egg masses and the materials that um, Spencer has proposed to use is our methyl bromides, sulfur sulfuryl fluoride, phosphine, hydrogen cyanide, propylene oxide, and ozone. And so uh, we're working through some of the logistics right now, um, but the goal would be to, to develop a suite of post-harvest fumigation treatments to control SLF in a wide variety of operational scenarios and um, applications. So um, again, this, this is another pending one, but I expect that we'll have this up and running this year. In terms of plans for 2021, um, Again, we will be doing those insecticidal trial repeats, uh, weathering trees under natural conditions and measuring residual activity. The other new um, studies that we have going on, um, we are working with David Shapiro Elon with USDA ARS and evaluating entomopathogenic nematodes, several different strains against eggs, nymphs, and adults to provide another potential non-insecticidal treatment for um, SLF. We also want to look at surround WP, the kaolin clay, as a crop protectant and potential deterrent. We know that this material was pretty good against glassy wing sharpshooter. And this was a material that was actually developed at uh, our laboratory by a couple of scientists who have retired in recent years. But um, it's definitely a material that could provide kind of a behavioral protectant uh, for crops or other systems that may want, you know, may be useful. And like I said, it was pretty good against getting glassy wing sharpshooter. And then, of course, we're going to be doing some work with the post-harvest fumigation. So I think that's it. I just want, want to thank everybody um, in my lab group, as well as this long list of collaborators that I've worked with on the Spotted Lanternfly and our funding sources. So I think I ended early, Greg. <laughs> oh, that's fine, that's okay. Uh, there were a couple of questions on here too. Um, uh, there was one question about what grape cultivar did you use? For the which in the diet, trial? In the diet studies is what I know. Oh, in the diet studies. Yeah. Hey, Laura, what? I, Laura should be on here. She should be able to answer that. I'm not sure if I'll remember right now off the top of my head. Can she? Can she ask questions, or does she just type them into the chat? Chat. Great. I, don't, I think she could. Somebody has to unmute her. That's all. I think Nancy might have to unmute her. Okay. Somebody. If 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 you can unmute Nor Laura Nixon, she may be able to tell us. Um, have you been able to capture the start of copulation in the field? I see that. Um, yes, yes, 
We have. And is methyl bromide being phased out? I don't know. I'll ask Spencer though. <laughs> and I'm not sure if Laura, Carlos, there it is. It was also what we could get <laughs> when we did this work. And for, I, I don't know if Brian's question too about when you were able to capture the star, like if you might be looking for a time, like in the, like a date. Or uh, like, or yeah, like. Joanne has been doing some more analyses of these data. So um, Brian, if you want to get with us at some point, um, um, we can we can do that and tell you when we first saw, saw copulation in the field. Yeah. And Laura, are you able to, are you on Laura? There she typed know. Carlos. I think that was it. <laughs> okay. I got it. Okay. Yeah. And do you see the, the other question about the, um, how you measured die off on the trees versus the Petri plate? And is, was there no movement of SLF to the dino treated trees from other areas? Oh, these were all done in cages. So this wasn't done under field. Like they were in the, it was sort of what we call semi field. So we had a treated tree that we would put in a cage. Yeah. And we would just measure die off based on, you know, like I said, 48 hours after that exposure interval. Well, we did it at 24 too, but I'm just showing you the 24, I mean the 48 today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and do you see this specific question about the other? Um, yeah, yeah I haven't done any of those. I don't know if um, Heather may have or Greg Krawcheck may have, but we have not. Okay. I think that was it for all the questions, unless there's some others. I don't see anybody. I don't know if I have the ability to see if people have their hand raised or not. <laughs> all right. Anything else, Tracy, you want to add? No, thank you for uh, everybody and thanks for the questions. Okay, thanks Tracy. All right, I'll see if, uh, if Melody Keena is ready to go for her presentation. Sure, Greg. Are you ready? Okay, all right, so yeah, next will be uh, Dr. Melody Keena from US Forest Service. Just have to find the right screen here. Oh, yeah, that's fine. We have we have time. <laughs> Come on, it doesn't want. There we go. Goes in the slides. Okay, covers up everything, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's it. Yeah, you're on. You're good. It's good. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. So I'm going to talk about the spotted line um, phonology based on a lot of different uh, laboratory trials. And this work is in collaboration with uh, Devin Creepman, who is a master's student at Rutgers and George Hamilton, his major professor and Ann Nelson. This is an overall picture of uh, what we're looking at, these four basic topics. The ones that are yellowed out are ones that are um, completed and published in most cases and the green are underway. So I'll just give you updates on each of them. So the first being temperature requirements for egg hatch. And there is a paper published on that. I'll show you that on the next slide. And a piece of that that Anne's been doing this year affects the photo period on hatch timing. And I'm not gonna show you data on that, but basically photo period has no effect. Um, this is all so that we can predict when eggs will hatch um, with a little more regularity and be able to predict it across a wider range of uh, potential um, locations where spotted lanternfly might show up. Second one being effects of temperature on nymphs, looking at the developmental rates by instar and temperature and their survival also by instar and temperature, getting degree days for each instar. The third one, effects of host on development and also effects of cold snaps and heat waves on development. 
This is so we can adjust the phonology model that we're working on um, for house. Sorry about the dogs. Um, and we can also adjust to account for variable temperature and confirm the thresholds. And finally, development of an agent-based phonology model. This is in early phases right now. This would be able to predict when each stage would be present on the landscape and potential ranges based on um, requirements for completing development. So these are the two papers that are already published. They're part of the Spotted Lanternfly Collection in Environmental Entomology. Just to give you an idea of where we collected our Agmas from, from in the last two years, we've been collecting them in October within about two weeks of them being laid. So they're experiencing very little uh, temperature variation in the field and haven't been out there very long. In uh, 2019, we collected them around Allentown, the, the pink markers. And this last October, we collected them from as far south as uh, Philadelphia area and then moving north into New Jersey. Oops. Okay, once we collected the egg masses, they were on pieces of bark and we held them in these loose fitting petri dishes. And then the petri dishes were held in plastic um, containers that were also allow airflow and put into chambers at different temperatures where they could be observed for hatch. So during the first study, we used 10 degrees constant, 15 degrees constant and 20 degrees constant as well as some other treatments, which I'll show you in a minute. And more recently, this last um, year, we've been able to hold some of these newly collected October egg masses at 25 and 30 degrees to see if they would hatch at those temperatures. We had one egg hatch at 25 and nothing at 30 for newly laid eggs. So they were able to hatch over the 10 to 25 degree temperature range. The lower threshold based on this was 7.39 degrees Celsius. And it would appear that the upper threshold will be just above 25 degrees Celsius. This just gives you a better idea of the spread of time over which the eggs hatch for the 15 and 20 degree constant temperatures. Um, for 15 degrees, the average time to first hatch or average time to hatch was 91 days. And for 20, it was 68 days. And there were some questions in the morning session about the spread of the hatch. For these two constant temperatures, the spread was about 30 days total. But each egg mass itself was only taking six and a half or seven days to complete its hatch. So the spread was more based on between egg mass differences in this particular case. But what we found is this is not consistent for all populations. The uh, purple line with the um, diamonds in the middle is the 2019 data that's published. The three populations that we collected from this year, you can see span the range of before and after that particular time frame by as much as uh, 10 days. In particular, the New Jersey ones hatched quite a bit earlier than both of the strains that we collected this year. What we don't know yet and we're looking into is if they, if each of these three strains experienced substantially different um, climate conditions before they were collected. And obviously we don't know exactly how long each egg mass was out there before it was collected. What we're suspecting is that there might be some adaptation already to a shorter growing um, season as they have moved north. The other treatments that we had in the egg study were holding eggs at five or 10 degrees Celsius for different lengths of time. And this produced um, some interesting patterns. Five degrees is below the threshold for development and 10 is above. When you hold them below the threshold for development, if you hold them for short periods of time, they most of the eggs will be in diapause and it won't be sufficient temperature um, accumulation to allow them to complete that diapause. But as they continue at five degrees, they complete the diapause and then they will hatch at starting at about 20 days and that does not change over time. If you hold them above the threshold, however, 
the time to hatch, first hatch and average hatch, um, declines with the number of days that you hold them at that temperature. And getting back to how long it takes an egg mass to hatch, for the five degree treatments, it was four to five days for an individual egg mass to complete its hatch. Whereas at the 10 degrees, the lower number of days of at 10 degrees had higher lengths of time that the egg mass hatched over, 13 days being the longest. And as the time at 10 degrees increased, that time reduced down to about three days. There are also effects on the percent of eggs that will hatch in an egg mass, as well as the percent of egg masses with hatch. In both cases, 10 degrees seem to be a better temperature at which to maintain the hatchability and see the highest percentage of egg masses hatching compared to five degrees. But for both temperatures, about 100 days, maximum hatch and maximum number of egg masses with hatch was seen. Using all this data, we were able to uh, determine the degree days for the diapause completion as well as the post-diapause completion. And that is in one of the papers. Moving on to the effective temperature on nymphal development and survival. Initially, we used the tubes that you see on the right so that we could have more replicates per temperature, given that chambers can only hold so many cages. And ultimately, we discovered that those tubes will work fairly well for the lower end stars, but not the higher ones. So we went to the cages that you've seen in some other people's presentations for the larger end stars. This is just an example of survival for the first instar. You can see that the first instar was able to survive and complete development over the temperature range of 35 degrees Celsius down to 15 degrees Celsius. And they survived um, fairly long, a month at uh, 10 degrees and lesser times at the five and, five and 40 degrees. This is uh, the developmental curves for all four N stars. If you uh, look at the blue dots, those are the actual observed data. The red line is a nonlinear model, uh, the Bury, and the black line would be the linear model. The lower thresholds for each of the N stars is given in purple. And you'll notice that as the N star increases, the lower threshold declines somewhat. And in terms of completing development uh, in an instar, they were able to complete development at 35 degrees at both first and second instar, but only very few individuals of the second instar. But above that temperature, they weren't able to complete development in the instars at that high a temperature. Given the thresholds, we were able to develop this degree day model for each one of the instars. That's also in the paper. Notice here that as the instar increases, the number of degree days increases. The cold snap and heat wave study, this is just to give you an idea of what is planned and, and underway. For the cold snaps, we're looking at just the first and second instars, comparing a constant 15 degree temperature versus a chamber that is at 20 degrees for eight hours and five degrees at 16 hours, again, averaging 15 degrees for the whole time period and to, repeating that for the second instar. Right now, we're about halfway through the first instars and we've seen that mortality significantly increases with the varying temperature regime. And we've also seen something else that would hint at that adaptation is also occurring as they move north. Given that the New Jersey strain that we're currently using in this study is able to complete development in 35 days at 15 degrees, whereas the Pennsylvania strains we previously looked at, it took 71 days. For heat waves, we're gonna do it on third and fourth in stars. We're gonna compare a constant 25 to two treatments that average to 25, eight hours of 35 degrees and six hours of 40 degrees with the remaining time at 20. This is an ongoing study 
getting close to completion, the effect of host on nymphal development and survival at 25 degrees. So the two bars that are in the black or gray color range, um, first and second in stars, those are the ones that are ongoing right now. Those are based on hatch from the three uh, locations that we collected egg masses from this year. Whereas the yellow, red, and green, the second, third, and fourth in stars, but I have an A after them, those were completed um, last year using first and second in stars collected in the field. In each case, we um, raised the nymph to the instar of interest on a grape and alanthus combination. And then as soon as they have molted to that instar, they're moved to the host of interest and kept there for one instar. And we determine exactly how many days they spend in that instar. The survival, as you can see, is best on alanthus and grape, although some of the instars do very well on willow and some of the other hosts. These are the field collected ones that were placed on the different hosts. We only used the four hosts, Alanthus grape, and that's Concord grape, um, willow and red maple. In the first year, the second instars, the red maple was a slight, slightly slower development than the other three hosts. In the third instar, the willow was slightly slower. And in the fourth instar, the willow appears slower, but is not statistically such. The biggest and most important takeaway from this is that grape and alanthus had very similar rates of development on for each of the instars. This is the ongoing right now. The first instars are pretty much complete, although we have a few stragglers. And the second instars are about half done. Um, what you'll see from the first instars is that there were two hosts, basil and maple, that they developed slower on, and that slower development resulted in smaller individuals. The other host had very similar developmental rate and similar sizes. For second instars, development on bittersweet, bittersweet was slower than some of the other hosts, Lanthus, grape, and willow in particular whereas maple and rose were highly variable. What was interesting was that in most cases, you would expect to see the males developing faster than the females, but there were a few hosts where that seems to be switching. And if you look at the top graph, you'll see that the weights of the Alanthus grown ones, the grape grown ones, and the willow ones were pretty comparable for both sexes, whereas the other hosts were lesser than those. And there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of technical help that goes into this uh, list of the technicians there. Quite a few people that have helped us take egg masses off of trees. And the funding comes from uh, the APHIS uh, farm bill money. And I will let people ask questions at this point. All right, thanks, Melody. Let me see if any, any questions come through. Give it a minute or two to see if any pop up. I don't see any hands raised either. Okay. All right. Thank you, Melody. All right, so we'll go on to next uh, is um, Jennifer Chandler with Westchester University, and she's a Forest Service cooperator. And if you're ready to go, Jen, or not. Sure, let me figure out how to share this screen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. the, the bane of everyone's existence, right? <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> all yeah, right, can you uh, all see that? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, so thanks so much for, for letting me talk very briefly about some of the impacts of sooty mold accumulation and the understory that we've seen. Um, so all of you, I'm sure, have spent plenty of time in the forests that are infested with spotted lanternfly. 
during late summer and fall, and you no doubt have, are used to being rained on by the honeydew coming from the posterior of the spotted lanternfly and the trees above you. Um, just a quick refresher, um, I know I have some students on here, so for those of you who aren't as familiar, um, honeydew is a sugar-rich liquid that's excreted by the spotted lanternfly as they feed on a host uh, plant sap. And you can see um, the clear honeydew, which looks a whole lot like water on the leaves in this middle picture. Um, come back in a few weeks and you may see mats of sooty mold covering the leaves and the branches of mid-story and understory trees. And you can see um, the black sooty mold on all three of the images here. So sooty mold is a common term that refers to a type of fungi that live on the honeydew excreted by insects such as the spotted lanternfly. And it typically grows on honeydew that falls on the adaxial or upper surface of leaves and on woody portions of plants. And this mold forms a thin black blanket of mycelia, but it doesn't actually infect the leaf. It does, however, act as a neutral light filter and can cause a reduction of incident light by physical obstruction. So prolonged cover of leaves by sooty mold and the resultant prolonged shading do have the potential to interfere with photosynthesis. Um, they have been shown to result in yellowing of foliage in some plants and can potentially cause premature leaf senescence. Um, however, this response is not ubiquitous. Um, in fact, a study by Wood et al. in 1988 focused on seven-year-old established pecan trees whose leaves were subjected to woody mold. And this study suggested that light interference by sooty mold decreased net photosynthesis by 21% in medium intensity mold infestations, excuse me, and up to 69% when infestations were particularly severe. Uh, in Swasti uh, et al. in 2015, evaluated the effects of sooty mold on leaves of 10-year-old orange trees. And this study found that sooty mold did intercept between 44% and 74% of the photosynthetic photon flux density on these leaves. But nevertheless, acclimation to the shading effect of sooty mold was evident as increases in chlorophyll content and quantum yield. Um, additionally, in this study, there were no observed differences in the maximum rate of photosynthesis among individuals that were infested with mold uh, compared to shade leaves that were not. Uh, one more study I want to talk about by Limo Spilo and Paeva in 2006 reported a reduction of 40% of the incident light on mahogany leaves due to physical blockage by uh, black sooty mold. Uh, this same study reported that the sooty mold did not lead to any physical damage of the leaf, but that it did reduce the mahogany leaf's photosynthetic capacity, which they suggest, and this is really important to me, uh, may be particularly detrimental to initial growth um, of seedlings in the understory. So it was really studies like this that got me interested in what effects sooty mold may be having in the understories of eastern forests that are infested with spotted lanternfly. So as the range of spotted lanternfly in the US continues to spread, it's important to understand the shading effect that the resultant sooty mold has on lower strata plants, as well as the, the potential spatial impact. So the first thing we wanted to look at was the physical obstruction of light that occurred from sooty mold accumulation on leaves of several different species found under spotted lanternfly infested tree of heaven. So leaves from three species, tree of heaven, autumn olive, and hickory species were selected based on their availability in the understory at several sites that were heavily infested with spotted lanternfly. Um, these leaves were haphazardly selected to ensure that the samples covered a large spectrum of mold infestation. Um, in other words, I wanted to have some leaves with little to no sooty mold coverage, all the way up to leaves that were fairly heavily covered. So I quantified the percentage change in photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR, that was transmitted through the leaf when sooty mold is present compared to when sooty mold is removed. So again, looking at that physical obstruction. I chose to focus on a standardized relative measure, that is the percent change in PAR transmitted through a leaf, because we wanted to study the shading effects across these species whose morphology, uh, like leaf thickness, for example, 
varied both by species, but also between individual leaves on the same species. So in order to make these measurements, a stationary light source was positioned facing downward from a ring stand and a quantum sensor was situated uh, two centimeters below with the sensor facing upward toward the light source. One at a time, unaltered leaves, and so these are the leaves where the sooty mold uh, was still attached to the leaf. Uh, they were placed over the sensor and PAR transmission through the leaf and any attached sooty mold on that leaf was recorded. Uh, images of each one of these leaves were taken directly following the measurement and were eventually analyzed to determine the percent cover of sooty mold on the surface of the leaf. Once those images have been taken, uh, those same leaves were gently wiped with a wet sponge to remove any sooty mold present on the adaxial surface. Um, and all leaves that I worked with were processed identically, regardless of whether or not there was any noticeable sooty mold uh, to start with on the leaf. And the images you see here of the leaves are just an example of what some of them looked like um, with sooty mold and then a little area cleared of the sooty mold. So once I'd wiped the sooty mold off, these leaves were then placed back onto the sensor and the PAR transmission through the leaf was remeasured. And in order to calculate the percent change in transmittance, I use the formula you see here. So we wanted to ask the question, how does the percent area of sooty mold on the adaxial side of the leaf affect the percent of PAR transmittance? So using leaves from all three of the species, we regress the percent change in light transmittance where decreasing values on the y-axis indicate less light being transmitted on the percent area of sooty mold coverage on the actual leaf. And so movement right along the x-axis indicates more area covered by sooty mold. Uh, a linear model best fit these data. And I found that the change in the percent light transmitted through the leaf decreased as the percent of sooty mold that covers the leaf increased. So what we expected. Among all three of these species, for every 1% increase in sooty mold area on a leaf, uh, transmittance decreased by approximately a third of a percent. So I performed also um, this same regressions on all of the species individually. And in most of these species, we saw a pretty clear negative trend. Um, Alanthus was a little different though. So the data for Alanthus were best modeled using a second order polynomial. And as you see, as sooty mold cover increases, less light is transmitted through the leaf up to a point. But there is an inflection where light transmission actually increases when the percent uh, cover of sooty mold on the leaf is highest. And of course, this result is super unexpected. Um, my best explanation for this is that my measurement of percent area covered by sooty mold was not taking into consideration the thickness of the sooty mold mat, which is inherently not uniform across a leaf surface. So in the case of this Alanthus, um, perhaps those leaves that had a greater extent of sooty mold cover also had a thinner layer of, so of sooty mold that did not intercept as much PAR. So we have a bit of an understanding about the extent of physical light obstruction caused by sooty mold um, in these systems. Um, but our next goal was to see spatially how the understory and midstory are being affected. Uh, in other words, we wanted to see how big the footprint of sooty mold is as you move away from the infested tree's trunk. Uh, we suspected that the area of sooty mold impact may extend beyond just the close proximity to the tree, um, like we're, we're used to seeing. And we wanted to answer the question, does the percent area of sooty mold accumulation vary as a function of the distance from the main stem of an infested tree? Uh, in order to answer this, uh, we set up a series of sooty mold collection cards under 11 uh, infested Alanthus trees located in Pennsylvania and Virginia in mid-August uh, 2020. And the criteria for selection as a focal tree were that the species had to be tree of heaven. Uh, the tree must have been at least five inches diameter at breast height or DBH. That at least a portion of the canopy was relatively, relatively unobstructed and independent of the canopies of other tree of heaven. And that the tree supported a healthy population of late in star or adult spotted lantern fly that were actively producing honeydew. So the DBH of each focal tree was measured 
and a tape was pulled from the center of the main stem of the tree to the edge of the canopy, as you can see in this photo. Deposition cards approximately two inches by three inches um, were placed at haphazardly selected distances from the main stem to the edge of the canopy, as you can see, um, with a card always being placed directly adjacent to the main stem of the tree and another card always placed at the furthest edge of the canopy in order to establish a distance spectrum uh, that spanned the entire uh, portion of that, that portion of the canopy. So as you can see in this image, uh, cards were placed flat on an elevated, horizontally situated platform and were secured using a binder clip. And these cards were left in the field for approximately a month, after which they were collected and brought back to the lab for analysis. And you can see some examples of these processed cards um, on the slide. Each card was photographed and analyzed uh, using ImageJ to determine the percent cover of sooty mold on that card surface. Uh, so I wanted the ability to pull the results of the sooty mold cards from all of the trees in order to run an analysis, but the distances from the main stem of the tree to the canopy edge differed for obviously all of these trees. So to standardize this observation, I converted the distance each card was placed from the main stem of the tree into a percent distance from that trunk of the tree to the edge of the canopy. And I realize this sounds very confusing, so here's a visual of that. Um, let's say I have a tree whose canopy extends 20 feet. A card placed at the edge of the canopy would be 100% of the distance from the trunk to that canopy's edge. Whereas a card placed at 10 feet from the center of the main stem of that tree would be half the distance. So 50% of the distance from the trunk to the edge. And I made this conversion for each of the 80 sooty mold cards that were deployed. So in order to determine if a general pattern could be observed, I regressed the percent area of the card covered by sooty mold on the percent distance from the trunk to the canopy edge for all of the observations from all of the trees in this study. We found that a second order polynomial again best explained the variation in percent mold accumulation as a function of distance from the tree. So in this figure, the percent area of the card that was covered by sooty mold after being out in the field for a month is on the y-axis, while the percent distance the card was placed from the trunk of the tree to the edge of the canopy is on the x-axis. Uh, the change in percent area of sooty mold accumulation does vary as a function of the distance from the trunk. Um, and generally, the percent area covered by sooty mold peaks at approximately 35% of the distance, but decreases as one moves further toward the canopy edge. Um, nevertheless, obviously, this pattern is highly variable. Um, and I actually just took the time for fun to model each tree separately. And it's really interesting. Um, in some trees, you see a steady cover of sooty mold that eventually drops off as you reach the canopy edge. Uh, while in other trees, you see a maintained cover from the main stem to the very edge of the canopy. So regardless, my take home message from, from this is that the impact region or the footprint of this sooty mold is perhaps bigger than we may think. Um, and we know, of course, through Keller at Al's work in 2020, that the adults are readily using the upper portions of trees, um, as is evidenced by the egg masses being located above six meters. So to me, it follows that the deposition of honeydew capable of being colonized by sooty mold may cover a greater spatial extent in the understory as adults aren't relegated to primarily the lower portion of the tree's trunk, but they're able to eat and excrete in the mid and upper portions of the canopy. So one reason this type of work is really interesting to me is that when I walk through the woods, I'm often walking with my head pointed down. Um, I love the incredibly diverse herbaceous understory and I have a soft spot for these tiny regenerating tree seedlings that characterize the stratum. So as I said before, generally it's not believed that sooty mold can kill mature plants and even well-established uh, woody regeneration. However, it is likely that the shading effects of sooty mold may be more detrimental to the functioning and eventual survival of very early woody regeneration and of herbaceous plants that are not yet established and that don't yet have the resources needed to get through such an impact. Um, as such, it's likely that these sooty mold impacts 
will be highly dependent on what stage of regeneration is in the stand. Um, and the success of the stand regeneration over the long term might depend on whether the impacts of city mold persist across multiple growing seasons, as well as the longevity of the state of the seed banks. So these pictures show, for example, um, some sites I've revisited over a couple growing seasons. I've noticed that the herbaceous ground cover that's most heavily impacted by sooty mold accumulation in one year uh, tends to die back to some extent. Uh, and while completely observational and not directly quantified, uh, it seems that at least a portion of this herbaceous layer does not recover in subsequent years. And I imagine the story could be similar for these really small um, undeveloped woody germinants. So if sooty mold can negatively impact the growth and survival of immature woody germinants, uh, what could the theoretical impacts across spotted lanternflies range be? Well, this map shows the current range of spotted lanternfly outlined in pink. Uh, we took data points from FIA plots in every county shown in this map and we tallied the number of seedlings in all of the plots. We then tallied the number of seedlings found in FIA plots that also contain Tree of Heaven. So the different colors you see in any given county represent the percentage of the total seedlings in that county that exists in plots also containing Tree of Heaven. So as Merman et al. pointed out in 2020, adult spotted lanternfly detection is greatest on Tree of Heaven and more spotted lanternfly are trapped on Tree of Heaven than any other species. So if we assume that adult spotted lanternfly tend toward Tree of Heaven and that these adults are producing honey, uh, honeydew that supports sooty mold growth, then this map gives us a very rough and theoretical estimate of the percentage of seedlings that could be at risk based on their co-occurrence with Tree of Heaven. Uh, what if we zoomed out and took a larger view? Um, so these counties um, that are not outlined in pink do not currently have um, or support spotted lantern five populations. But this image does give you a visual of the percentage of seedlings per U.S. county that could be at risk if the tree of heaven in the associated plots became host to spotted lantern fly. And of course, thinking about these maps, there's no way of determining if these seedlings identified with the course FIA data uh, would be directly impacted by sooty mold. And so these maps are only meant to serve as a visualization of the possible risk to regeneration based on the distribution of tree of heaven um, as spotted lanternfly continues to spread. So this is work in progress. Um, there are some potential next steps that need to be addressed um, to determine the extent of damage that may be caused by sooty mold, uh, particularly with these woody germinants. Um, so next steps will be to experimentally assess the sooty mold impacts on woody germinant, uh, woody, woody germinant physiology, growth and survival, um, particularly of important forest trees in the east. Um, and we've collected some physiological data, but it's been on um, more mature individuals. So the next step will need to be focusing on these um, ill-equipped uh, seedlings that, that could be impacted. So of course, I wanna thank um, the support provided by USDA um, undergraduate students, Jessica Bickle, Matt Desco, Carolyn Scheibel, and uh, Sam Silverman, uh, folks at Ridley Creek State Park, and of course, all the landowners and managers that I've been able to work with. Okay, thanks, Jen. That was really great. Uh, there, there was one question in there. I don't know if you saw that. Um, it's asking, basically asking since Atlantis tends out, out or to, to compete out other trees, what seedlings are being represented on the percentage maps? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the seedlings represented on the percentage map, that's any seedling at all found in these FIA plots. So we didn't break it down into um, seedlings by species. Maybe it'd be nice if the city mold could negatively impact the Atlantis seedlings, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think there's, I don't see any other questions. Let me scroll down real quick. Just make sure. Oh, uh, the photograph with the ring of white fungal matter around the base of the trunk has been reported to be able to penetrate the bark and plug up vascular tissues. Have tree deaths been observed with these infections? You know, I'm not sure about that. Um, that'd be something I'd be really interested in hearing about if anyone else has the answer, uh, but I'm not sure. 
Okay. I know it, it's been seen in areas where there was a lot of, um, well, where yeah. there was really heavy feeding and the trap trees were established where the phytolanthal is pulled into the remaining tree of heaven. I know, but it wasn't re related to the white fungal mat. It was just related more to the, um, the feeding, the extensive feeding going on mm -hmm. on those remaining trees. Yeah, we see that white fungal mat on probably at least 50% of the trees we looked at. So it's really, it's really interesting. And you hadn't seen it on anything more than Tree of Heaven, though, is that correct? I mean, because that, that's what the reports I've heard is that's like, it's, pretty, it's so far, it seems like it's uh, pretty specific to Tree of Heaven. You know, I've not, um, and I've not made a note to actually look at the differences in the species, but just based on memory, I, I don't think I've seen it on anything but, but Tree of Heaven. Yeah, and it was something that uh, uh, Julie Urban had looked into also. Nice. Okay, uh, any other questions for Jen? All right, and uh, we just have a few minutes, so I was going to throw this out because I think this question might have been to Melody Kina, but um, there was a question before that came in late asking uh, if SLF will survive in the South. I know. People have different opinions on that, but I think that one was specific to you, Melody, if you're still on. Yeah, I see you're still there. That's gonna be uh, an interesting question to answer. We're hoping that the heat wave study that we're doing now will give us more insights into the effects of the short higher temperatures on the insect, because currently the 35 and 40 degree temperatures would suggest that it might have a limitation in really warm summer locations. All right, thanks Melody. Thanks Jen for the, your presentation, that was really good. Uh, so our last presenter before we go to the break is uh, Dr. Hoping Liu with uh, Pennsylvania Department of uh, Conservation and Natural Resources. Are you on Hoping? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Okay. So, do you see my uh, screen? All right. All right. Thanks, yeah. Greg. Yeah, I see. It. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Yeah. It's just not. It's just not. It's just not in presenter mode. That's all. I don't know if you wanted it. In the, yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to talk about the. Uh, AMS sampling based on fixed radius plot. And I, and I remember earlier, somebody asked about the uh, egg mass is somewhat covered by the, uh, by the wax, some are not. So I have two uh, pictures here. The, the left one is the newly laid egg mass. And the right one is the, I think is a three year old egg mass. So my, based on my understanding is that if the egg mass is exposed, they're going to be the wax will be washed off. So, I think the egg, all the egg masses will have will have the wax on it. Okay, actually, Joe did a good job uh, set the stage for my talk with, with the egg mass. So, why do we do egg mass survey? First, I think it's uh, it's an easy way to carry out with a little training. Everybody can do it because the egg masses are stationary on, on the substrate surfaces, they will remain detectable for a, a very long period of time. Even for this current generation, you can, you can expect like a six, seven, uh, six to eight months, you can see them. And the females of the linden fry tends to use the same substrate every, year after year. The second reason to do egg mass survey is Actually, this kind of survey will provide instant results. And that kind of results will be very useful to any uh, management program. And, and down the road in the future, if we ever need to establish the uh, treatment thresholds for different crops, I think the egg mass survey would be a good, good way to go. So there are two types of existing methods right now, as, as uh, Joe mentioned. Uh, and we did some as well. First is the tree removal. Basically, you cut down the tree, you inspect all the uh, egg masses found on the tree. Uh, it is very accurate because you can't, you basically look at every single inches or square inch of the, of the bark. 
but it's also very labor intensive. As you can see, all the trees has to be cut and has to be turned over to look for every possible locations for the egg masses. And another disadvantage is that it's, uh, it's not possible, it's very near to impossible to cut down somebody's maple tree just for cut, uh, to cut in the egg masses. Maybe the tree of power is okay, but uh, if you ask a homeowner to cut down their maple trees, maybe you will have a problem with that. The second method is to do a partial sampling. That means like only a, a section of the trunk, usually two to three meters of the trunk will be inspected from the ground. And we use the two meters. I think Joe, uh, they, they use three meters. And this is considered an easier way to do it. But since we don't know exactly how uh, the, the density of the egg mass is in the field, so this way of sampling, uh, the results may be underrepresented. So our objectives are uh, to develop a simple method to survey for uh, spot identified egg masses within the forest plot. So we did not do any urban, urban plot. And the second is to examine the directional and the positional effects on the egg mass distribution within the tree. So we have, uh, we selected seven study sites from mixed hardwood forest in southeast southeastern Pennsylvania. Each site is, is about uh, half to one hectare in size with a uh, spotted lantern fly detected in 2018. So this is the distribution map of, the, uh, of the, our study site. So for each, at each site, we established four 100 square meter circular plot. And each plot is, is centered around one tree species. So for this particular site and T10 site, we have one side circling around a tree of heaven, another side circling around the red maple, sweet cherry and black birch. Just keep in mind because of the stands, composition are different at each site. So the plus three tree species may be different, but we always have a tree of having, you know, to start with. To set up the plot, we use one of those four trees as a center tree, and then draw a circle around the center tree for, for the size of 100 square meters, which equals 5.65 me, uh, meters in radius. So all the trees, shrubs, Spines, stones inside this plot will be inspected for identified egg masses. A tree, shrub, or vine was considered in if its center fell within the plot uh, boundary. So by this standard, tree B over here is considered in, and tree A over here is considered out. So all the trees within the plot greater than one centimeter in DB in, uh, will be measured by DBH and to total height and the height of the base of the live crown. And the DBH will be used to calculate the basal area use this formula. So for each tree, uh, potential egg masses from the uh, lantern fry will be inspected from four different cardinal directions with a pair of uh, good quality binoculars. We use a Nikon Action EX, you know, from east and south, west and north. And uh, we, we used a four meter equal distance for the observation because this equal distance is, is crucial to protect the uh, same field of view from the binoculars. And we, also, we only count the complete egg masses in the field of view. So the tree was also uh, divided, divided into six within tree positions, the three on the trunk, three for the branches. The trunk is the lower trunk is below two meters and the middle is two meters to the first branch and upper is, is 
above the first branch. And the branches are separated into the first, the, for the first order branches, second for the second order branches. Above second is the third and above branches. For the uh, shrubs and vines, we only measure the diameter and old eggs are inspected without the separating uh, based on direction or position with, uh, within tree positions. Any stones uh, larger than 10 by 10 in two dimensions will be, was in, were inspected as well. So in total, we in inventoried 146 trees in 25 species across those 28 plots. In addition, we have recorded, we recorded 36 shrubs in uh, six different species, 41 summer graves, and 218 stone. So, it, Lanterfly egg masses was found on 19 of the 25 tree species uh, leading by the tree, uh, tree of heaven. For those tree of heaven trees, 73% of the trees were utilized by lanterfly egg, egg, uh, females to lay eggs, whereas 65% uh, of black birch, 79% of turnip tree, 56% of Norway maple, 71% of sweet cherry, 50% of American beech, Osage orange, black cherry, and 33% of red maple, and 29% of speckled arrow were used by lanternfly females to lay eggs. Only 4.9% of summer grapes was used, and 0.1% of stone was used. And no egg masses was, was found on the other six species of trees as well as those six species of shrubs. The total of 421 egg masses were recorded. The top five tree species include Lowey maple, tree of heaven, black birch, turnip tree, American beech. And the next nine species of trees from red maple to sassafras accounted for 16% of the egg masses recorded. So the density uh, per tree, egg mass density tree per tree ranged from one to 66 egg masses per tree. And it's uh, positively correlated with the tree diameter. And that, that's the same results if we exclude the outlier, the 66 eggs per tree. The egg mass, the egg, Egg, egg density was also calculated for the for the plot, and we found the uh, egg, ma egg density egg mass density per plot was also positively correlated with the basal area of the of the plot. However, if we exclude the outlier, the correlation was not significant anymore. Egg mass density from each plot was then converted to egg masses per hectare for the calculation of egg mass density per, uh, for the study site. And we found the uh, density for the study site ranged from 600 to 3,930 egg masses per hectare. However, there's no significant difference among those study sites. No cardinal direction, no direction effect was, was found for the, uh, for the egg mass distribution either, despite the more egg masses was, was found on the west side and north side compared to the east and south side. However, significantly more egg masses was found on the first branches and upper branches compared to other locations, other within tree uh, locations, uh, with the lowest number found on the second and third and above branches.
we did some regression models and we found over, overall only 80, 48% of the uh, total egg masses can be explained by the numbers we recorded on the trunks. Whereas 94% of the uh, egg masses can be explained by the record we had on the branches. So obviously we think the uh, branches are more important in terms of finding those egg masses. So in conclusion, egg masses could be observed from the ground with binoculars and we can easily separate the uh, old ones from the new ones. Egg mass sampling based on fixed radius plot was a simple and efficient alternative to existing methods. And the plot distance from initial infestation and next season adult aggregation pattern might affect survey results. The egg mass density by tree and plot was positively correlated with tree diameter and plot basal area. While there's no directional effect on egg mass distribution, more egg masses were found on the first branches and upper trunk. And if we have to use uh, different portions of the tree, branches were better than trunks in predicting egg mass numbers for the tree. So the future directions, we want to confirm the accuracy. Obviously, we only have one year data. So this, whether this kind of survey was accurate enough. So we need to do some more studies on to confirm the accuracy. And also, uh, we used you know, about one to two plot per uh, hectare, whether that's the proper sample size, you know, how many, how many plots we should we have in each site? And also where do you uh, place those plots in, within the site? And how to avoid potential double counting, that's a possibility. And also the potential impact from, bad, from weather, like uh, rain, normally we, we would avoid doing surveys in the, in the rain or high wind conditions, but what about the, uh, the uh, direct sunlight will affect the uh, observation. So for 2000, for this year, we are going to continue our egg mass survey, uh, try to estimate the population size and try to evaluate the dis dispersal ability of this pest based on egg mass distributions. So, so this paper is being accepted for publication and should, we should have it out very sick, uh, soon. So if you have any questions, please uh, email me, hliuapa.gov. And we are actually looking for cooperators. If anybody's interested in this kind of survey, uh, email me, we can, we can discuss it later. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ho-Ping. That was really good. Okay. Um, there was a, a question about, uh, you know, they use tree climbers survey for, um, Asian longhorn beetle in that program. So there was a question about, um, right, since it's not as easy to cut down trees to count egg masses, would the tree climbers be a viable alternative? I don't think so. I don't think so, but based on what we know right now, I think it may not be needed right now. If you have a very good, you know, like a good quality binoculars, you, you can basically see all the egg masses on even the, you know, three, a uh, third and above uh, older branches. There's no, no, we have no problem. The only problem we had uh, actually is because uh, due to the COVID, we have to delay our survey for two months. So there are some, some like interference from the forage. So if you do it in the winter, uh, in the off season, I think you will, you will not have that kind of problem. Okay. Thanks, Ho Ping. No problem. Yep. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? All right. Um, I'll check in with uh, Brian really quick <laughs> to see if we should just so go ahead and go to break and then still come back at the same time, or should we shorten the break? Uh, since uh, some folks may be coming in for an individual presentation. Yeah, that's uh, what I was wondering. I, we probably should just uh, extend our break time and come back at 2.50. Okay. I'm open to other suggestions, but uh, that's where I'm coming from right now. Yeah, that's what I was, I was wondering too, if people are going to be uh, coming in for very specific um, right, presentations. 
want to jump ahead. All right. Uh, does anybody have any other questions for any of the uh, any any of the other presenters uh, so far from this afternoon? Uh, this is Nancy. I just want to let the people yep. who asked uh, Tracy questions that I did email her uh, to see if she can either hop back on or I can email her the questions. I guess she had to run off, and uh, I'll get you those answers if I can. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. Any other questions from anybody? All right. I don't see any popping up in the in the question and answers either. So okay, we'll just stick. I'll go ahead and stick with the uh, agenda then, and uh, we'll just uh, we'll reconvene at um, two fifty. Sounds good. Hi. Okay, I have a uh, two fifty, uh, and so we're going to get started for the last section of the day. So we still have some really good presentations coming up for the rest of the afternoon. So everybody can uh, stay with us. So uh, first, we'll have um, Dr. Doug Pfeiffer from Virginia Tech talking about um, research they've been doing uh, related to spotted lanternfly. Okay, can you see my full screen? Yeah, yeah, it looks good. Thanks, Doug. Great. All right, I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, the, the work of two graduate students that have been on the program, as well as tracking the spread through the state. So I'll, I'll get right to it. Uh, Andy DeShane is a master's student in entomology. He just uh, finished up, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about his work on uh, phenology uh, here at first. The, he did his work in Winchester, in the original infestation area. This, this area is mostly light industry, uh, and uh, this is around the core of where, where it was first discovered. Uh, Andy uh, looked at um, plots around a known host of Tree of Heaven. The plots had to have known hosts uh, to, to be considered. I won't talk too much about that for, uh, for the interest of time. Uh, in his um, weekly counts, they did uh, five-minute uh, observational counts, looking at numbers of individuals, life stage, and the particular hosts that the lanternflies were found on. Here we see the two graphs from 2019 and 2020, looking at the uh, the time distribution and time of the life stages, there was a great a great amount of uh, agreement between the two. They're just um, a, a week or two off, uh, depending on when egg, eggs first showed up in the, in the spring. So there was uh, great uniformity in development uh, between the, the two years. Uh, he, he has some graphs show, showing the, the uh, life stages on different host plants. This is a list of the plants where there were 50 or more observations. And I just want to draw your attention to two colors here. Uh, one is uh, gray in the top left, that's tree of heaven. And then second from the bottom on the right is light pink, that's grape. So here we see the distribution on, on host plants of the, the life stages for the two years. And uh, I think you'll see that the light pink is, was a popular uh, host plant all along. Um, but uh, especially towards the, the fourth instars, there was a dramatic shift to Tree of Heaven with, with the gray. So we see a wide host range early on with a narrowing of host range as the lanternflies age. This is a, a well known phenomenon, it's been seen in, in many places. Let's see. Okay, so uh, he, he found the phenology was similar for both years with, with no variation as a results agreement with other places. And uh, his data helped uh, confirm some of the degree day work that's been uh, done at, um, uh, in, uh, up in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and again, the narrowing of the, the host range. All right. His uh, next uh, uh, topic was looking at uh, using dendrochronology to look at feeding impact on trees. You know, we see uh, you know shoot die back on Tree of Heaven, but uh, the the actual impact on tree growth isn't always clear. So he used this approach, uh, looking at the, um, the 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 thickness of annual tree rings uh, in in association with the number of years of presence of spotted lanternfly. There have been previous studies. Uh, that have have correlated tree ring growth with with uh, plant feeding insects, but uh, not much in the way uh, with uh, phloem feeding insects. Uh, he did this work 
in Pennsylvania in the known infestation zone at uh, Upper Hanover site with a, the red circle in Montgomery County and Blue Marsh, the blue spot in uh, Berks County. So he looked at uh, uh, Elanthus, black walnut and tulip poplar looking uh, and compared infested versus uninfested years, looking at the, the, the uh, time periods before the advent of lanternfly and, and after. He also looked at tree rings on Tree of Heaven uh, with and without insecticide treatment. So there's Andy on the left taking core samples. He took uh, 10 cores per species at each site and the trees had to be at least 25 centimeters DBH. So this is just a, a description of the processing of the samples to do the tree ring analysis with uh, mounting them, uh, uh, sanding. Uh, then there was some software that was used to um, standardize the, uh, the uh, growth of the tree rings and to take uh, account the fact that they normally uh, get narrower with age. So that variable was taken care of with the analysis. So he used a paired t-test to compare tree growth, uh, comparing uh, lanternfly, the, the, the years after lanternfly with two five-year intervals, pre-invasion one and pre-invasion two. These are uh, five-year increments before the introduction of uh, spotted lanternfly. And the, the results were that um, in uh, Atlantis, there was a significant effect that there was a narrowing of tree rings in the years after spotted wing drosophila compared to uh, the two different five-year increments before the introduction. And you see that here, both at Upper Hanover and a, a Blue Marsh. So the land of fly consistently led to a, a lessening of wood uh, growth in terms of a tree ring width. Black walnut, um, we didn't see that. You see that uh, there was no significant difference between spotted lanternfly uh, interval on the right with uh, the, um, the the middle period, 2010 to 2014. There was some uh, difference between uh, with uh, 2005 and, and 2009. With the tulip poplar, uh, not again, not not clear here. You know, the, there was um, certainly no reduction in tree ring growth from uh, spotted lanternfly. Uh, seen at all. Now, looking at the effect of insecticide, uh, the Donatefuran treatment on Tree of Heaven, uh, on the, in the left graph there, you see that in the in the absence of insecticide on trees that had no treatment, there was a um, a drop, uh, the same type of drop of a tree ring width that, that we saw before. You know, the uh, the the lanternfly had its effect unhindered. Uh, in the middle uh, graph, we see that uh, after one year, with one year of insecticide treatment, the trees were protected from spotted lanternfly uh, impact on, on tree growth. There was no difference with uh, the previous uh, time intervals. And certainly that was the case with after two years of insecticide as well. So the, the Donatefuran was certainly working in terms of keeping the spotted lanternfly from impacting the growth of Tree of Heaven. So this was a preliminary study. Uh, some work needs to be done on it still to uh, try and answer some of the uh, inconsistencies we saw on some of the tree species, but there was certainly evidence for reduced growth in Elanthus, uh, but not the other species. And what's probably happening is lanternflies are feeding more uh, and more vigorously on Tree of Heaven than these other species. And the, uh, the, 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 there was uh, protection provided by the, the uh, Donatefuran treatment, which isn't surprising. Now, I won't talk too much about objective three. Uh, it, it's already been touched on in other talks, testing the lanternfly rearing protocols in quarantine laboratory conditions. Uh, but, you know, he successfully, Andy successfully reared lanternfly on a uh, tree of heaven uh, cuttings but the, the yield of uh, immature or, or adults was uh, tiny. It, there was, it, it was not a very uh, efficient way of producing lanternfly adults. So uh, more work needs to be done on that to um, increase the efficiency of rearing. Uh, Brian Ruther is uh, a doctoral student working for Dartea Toll in the Department of Biological Sciences. He had a, a, a trial looking at lavender oil uh, with the specific component linalool 
on uh, repellency to uh, to lantern flies. And he looked at the, the, the treatment on tree of heaven and on grapes. On tree of heaven, uh, when the, the, there was a treatment with linalool, there was a significantly lower retention of spotted lanternfly adults. Uh, that effect was not seen on grapes. There was no significant difference when the linalool was applied uh, to, to grape. So that work will, con will continue as well. This was uh, earlier in uh, his, his uh, degree program. Now, where is it uh, in the state? Uh, at, as you can guess, spotted lanternfly has been increasing in Virginia. This is the, the distribution uh, I, uh, more than a year ago now, in fall of 2019. You can see that the heart is in Frederick County in Winchester. It had just barely crossed the county line into Clark County to the east, just over the uh, Opekin Creek in one or two places. In 2020, in the, in the fall, you can see that the, the, distrib the, um, the distribution has become much more intensive within Frederick County and has spread it in the west. It's uh, in western part of the county near Gore and it's farther into Clark County. You'll see the, the small town of Berryville marked there and I'll, I'll point out uh, some details of, of that finding. Uh, we do see locally heavy populations now. Uh, we, we have for, for several years now. Now, this is um, the, the graph that we, we just looked at with some vineyard sites that we've been following marked in the orange circles. Uh, with most of these, we did not find lanternflies at the site, at, uh, at, the, at the vineyard site. Uh, some of these also have tree fruits uh, in, involved as well. Let me get the cursor going here. You see some of these sites are surrounded by spotted lanternfly. So it was kind of surprising that we didn't find it, but I, I uh, am confident that we'll see more uh, presence at commercial vineyard sites in the coming year. We did find it for the first time in Northern Frederick County at, at, one, at one site. It was a single adult that was found on the edge of the, the property. Now, I mentioned Berryville, uh, this uh, small town here in, in Clark County. Uh, we, we see, uh, we found it uh, along railroad lines here. VDAX found it here as well. We looked at a, vine this is a mixed fruit planting vineyard as well as uh, orchard, orchard with several species, did not find it here. There's a commercial wine grape vineyard south of Berryville with no uh, finds of spotted lanternfly. Where we found it in Berryville was along the railroad lines. And this was, um, con confirms something that we had, had thought we would find that the railroad lines are a potential line of uh, dispersal and movement of spotted lanternfly. Uh, not only are they uh, avid hitchhikers, but the, these rail beds are good habitat for tree of heaven. It's common to find tree of heaven along the disturbed edges of the, the railroad lines. The person in this slide was back to the camera is Jason Bielski, uh, new, um, a new graduate student that will be working on spotted lanternfly. Uh, the pictures on the left are the some of the lender flies we were finding along the rail line there in Bell Berryville, and on the right is that the one individual that we found at the commercial vineyard site. Uh, this is the the, the increase in uh, acreage in our uh, infestation from uh, about 260 hectares in the beginning of the infestation to 36,000 plus hectares uh, this this winter. Now, this map shows the counties where we have spotted lanternfly. The, the most intensive is still Frederick County uh, that we see in the, the, northern, uh, the northern tip with uh, Clark and Warren counties in the, in the uh, medium uh, purple here. And then in the light purple, there are counties with single detections. Now, some of, some of these are a judgment call. Augusta County uh, did have egg masses present, but it was a very localized site at a rest stop along the interstate highway. So you can see that uh, we, we have additional counties involved now, and uh, we, we do have a, a quarantine that started in May 2019. I won't talk too much about that because it's not research. But this is the uh, expansion effective this month in March of the quarantine zone. It will now include uh, Clark and, and Warren counties. 
So uh, current, our uh, future plans, uh, we will be looking at uh, uh, different strains of Bovaria uh, uh, with uh, part of Jason's uh, work. So look, we'll be looking at some factors affecting the efficacy of ovicides. Uh, we'll be continuing to track the spread through our vineyard areas. Um, Brian will be looking at uh, continuing his work on um, lavender oil on Tree of Heaven and uh, looking at the differences between Tree of Heaven and, and grape. And also looking at uh, the possible effect of prior feeding by spotted lanterfly on the results. Uh, we would like to continue the dendrochronology work, looking at uh, trying to uh, clarify some of the, the questions that we raised in the process of the analysis. And this is the, the source of our support. So I went through that fast in the interest of time. Uh, I ho hope there's some time for some questions. Yeah, thanks, Doug. No, that, that's great. Yep. And uh, uh, there is just uh, one question here that I don't know if you'd have that or it would be something Andy would have it's about, uh, was there evidence of cavitation or embolism in xylem from tree cores taken from heavily fed upon plants? I don't know that Andy looked at that and uh, I haven't seen evidence of it. You know, it's mostly a, a, a flown feeder, but you know, a lot of uh, you know, sap feeders are feeding in multiple tissue types. So I, I don't know the answer to uh, if there is cavitation in xylem. Okay. Any other questions for Doug? All right. And anything uh, you wanted to add, Doug? Uh, uh, no, that's it, I think. Um, okay. Do you want me to stop sharing now? I know, that's fine. Yeah, you can stop. That's fine. Yep. Okay. All, All right. right. All right. Thank you, Doug. That was great. Yep. All right. Uh, so we can move on then to... Um, to Donnie Peterson with Rutgers University. If you're all set to go, Donnie. Yeah, let me just get my screen up. Okay, should you be able to see everything? Yeah, yep. Okay, thanks. Hi everyone. Um, so today I'm gonna be presenting some new information on our ways I was trying to uh, improve our tree rolling technique. Uh, Last year, I presented some data on vineyards and how uh, the, our spray irrigation method is uh, better detection over visual surveys. And so then this summer, I in the fall, I was working on some methods on how to improve um, DNA recovery and chances of detecting spotted lantern fly. There you go. Okay, so if you're not familiar with environmental DNA, it's DNA that you're collecting from the environment um, think of it kind of forensic science way of we're going out to the field and we're collecting um, uh, evidence to, to determine whether or not spotted lanternfly or your species of, of interest uh, is there or not. So this has been used in a number of systems. Um, so biosecurity, we could use this as a way to detect uh, any invasive species uh, or pathogens from entering the U.S. We could look at this as the satellite uh, populations. An example is, I think a couple years back, they, there was a suspected uh, uh, detection of spotted lanternfly in California, um, and they went back and checked and it wasn't found. But eDNA could be used to also come in and look for spotted lanternfly there too. Uh, we can also look at delimiting the current uh, range of spotted lanternfly, especially on the extreme edges where uh, visual surveys or traps may not be great at picking them up yet when only a little bit of DNA is needed to, to get a positive hit for the species. A visual way of approaching this or looking at this is we collect DNA in this um, environment, these green dots representing DNA, and we need to collect it some way. Um, typically, if you're familiar with the eDNA survey is in the Mississippi watershed with Asian carp. Uh, you can just take a bottle uh, and put it into the water and then you can filter that water um, and concentrate the DNA onto a filter and then bring that DNA, that um, filter back to the lab, extract the DNA and then run it through qPCR with uh, uh, targeted primers and probes that amplify the DNA to a detectable level to say yes the organism's there or no it's not if it doesn't amplify. The use of eDNA has been used a lot for vertebrates and such but for insects it's a little bit harder because they're small and they don't produce a lot of um, uh, 
DNA and deposit in the ecosystems. And especially with uh, a lot of the sampling in terrestrial systems has been in water systems, uh, using water bodies like a river or a stream, uh, or to look at the soil um, instead. But a lot of bugs, especially brown and red stink bug, where this was initially designed, the um, four or spotted lanternfly, um, they feed on plants for a majority of their life. And luckily for us, we chose these uh, partially because they're invasive, but also because they produce a lot of honeydew. And that's much easier to detect uh, in contrast to other invasives that are not on the landscape as long, like emerald ash borer, which is only out for about two months of the year. Uh, so we, there's two methods that were designed. There was spray aggregation, which is what I presented some information on last year, where you can go to vineyards or to um, understory shrubby plants or herbaceous plants and spray lots of water onto these plants and try to collect as much as possible into these buckets. And then you can then filter that water, the rinse water, um, and then go through the rest of the lab steps afterwards. The second method was tree rolling, which is you just taking a long pole uh, and a, putting a paint roller on the end and then you're essentially painting the trees. Uh, and so some of the work I wanted to do this last summer and some experiments I will, I'll be showing is how can we improve the recovery of DNA and then also making it easier in the field overall. So the current method was you add this, uh, the typical paint roller to the end of the pole and then you put the clean roller on after you flame sterilize the metal end and then you go and paint the trees which is usually on the trunk of the tree or the upper branches of the trees. And then you would uh, put the roller into one of these buckets spray, uh, bring a backpack sprayer and spray water to try to dislodge as much of the, um, any potential DNA on that roller off and then filter the water. The issue um, with this method is uh, in the field, there's a lot of equipment involved. You have to clean it all ahead of time and there's a chance of contamination if you didn't clean the buckets right. I'll, additionally, when you're spraying that water into the roller, there's a chance that some of the spray, it comes back onto you and you get you potentially are um, getting DNA on you from that role, and then you may accidentally introduce that to the next sample that you're doing, leading to false positives. So one thing I wanted to simply add into this method is these uh, clear plastic whirl of, leg, whirl of eggs. They come sterile, they come with a little perforated edge on the top, and instead of using the uh, plastic buckets, you can just uh, grab, grab the plastic bag, put it on the roller, and you can pull the roller off, and you don't, there's no um, direct uh, touching of the roller after this. Uh, whether you do this in the field or lab, you can then just add water to it and then you can shake the, the bag to get dislodged as much of the DNA as you can into the solution. And then pull a roll, um, uh, you can squeeze the roller out um, without having to touch it, uh, again, leading to less uh, potential contamination. Uh, then the final steps are using a portable uh, field pump, uh, which I won't get into uh, methods of that too much today, but the idea is using these assembly houses where the filter, you can see in the middle picture, uh, where it filters the water, you collect the DNA on there, and then the final picture is the filter, that's the clean one, but you would take that and put it into a little tube, and then that's where you'd go into the extraction step. So I wanted to improve the uh, to make it easier in the field, one I already did, I, I believe I've done it with the plastic bag, making things easier and less chance of contamination, but also look at increases, increase the chances of DNA recovery. So one of this would be is taking less equipment to the field um, and uh, just uh, rolling the tree and then bring the roller back and then uh, filtering there. But the issue with that is DNA degrades over time and we need to potentially preserve the DNA after bringing the roller back to the lab to do the filtration steps. So two easy methods of preserving DNA is to either put the roller into cold or to slow down the degradation of DNA or ethanol that essentially fixes the DNA um, and prevents and stops bio most biological activity from bacteria uh, degradation. So I did a laboratory experiment last fall um, where I would use honeydew that was previously collected from um, spotted lanternfly and we did a time series where I would add the DNA immediately, and then I would either let the roller sit out for zero, four hours, or 24 hours, with the time zero being filtering the field, time four being roughly amount of time if you could sample and bring it back to your lab, or 24 hours if you have a long field day, or if you want to ship those uh, rollers off to another lab that does this work for you. Overnight shipping. 
And I did four treatments where there's just DNA added, put in the plastic bag, and then stop there. Uh, we put the rollers in a dark place, um, but that's about it. Um, a second treatment was uh, putting the roller into the plastic bag and then putting a cooler with ice. A third was to spray ethanol onto the roller to um, potentially fix the DNA that's on there. And then the fourth was a combination of spraying ethanol on the roller and then putting that roller in the bag into a cold um, environment. So those results, um, it's on the x-axis we have time and on the y-axis we have a logarithmic scale of DNA quantity recovered. And we can see that uh, time was a significant impact with time zero recovering the most motor DNA with a uh, significant less uh, time four and a lower quantity of 24 hours. This isn't surprising, DNA degrades over time. But if we start teasing apart our treatments at time four and time 24, we can see that there's starting to be some differences with the green triangle and the square um, blue colors being ethanol treatments um, or ethanol with cold, um, preserving uh, more DNA or we recovered more DNA um, at time four with those treatments. At time 24, we found that DNA definitely uh, significantly decreased uh, with no treatment with the other preservation treatments of cold, ethanol cold, and ethanol all recovering higher amounts of DNA. Another aspect of uh, trying to improve recovering the field is to what extent or how much um, DNA do we need to recover from, or how many trees do we want to sample uh, before we start losing too much DNA if we picked it up on when the first initial tree sampled. So to do this, I went to Rutgers Fruit uh, Research Station uh, in Cream Ridge, uh, New Jersey. And I would spike the trees with DNA and roll them and sample so many trees. So for this first experiment, um, I wanted to determine, um, I did four groups of trees where I would sample one tree, three trees, five trees, or seven trees. And in each of those situations, the first tree was spiked with DNA. And then I would roll um, a certain amount of trees afterwards that had no DNA that were clear of uh, any spotted lanternfly at that location. So in this graph, we have, again, the same um, y-axis. But um, on the x-axis, we have the number of trees that were sampled. So we had uh, the first tree had recovered. If you only, re not surprisingly, if you sampled one tree, you recover the most amount of DNA with a significant decrease of DNA recovered when you sampled up to tr seven trees. This isn't too surprising. Um, it's likely that we're just moving that DNA around. Uh, but we weren't sure if this was convoluted with potentially picking up more inhibitors. The more trees you're sampling, the more uh, debris you're picking up. And there are chemicals out there that can inhibit or um, uh, make it more difficult for the qPCR to uh, amplify the DNA. So it's, we conducted a second experiment to determine whether or not uh, it was inhibitors or if we just spread the DNA. And so in this experiment, I spiked the last tree of each set rather than the first. So in this situation, we'd have two trees where I, roll, I rolled ahead of time with no DNA, and then I uh, spiked the third tree with DNA, or I rolled four trees, and then uh, the fifth tree was spiked with DNA, or I did seven trees uh, with uh, six trees being clean and the seventh being spiked with SLF DNA. And in this one, we recovered the same amount of DNA. Yes, seven did. Uh, the seven trees did sample for some reason, collected more, but overall there's no significant difference with the amount of DNA that are recovered, um, suggesting that there, we weren't actually picking up um, inhibitors uh, that at least for this tree species, it's important to note that I sampled peach trees, um, which is much different tree species than Elenianthus, which we typically uh, would be rolling, um, and it could be different for other species, so there could be differences among tree species also. So, just checking time. So um, overall, um, so kind of some best best practices. What we got from some of these data is that generally, if, if you sample fewer trees, is better. Um, one would be best, but that's fairly unrealistic for a lot of field scenarios. Like if you just sampled one tree, you'd have a lot of costs associated with that. Um, for each filter we go through and go through QPCR, it adds up money. So it may be worth to sample three trees or maybe up to five trees. Um, but once you're getting the, uh, to seven trees, you're getting to a significant loss of DNA. Uh, that's particularly uh, important because the, while the DNA quantities I recovered here were quite high, 
when you're sampling out in the field in, in really low populations, you might not be able to have that much DNA recovery. And if you're rolling or oversampling, you may lead to potential, the little amount of DNA that was left there isn't amplified enough to a detectable level for the qPCR. And it seems to be best to filter in the field if you can, um, but it's sometimes not practical, uh, especially um, it's a forest pest. And so you may have to hike a long ways to get there. The less equipment you have to take out there, maybe better, um, it, it's easier just to take less equipment. So it might be better to sample back at a starting station or back in the lab. And if that's the case, you may need to bring some ethanol to spray the roller with, or at least a cooler to um, slow down the degradation of the DNA until you get back to the lab. The cereal bags seem to be work pretty well, um, at least reducing the amount of times you need to handle everything. And I did have another experiment um, that essentially you can take, when you go to the field, you can bring out dry rollers and spray them with a little bit of water to pick up DNA, or you could take uh, uh, clean rolls that are already really wet and then just squeegee um, off the amount of water. And that study revealed that it doesn't matter which method you use, but for ease of use, it's easier just to clean the rollers ahead of time and take them directly to the field and then squeeze off the extra water. Um, because if you dry out the rollers, it can take days for the rollers to dry. So with that, if you have questions, um, just put my email up. Um, I also try to tweet every once in a while about my research activities and I'll leave you with a few photos of me collecting, killing hundreds of spotted lantern fly last fall um, so we can recover a bunch of honeydew for them so we can continue more experiments this coming summer. So there's questions. All right, thanks, Tony. Yeah, I did see one in the question box asked about uh, when you're sampling, how it just putting the rollers in water filled containers similar to nasal swabs. Uh, sorry, well, how did that? Oh, just in terms of the sampling, what about sampling by just putting the rollers in water filled containers similar to what's being done, you know, with the nasal swab? Mm, so just dunk the, the roller into the uh, bucket with water already in it is the idea. Or a container that you just transport it back in, I'm guessing, to keep it, yeah, everything okay or keep everything. Yeah, I mean, that'd be viable. I would assume you, that'd be reusable. One of the other advantages of it, the pro and con of this plastic bag that I've been using, um, it's disposable, like it's one time use. You don't have to worry about contamination. Um, with the buckets, you also have to go through and clean them. Um, and if you don't do a good enough job, or if you use a container like the nasal swabs and just dump them into that, you may have an issue with. Um, clean them uh, appropriately because otherwise um, you might have contamination when you're reusing the equipment. And that's an issue with um, eDNA techniques. Um, for the other question with foliage um, from Mary, uh, yeah, I was specifically presenting um, bark methods. Uh, the spray irrigation method does work. Um, the roller technique doesn't work well um, for leaves because they, there's just not enough pressure. But our spray irrigation um, is pretty, it works really well. Um, it's meant to dislodge the DNA from the actual foliage. It's used a lot for the vineyard studies that we have. Um, and then for Josh, we collect them. We, as you can kind of see in this picture, is that I, I just go up to a tree, I grab them, cooler days are better or in the morning. And I usually take a 1.5 mil tubes and I just uh, squeeze a little bit in there with trying not to get their butt touched in there. Because one issue we've had, especially with black studi mold, is um, trying to re uh, accidentally get that introduced into that container because once some black studi mold gets into there, it quickly takes over and turns our samples black. Um, but you just squeeze the butt of the, the abdomen slowly down and you can collect them in tubes. Um, for leaf clippings, that's currently being explored with um, another project with a PhD student of our, uh, of Dr. Julie Lockwoods, where they are trying to, um, sorry, I skipped around a little bit, uh, where they are looking at leaf clippings. We've been able to get some of that before, but um, it's still being worked out currently for leaf clippings. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Thanks, Donnie. I think you got to all the questions. I don't know if there's any more coming in. But if not, then uh, thanks, Donnie. Yeah, we can uh, move on to um, 
to Anne Hayek and Eric Clifton from Cornell. I think I had on the uh, agenda, I think I just put Eric on there and I didn't include Anne, sorry Anne. <laughs> but uh, Anne will go first and then uh, and then Eric will uh, will take over. If you click on the presentation and then use your arrow pad or however you advance. Okay, that's it. I hadn't clicked on the presentation. Okay, good. Okay, now I'm starting. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about insect pathogenic fungi infecting spotted lanternflies. And um, I'm starting out because I've been doing a lot of the work with the Batcoa major. And Eric's been working on the Bovaria bassiana um, part of this. And so there are these two native insect pathogenic fungi that uh, um, we find frequently in spotted lanternfly populations. And in 2018, we found them causing an epizootic together with a lot of, um, causing a lot of um, infection and causing a population to crash. And so this, that's what kind of started our work on this. And um, so these are really different fungi. They're not at, at all related. Uh, Bacoa major is, is in the Entomophthora mycota, and it has infective spores that um, are produced on the outside of the dead insect and are shot off. So you can see in this first picture here, um, the, this white halo around the cadaver is from spores that have been shot off. And, if that insect is higher up in the tree canopy, those are shot off and then they wind up being airborne. This fungus also is unusual because it grows out of the insect and attaches it to the substrate um, where it's where the dead insect is standing. So, so those are kind of different, really different um, attributes of insect pathogenic fungi. This one though is more difficult to culture and, um, and harder to work with. Bovaria bassiana is the other fungus, and it's in the hypocreales. It has infective spores on the outside of dead spotted lanternflies, and uh, but it's used in a lot of, uh, of biopesticides that are sold in the U.S. and um, and around the world. And so they're very different organisms to be working with. So first, I'm going to talk about um, Bacoa major and. The last time that anything about this, the first and last time anything was published about this in the US was 1888. So really it's very, very poorly known. And at that time it was um, reported being from one tylodactyla, that's a little beetle, little native beetle in North Carolina. And so um, we asked what are the native insects that are infected with Batcoa major that it would be present in the environment and could, you know, blow up into causing the big epizootic that we, the epizootics we've been seeing. So we're, we asked, what's the source of the back, backhoa major that switched over to spotted lanternfly? You can think of that as kind of like this question with COVID-19 and where did it come from? Oh, it came from bats. We're asking a question very similar to that, but with backhoa major. And so we sampled through the season during 2019. We got some really surprising results. Um, uh, you can see here a, a soldier beetle and a leaf hopper and a snout moth, that's a pyralid. And uh, you can see the, the fungus is growing um, uh, where there's the red circles from between the segments of the abdomen or between any, it's coming out through any intersegmental membranes. And um, this was all Batcoa major. We sequenced um, a lot of samples in order to know that they were the same. And we sampled through the season uh, in 2019. And these pie charts just show through the season um, that uh, the, the light green color is diptera, that's flies. And the number of specimens that we collected that were infected with flies versus coleoptera, that's beetles, versus lepidoptera, that's moths, hemiptera, that's bugs, and um, socoptera, bark, bark lice. And so you can see that that really changed over the season, but there were always flies 
that were infected. But down here in August, we actually found a lot of different insects that were infected. And so this is a summary of um, throughout that season. And you can see that, that flies were the most common um, order, insect order that was infected, but it's only a little more than 50%. So this is actually pretty generalist of a pathogen. Now, this is from the group Entomopthorales. They're really well known as being quite specific, very host specific. And so this was really a surprise. Um, especially from a pathogen that's so poorly known, and then to come up with this, this um, uh, result that kind of uh, doesn't agree with the dogma. Uh, and so you can see on this, on this pie chart, though, there are the orange plant hoppers and leaf hoppers, that uh, here was this pathogen I was already infecting plant hoppers and leaf hoppers. Over here in the box on the right, you can see that we, um, we got it out of uh, native uh, succeeds and achillids and derbids that are all kinds of um, native plant hoppers. And so it was in place and, um, and then it just switched over to spotted lanternflies. So we've been spending a lot of time with the, um, all of these sequences from all of these different insects and looking at population structure. But last summer, we spent a lot of the summer um, doing um, bioassays. We just haven't analyzed all the data yet. Um, and we, it took us a long time to develop a way to, um, to do these bioassays. And uh, you can see our bioassay container down on the lower left here, uh, where we put a sporulating culture up above, and then it's, it shoots spores down onto insects that are standing on, um, on stems of, um, of Tree of Heaven. This works well, but why did it take, it, so, us, it take, why did it take us so long to come up with this? It's because the fungus um, uh, decides to shoot off spores when it wants. And working with this group of fungi, it's always a bit tricky to um, figure out how to manipulate it so that it shoots off, it's ready to shoot off spores when you're ready to use it. So we got real good at it, but we got good at it by the time it was adults. So, so we don't have any nymphal data, but here's some of our adult bioassay data just to start on it. These are all infected um, adults. And just to show how long it took for them to die, it took like six to seven days for infected adults and they became more susceptible as they were older. So um, now we're gonna switch over and um, Eric is going to talk about Boveri bassiana. Okay, I think I can just take over here. It's like you can see my screen, right? Yep. All right, great. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, picking up now with the Bavaria studies. So starting back in 2018, we've been collecting these lantern flies killed by uh, the Bavaria fungus and with the goals of identifying any different species and which strains might be more common than others in the landscape. Um, so in 2018 there, those orange dots, we first started out sampling around Berks County. Um, but in 2019 and 2020, we've sort of expanded to more sampling sites. Um, including some locations near Lancaster um, and Philadelphia, thanks to some help from people in USDA and PDA. Um, and we have to use DNA sequencing to identify these Bavaria fungi because even though there's different species in North America, they all kind of have this white powdery spores. And so you need molecular data to identify them. So here are the results of our uh, Bavaria diversity over the last couple of years. Um, and the main result so far is that we've only found one species infecting spider lanternfly, and that is Bavaria bassiana. Um, but within that species, we are seeing some genetic diversity, and there's at least 25 different genotypes that have been identified. And you can see there I have uh, a pie chart for each year and the sample size next to it. And at the moment, we don't have any cool nicknames or codes for these different genotypes, so I'm just denoting those with these different letters. Uh, you can see in 2018, that was a great year for these fungal pathogens in Pennsylvania. And we had 23 different genotypes in 2018. In 2019 and 2020, we only had about a dozen or less of these different genotypes, but kind of saw the same pattern where genotypes A and L in those 
sort of blue and green slices. Those are the most dominant and they are found in a lot of different field sites. Um, also to note that the um, most of these isolates we recovered are from the adult stage, but we have found some Bavaria infecting first instars and some fourth instar nymphs. And in the process of collecting these dead lanternflies, we are also collecting any dead non-target insects that we find in the same areas. And over the last three years, we've only found seven of these non-targets that were killed by Bavaria. And if you look over on the far right column of those genotypes, you can see um, some like A, B, and V. Those are some of the same genotypes that kill lanternflies. So like Anne was talking about with Batco and spillover, these might just be native isolates. Um, this is naturally occurring mortality in the field, but they seem to be pretty good at killing lanternflies too. Um, and one fun recent result is that we did find a different species of Bavaria, but it was infecting a yellow jacket wasp, and that species was identified as Bavaria brongniardii. So we at least know that there are different species of Bavaria out there in the field, but we just haven't found them yet uh, infecting spotted lanternflies. Uh, this particular slide I'm excited to share today, but uh, Bavaria and Batco are not the only two fungi that are killing lanternflies. Um, so we have some of these new results here. You can see on the left, uh, that strange looking fungus. That has been ID'd as Hercetella citriformis with DNA sequencing. And so those purple sort of tendril-like structures, those are called cinemata, and those have the spores on those structures there. You can see in the bottom left images. Um, the other fungus we've identified there on the right, that is Metarhizium pemphigi. And Metarhizium is actually a pretty well-studied uh, group of insect pathogens. Um, and this particular adult was found um, near Reading, Pennsylvania. If I didn't say it, that Hercetella sample came from uh, Lancaster in 2020. So excited to find these different pathogens infecting this pest. Um, and now I'm going to sort of switch gears now. This is um, a slide showing some data from bioassays we did in the quarantine lab. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to be showing this one graph. Um, but we directly sprayed these lanternflies with some commercialized biopesticides. Uh, four of these are different strains of Bavaria bassiana. So those include Bioceres, Bottega, uh, Naturalis, and Bellifer. And then the purple dashed line there, that is a product called PFR97. And that's actually a whole different fungus called Cordyceps famosa rosea. Um, and it was actually just recently renamed. It used to be in the genus Isaria. But anyways, all of these bioassays, we did them on all the um, different nymphalin stars, and we repeated the experiments on adults. So we directly sprayed them with these biopesticides, and then we reared them on potted tree of heaven plants in the quarantine lab. Uh, and what we saw was that the Bavaria treatments, they worked really well. Um, we got about 50% mortality about five to seven days with most of these treatments. Uh, but you can see that PFR97 product just wasn't nearly as good as Bavaria, but it can kill them. Um, and in this particular graph, you can see that Velifer and that green line, it did the best against the first instars. Um, but this result kind of varied by the different life stages. But I just want to say in general, all of the Bavaria treatments worked pretty well. Um, and all of the cadavers killed in this process did have fungal outgrowth to verify that the mortality was caused by infections and not just from stress or something in the, uh, the oils or the, the products themselves. Okay, so now I'm gonna jump back to some of our field work, sort of episodiology, understanding uh, these pathogens in the field some better. Um, in 2018, we, as Ann mentioned, we saw this epizootic at a site called Angora Fruit Farm. And so 2019 was kind of a dry year. We didn't really see a lot of infections at this site, but we started to see these fungi again pop up in 2020. Um, you can see in the top left image, that is the first time we observed bat coa infections or the earliest we saw them uh, in 2020. We found this one adult um, at the end of August. And so that was sort of our cue that we need to go back there and start collecting more data and to see what happens to these populations as the infection spread. Um, to do this, we used a software that's called dot, dot .goose. We got some pictures there on the bottom left. Um, to do this, we take pictures of the tree trunks with lanternflies um, at multiple angles, and then we put that in the software and we can quantify pretty accurately how many living adults are on the trees. And so 
those little yellow dots, each one of those marked uh, an individual lanternfly adult. And I want to say at the same time that we take these photos, we are also counting the dead adults that are stuck to the trees with those rhizoids you saw earlier. We're also counting the numbers of dead adults around the ground um, at the bases of these trees. So this graph on the right there, the pink shading, um, that represents the average number of living lanternflies uh, per tree. And this has been adjusted by tree diameter, DBH. And the gray area on this graph, that represents the cumulative numbers of dead lanternflies or mortality at these trees. So we sort of use this to get a better estimate of populations in the area. And you can see that the populations really start to decline throughout early October. Um, there was a pretty heavy rainstorm, something like two and a half inches on October 1st. And I remember going there in early October and just seeing tons and tons of these dead lanternflies with bat spores on their bodies. And it was pretty much the dominant force of mortality uh, in this field site, but there still was some Bavaria there at the same time. So we don't really now have, we don't have yet at least a good method or uh, to measure bat spores or concentration in the environment, but there is an established method to count Bavaria and that's using serial dilutions with soil samples and then plating them on these selective media plates. So you can see a picture on the right, that sort of purple plate and those white colonies of Bavaria. And so those little colony uh, forming units or CFUs, that's graphed on the y-axis there. Um, and then you got the date on the x-axis and we've been collecting soil samples and counting Bavaria um, since early 2019. Um, we saw again in 2019 that it was a pretty hot, dry summer. So the numbers of Bavaria dipped down throughout that season. But if you look to the right in that sort of green shading area, we saw that the uh, concentration of Bavaria almost doubled between September and November. And that kind of lines up with what we saw in the field where we saw infections, we saw these lanternflies dying. And so you can imagine the spores that are covering those bodies will fall off and get distributed into the soil and thereby increasing the inoculum. So at least now we have sort of a better picture of how much of the fungus is in the environment and how it responds to um, these epizootics in the field. So to summarize both um, Anne's portion and my portion, we found that that coa major is infecting these different uh, orders of native insects there. And we sort of have been developing these bat coa shower methods or bioassays in the lab um, and sort of mentioned how we infected fourth instar nymphs. There's a picture there on the top right. Um, you can sort of see these little bundles or these um, spores sort of growing out of the abdomen on that fourth instar nymph. So that was exciting because before this year, we didn't really know if this fungus could even infect nymphs, but now we know that. Um, of course, besides Bavaria bassiana, we now know that there's these other fungi out there infecting them, including Hirsutella citriformis and Metarizium pemphigii. Um, from the Bavaria diversity study, we know now that there's at least 25 genotypes of Bavaria bassiana, uh, but we just haven't found other species yet infecting lantern flies. And these two genotypes for now I've called A and L, they seem to be dominant and we find them in many different locations where we sample. Um, from the bioassays, we found that these Bavaria-based biopesticides are pretty good and they can kill about 50% of the lantern flies in five to seven days uh, for the nymphs. We did do these experiments on the adults um, it takes a little more time, something like eight to 10 days to kill half the adults. Um, and you, you saw that that PFR 97 product, Cordyceps, uh, was just less effective. And um, yeah, it seems very clear that Bavaria and bat co-infections can significantly impact their populations, but further studies are needed uh, at this point going forward. But that's our talk. Uh, there's a ton of people to thank who've helped in some form or another. Um, there's our funding sources on the bottom. and uh, we have time for questions, I guess. And you should unmute yourself too, and we can we can field those yeah. questions. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. There's there's actually quite a few over in the question section. So I don't know if you can see them or if you want me to go through them. I guess you should pick the order first. Yeah. Why don't yeah, you pick them? Okay. So, uh, what variables promoted sporulation of bat coa within the assays? With within the where? Within the within assays. the assays. Yeah. Ah. Um, uh, so our problem with the assays was, um, was getting the timing right so that we um, had the, uh, first of all, what did we 
produce spores from, sometimes from media, and then we found that it was better to inject galeria and have galeria cadavers be producing the spores. So um, we just needed to wait for the right amount of time after that the um, either the media, um, we harvested it or the galeria had died before they would be producing spores. But you have to have a higher humidity. So but, um, we, we definitely knew that. So it has to be humid. Okay. And that probably goes to this second question asking if rainfall helps with the distribution of the fungi. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah very much so. Yeah, it, it, it does much better. And in fact, in the 2019 season, in um, in Berks County, in our sites in Berks County, we really didn't see a lot of fungal infection. Nothing like we saw in 2018 or 2020, and there was there was very little rainfall, so it was really dry. Yeah, and I just to follow up with that, I didn't really know if we had time for this, but um, we had this one slide we didn't include, but we did graph the amount of daily rainfall at this, this fruit farm site. Um, versus the sort of prevalence of these fungal pathogens. So we definitely saw a pattern where as soon as you had heavy rainfall, you saw a spike in bat co-infections. Um, we're still kind of analyzing this data, but I just put this together to kind of show that these infections do follow after these rainstorms. But yeah, we need to do like more analysis in different sites and so forth to know that picture. Yeah. Yeah. And did you find any of the commercial Bovaria genotypes in your field collections? Ah, good question. Um, so it's it was designated as um, genotype I, as in indigo right here, this gray bar. Letter I actually is the same strain of Bavaria bassiana that's in naturalis, which is this yellow dotted line in the bioassay. So it is a pretty, it's a normal naturally occurring fungus. I mean, it was originally obtained from the field and then turned turned into a product. Um, I have not found the GHA strain or any of the other strains I've seen in the products in the field. So naturalis, funny name, natural, is the only one I have found uh, that seems to be naturally occurring in the field, though. And uh, there was one comment. It would be interesting to see if the entomal pathogens uh, grow endophytically inside Tree of Heaven and other plants by land flyer feeding on. So do you have any plans to look into this at all? So I, I want to say something first that um, Bacoa, any of the Entomopthorales are really obligate pathogens of insects. It's really hard to grow them in culture even. Um, we One of the best ways to grow them is in uh, culture media that they use for like stem cells. I mean, it's like fake insect blood. So they don't, they don't switch over and grow inside of plants. So now, Eric, you probably want to talk about Bovaria because- Yeah, I, I mean, I know Bovaria can be an endophyte in a lot of different plants, same for uh, Metarizium. I mean, we don't have plans to like inoculate Ilanthus plants or anything. Um, I don't even know if people have studied whether these fungi can be endophytic in Tree of Heaven, but I mean, it certainly seems possible, even though the soil is the main reservoir for Bavaria, it can live um, inside of plant tissue. So that could be done. And uh, there was a question to you about the, uh, given the uptick in wild activity following uh, egg laying uh, timing, for the next generation laid, do you think the control timing can be made to work sooner? Yeah, well, we, we definitely want to um, play around with this. I mean, as we as we're learning more about it, uh, I mean, this is kind of the first that we've kind of understood the timing like that. But I mean, if, if we do actually see a lot of mortality right at in the beginning of October, and yeah. according to Miriam's talk, that's about when oviposition starts. So you're right. I mean, it would be better if things this would start earlier. I don't know. Yeah, we don't. We're definitely interested in the susceptibility of the different stages of adults. Yeah, and we don't have data on egg mass counts like an Angora fruit farm for this year, but we did not see a lot of egg masses in 2018. And just ad hoc observation, I didn't see a lot of egg laying um, after we saw fungal infections in 2020. 
So it seemed like it really impacted the population before peak egg laying occurred. But you know, other places I go without these infections, you see eggs everywhere. So uh, these fungi can definitely impact the populations going into the next year, it seems. Okay. And are you planning to track resistance to fungal infection in exposed populations of spotted lanternfly? Oh, I don't know. That's, that's <laughs> Maybe. Cool. That's a cool idea. We, we kind of are still at the discovery stage, so we um, we're we're not there yet. Okay. And then just one last one before we move on: uh, Is deformed wing virus for lanternfly occurring? Has one slide displayed lanternfly adults with deformities? Which was the one with deformities? Some so, some of the um, uh, the insects once the fungus is growing out of them. They use the entire inside of the insect body um, to produce fung fungal spores, fungal growth and fungal spores. And so a, an insect will look strange because all of the insect has been used for food by the fungus. Um, so I, I don't think they weren't deformed while they were a living. They just changed shape after um, they died. Okay. Does that answer your question? I, I'm not sure. I think so. Hopefully it does. I don't know. <laughs> but um, okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Eric and uh, Anne. That was really great. Thanks. But I'll, I'll move on to the next presenter then. I'll go on to uh, Matt Helmuth from Temple. And I know you have uh, several people presenting with you also, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Greg. And thank you, everyone, for, for having us. Um, so I'm going to give a quick introduction of what we've been doing at Temple University. And really what we've been focusing on is this idea that understanding the spotted lanternfly invasion requires interdisciplinary synthesis. And so Jocelyn Bem, Benjamin Seibold, and myself, we work between field biology, data science, and computational mathematics. And we really think that you know, at the intersection of these three fields is where you can do really good predictive modeling. And so I'm gonna pass on um, uh, the, the slideshow here to, to my postdocs um, and the postdocs that are working at Temple University who work in these three different fields. And, and you'll see how these, different three, these three different fields intersect in terms of forecasting spread, forecasting phenology, contemporary evolution, and also long distance dispersal. But really everything that we do um, is with a lot of different collaborators. And so all the work that they're gonna be showing you here in a second really builds on a lot of the work that you've seen today. Um, so we're able to use what other people are doing and able to contribute to what other people are doing. And so on that note, what we've also just done is we've built um, a dashboard, a spy line to fly dashboard, which has a lot of the apps that we're constructing and also all the apps that all of our collaborators are constructing is sort of a place to go to, um, to take a look at all the different research and tools that we have uh, for different um, groups and stakeholders. And we're always looking for new collaborations, so please reach out to us if anything that um, uh, the postdocs are going to talk about here in a second. If anything is of interest to you, please reach out to us, send us an email, um, and uh, we'd, we'd love to, to work with you. So on that note, Seba, if you want to go ahead and take it away, I'll stop sharing. Yes, thank you, Matt. I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. Can you see my presenter mode? And now my face. Yeah, you're on. Yep. Thank you very much. OK. Um, so hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be part of this summit. So thank you so much for, for having us. Uh, my name is Seba Debona. I'm a postdoc, as Matt mentioned, uh, at the IECO lab at Temple. Um, and today I wanted to address uh, whether we can use naive uh, or general models to forecast the spread of um, spotted lanternfly. So whenever we are forecasting the spread of an invasive uh, population, it's, this is crucial because it allows us to predict um, the future impact and also respond with adequate management actions. But when building a forecasting model, um, we need to keep in mind that models sort of sit on a continuum uh, between general models that are um, applied to many different species, but might perform poorly in any one particular species. Um, and on the other hand, we have models that have a high degree of specificity that are really fine tuned to um, a single species, but won't actually work very well if applied to some other species. And we can um, identify two big classes of models that sit along this axis. Um, we have on the one hand, top-down statistical models, which try to capture big patterns from, from uh, mostly a data science approach. Um, and these are on the general side. And then on the other hand, we have bottom-up uh, mechanistical models that rely 
uh, heavily on a detailed understanding of the behavior of an individual uh, species uh, to then build up from there uh, the emergent properties, both at the landscape uh, and population level. And the other thing to keep in mind, of course, as I just mentioned, uh, different models will rely on different degrees of knowledge of the species. And so uh, if we want to parameterize a bottom-up mechanistic model, uh, we really need to uh, study several aspects of uh, a species life history, uh, dispersal and behavior and so on. Um, we're starting now to um, accumulate an incredible amount of knowledge on spotted lanternfly. And this is thanks to the many researchers that do fantastic research and we've seen some great examples of it today. Uh, Stephanie later will tell you more about how we can build upon that to, to build a bottom up um, a mechanistic model. Uh, but often when a new invasive population is discovered, we actually don't really have this knowledge to build bottom up approach uh, models. And so the question that I wanted to try and address today was, um, can we forecast the spread of spotted lanternfly using a general model that uh, has actually very little uh, species specific uh, knowledge um, embed into it. Uh, we hear a lot about spotted lanternfly being very particular and different from other bugs, but can we find generalities that would actually uh, help us predict how it would spread? Um, and this question is tied together with a paper published in 2017 by Hema Hudgens. Uh, she's one of the co-authors in the work that I'm presenting today. Um, and in this study, uh, she and her co-authors attempted to predict the spread of 75 different invasive forest pest species uh, throughout the US using a single general dispersal kernel model. And I'll talk in a second about what that mouthful actually means. Um, but this 75 species they have uh, accounted for have in common the fact that they are invasive in the US uh, and they are associated with forest habitats, but that's all they really share. Uh, and other than that, they are pretty uh, diverse from a taxonomic point of view. Um, so how does a uh, generalized dispersal kernel model even, even work? So here I am oversimplifying, of course, but uh, there's two aspects that we need to, um, to really understand and keep in mind. Uh, the first is that space in these models is uh, abstracted as a grid of um, equally, equally sized um, cells, in this case, 50 uh, kilometers square. And then the second aspect is that dispersal between any two cells um, is proportional to two factors. One is the distance between uh, the two cells, and this is um, intuitive. And the other one is some additional predictors that we can uh, include in the model. Uh, and in Emma's um, GDK model, these predictors fall under two uh, broad categories. Uh, one type um, is predictors that are related to a cell itself. So they are environmental predictors, such as um, the forested area, uh, the human population density, uh, or the total road length in a given cell. And some others are species specific or species related, although they are very general, like body size or average body size um, of a given species or continent of origin. Um, the effect size of this predictor, meaning how strongly they actually affect dispersal and in which direction uh, are among the fitted parameters of the model. So we make no a priori or we need to make no a priori assumptions on their effect uh, on the model. We just let the model do the, the picking. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that another fitted parameter of this model um, is pest population growth rate, uh, which is constant and does not depend on any of these predictors that we just have listed. Um, and finally, as the general attribute of the model uh, suggests, uh, the kernel applies to all species considered, uh, regardless of their uh, idiosyncrasies. Um, and so through an iterative modeling, uh, model fitting approach, uh, the authors of the Hudgens uh, at all 2017 paper um, found that the best fit model would actually include only two very general uh, predictors, the forested area in a given cell and then the human population density. Uh, and including only these two relatively general um, uh, predictors would actually provide uh, an average 75% 75, 75 locational accuracy, meaning that the model will actually get right a cell, whether it has presence or absence of data when compared to the observed data, 75 out of 100 times. So. Uh, pretty decent um, fit. If we take a look at some um, real examples of this uh, presented in the, in the paper, um, we have three species here. And on the left column, we have the observed spread, so the real data. In the central column, we have a um, predicted uh, dispersal or predicted spread, sorry, excuse me, um, when dispersal is modeled as a constant. So uh, it actually only depends on distance between two cells. And then on the right um, column, uh, we have dispersal that not only 
depends on distance, but also on the two uh, predictors that were found to be relevant. So uh, forested area and human population density. Um, and you can see here, if you compare the, the far left to the far right um, model, they are pretty similar. There are some discrepancies, but um, considering that this model is applied to such a uh, broad array of species, um, it's actually remarkable how, how well it um, seems to be working. And so the question then becomes uh, very um, trivial. How does this model perform on spotted lanternfly? And in order to tackle this question, um, we we decided to assume that spotted lanternfly would just be another forest pest species that could be lumped uh, together with the 75 species um, studied in the Hudgens paper. Um, and this allows us to make some, um, some assumption. It allows us to take the same uh, generalized dispersal kernel model uh, as they used. It allows us to, to use the same two predictors, so forested area and human population density. And also it allows us to borrow the same parameters that they used. Uh, so the same uh, effect sizes that uh, they found to be uh, to be important. Um, and if we do so, then we can use the present substance data of spotted lanternfly uh, from 2014 to 2019 at the 50 kilometer square scale uh, to simulate spread. And then we can use the 2020 data to calibrate the model uh, deriving uh, model parameters. Um, and here's a comparison between the uh, observed distribution in 2020, uh, which is in uh, the red squares, and then the predicted distribution by the GDK model uh, in the dark dots. Uh, and we, the locational accuracy is around 86%, so it's a pretty good fit, um, but there are some notable um, discrepancies. One is that uh, the model predicts a further spread um, north. Uh, it also uh, misses out on some of the satellite populations uh, in Western Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia, and, and West Virginia. Uh, and the model also predicts a satellite population emerging around the Chicago area, which is actually not something we observe in 2020. If we then take the model forward in time and look at forecast 5, 10, and 20 years into the future, uh, the model predicts a significant spread uh, north that we can see between 2030 and 2040. Um, and also a few satellite populations that seem to be popping up uh, around the Detroit area, the Chicago area I've mentioned before, and then uh, Seattle. Um, keep in mind that this model makes no assumptions on uh, the factors that control population growth rate. So uh, the spread node is actually not, the spread northward is not impeded by um, cold temperatures. So this is how far a very general model uh, gets us. Um, but can we increase the model specificity moving along that axis a little bit uh, to the right? Uh, and we're proposing two consecutive steps that actually are still relatively general, but uh, make some improvements on the model. One is to use the same predictors. So again, uh, forested area and human population density. But this time, instead of borrowing the same parameters from the Hudgens paper, we can uh, custom fit uh, the effects of this uh, predictors to spotted lanternfly. And then the second step is to, uh, in addition to those um, cost and fit parameters, introduce a, a third parameter, in this case, uh, the presence of a tree of heaven uh, as, as, as an SLF uh, specific parameter that we can uh, fit into the model. Uh, in order to do so, um, we rely on a Maxent model for a tree of heaven uh, developed by one of the brilliant grad students uh, of the IE Collab, Nick Huron. Um, and this will give us an idea of um, tree of heaven suitability uh, across the different cells. Right, so here we're looking side by side to uh, the three different uh, models that we can fit. Uh, we have on the left, the unmodified GDK model uh, in the center, uh, the custom fit model, uh, and then on the right, the same custom fit model, but then with the addition of tree of heaven as one of the predictors. Uh, you can sort of notice at a glance that um, both the custom fit model and the tree uh, uh, of heaven model uh, do a better job at not overestimating the spread northward, despite still getting the satellite populations uh, wrong. Uh, given that the two new models, the GDK, uh, the custom GDK and the uh, tree of heaven model are very similar, I'm going to uh, be ignoring the tree of heaven model from now on, on just for the sake of brevity. So once again, we can push the model forward in time and look at forecast five, 10 and 20 years into the future. Um, and we can notice, uh, keeping in mind the unmodified GDK is at the top and uh, the custom fit model is at the bottom. Uh, we can see that um, the custom fit model predicts actually a further spread uh, westward uh, and a, a less severe spread northward. 
Um, but there are some similarities still uh, in the two models. For instance, uh, even though it does not predict a, a spread northward, still the area around Boston uh, becomes uh, a hotspot uh, by 2040. Again, Seattle comes up as one uh, potential destination for spotted lanternfly. Um, and so these similarities are probably dictated by the fact that human population density is a strong predictor uh, in both of these models and can therefore have some uh, um, attracting effect on uh, spotted lanternfly that's being transported to these locations. Right, so to sum up and draw some conclusions, uh, can we use naive models to, to forecast the spread of SLF and also other invasive pet species? Um, I would say, yes, I, I think we can, but we have uh, some notes um, of caution uh, when we do so. Um, the, the approach that I think is a, a valid one is in the absence of species specific knowledge, general models can actually provide a pretty great guidance in terms of uh, taking a prompt management action before vital knowledge is actually gathered. Uh, but as this knowledge piles up, like it's doing right now, we can then build bottom up models which provide um, a source of comparison to contrast these general models um, against. So the best approach might be to try and build several models uh, that rely on different set of assumptions and then compare notes between them. Um, in just a minute, I'll um, uh, leave the floor to Stephanie who will show you um, uh, her work on a bottom up mechanistic model that, um, that she is um, developing right now. Uh, and with this, I wanted to uh, thank uh, my co-authors, uh, the wonderful uh, members of the IECO lab, uh, the sources of funding, and of course you for your attention. And I'll just pass the uh, baton to Stephanie. Okay, thank you, Seba. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Should be, okay, great, thank you. Hi everybody, uh, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Stephanie Lafkevich and I am a postdoc in the math department at Temple University. And I am working on mathematical modeling of spotted lanternfly population dynamics with my colleagues, Seba, of course who just spoke, and Matthew Helmus and Benjamin Seibold, all of whom are at Temple with me. And I'm gonna tell you about this today. Okay, so what are the core modeling questions that we are addressing? So we are working on building and analyzing a partial differential equations or PDE model of that, that can track counts of eggs and bugs in a given location. So it is a non-spatial model in the sense that we're just looking at the growth or death dynamics in a particular place and not considering spatial spread for the moment. So we ask the question, if lanternflies were to arrive in a given location, would a population establish there or would they just die out? If they do establish, how quickly will the population grow? And are control methods likely to be effective in that area? And how can we implement them most effectively? And so the lens through which we are looking at these questions is the lens of temperature, the annual temperature profile in a given location. Here's a, some historical temperature data for Berks County where the infestation started. And so we're really asking how does temperature dictate these population dynamics? Because as we know mechanistically, the annual temperature profile is what dictates development rates and therefore the ability of the population to reach egg laying in a given year. And of course, direct mortality rates due to extreme temperatures. So that's really the focus, uh, how the effect of temperature on the populations. Okay, so to start building our model, the first thing that we do is have to look at the whole population and sort of segregate it up into qualitatively distinct life cycle or sorry, yeah, life cycles. And so what we do is we break the population up into the eggs and then lump all of the non-egg states together. So in green, you see all of the non-egg states. So we start up here with first instars, move through the nymphs and adults to the egg layers. And then we break the eggs themselves up into three subpopulations. So we distinguish between diapausing and non-diapausing eggs. And eggs go through diapause first. And then when it terminates, of course, they develop normally post-diapause. And then the eggs that don't diapause are assumed to just develop normally from the beginning. So we have these four distinct subpopulations. And it might seem a little bit strange to, and as if we are drawing particular attention to the eggs, which might in general be the less interesting stage than the nymphs and adults. 
But the reason for this is exactly what I said on the first slide, that we have to segregate the population into groups that are, in a sense, affected by temperature in the same way. And so since diapausing eggs are affected by temperature one way, uh, and it, which is different from the way non-diapausing eggs are affected by it, and different yet again from the way nymphs and adults are affected by it, this is how we have to break the population down for our model. Okay, so now that we have that basic framework in place, the next step is to go ahead and parameterize the rate functions that underlie the biology. So what this means is that we look to the field and experimental data, and Seba is leading our charge on this, and he's working with existing literature and exciting emerging research now that's coming from a lot of the people who presented their work uh, throughout the course of the day today to actually explicitly parameterize functions that describe rates at which the biological processes underlying this population dynamics occur. And so what you see on the right here are samples of some of the functions that you'll see in the equations on the next slide. So for instance, lambda here is our development rate. And nu is a parameter that allows for a little bit of variability in the development rate. And then m in the lower right is a mortality rate. And you'll see that m and lambda both depend on this other function, big T of little t, which is temperature as a function of time. So you will really see when we look at the equations that temperature is the core mechanism that is underlying the dynamics of this system. Okay, so returning to our diagram again, um, we have a, an equation that quantifies each of these four subpopulations. So I won't go into detail about what each of these equations means, but for instance, if we look at the slide, uh, sorry, the, if we look at the upper right part of the slide, we have the equation that tells us how post-diapause eggs are changing. So on the left, we have the derivative of E, which is our variable for post-diapause eggs, um, with respect to T. So it basically says that the rate at which the eggs the egg population is changing is dictated by these terms on the right. So the first ones pertain to the development rate and then the next one pertains to mortality. So this is the general structure of the PDEs that we are working with. So what do we actually do with them? Well, we solve these PDEs numerically to get age histograms. So what do I mean by an age histogram? So an age histogram is a function that looks like this. So this is just a sample for the bugs, which we had associated with the variable B. Now on the x-axis is the developmental age, and it's a relative developmental age. So it tells you where within that life stage the individuals are. So zero would correspond to individuals being at the start of the life stage, and one corresponds to individuals being at the end of the life stage. So for bugs, of course, this little area to the right of zero would be newly hatched first in stars. And then as we move to the right, we go through the rest of the instars and then through adults and finally terminating with egg laying adults near one. And then this curve here gives you the number of individuals that are of that developmental age. And so this, because what PDE equations sort of spit out to us are continuous functions of continuous variables, it looks a little bit different than the histogram um, with discrete bars that you typically see, but that's just a sort of a mathematical artifact. And this is really going to be a snapshot at one moment in time, right? It's sort of the distribution of, of individual ages at a moment in time. And we solve our PDE over the course of some potentially very long or extended period of time and look at how the age histograms change. So we might see then something like this where our initial blue curve was at the start of our observation. And as the weeks go by, the distribution shifts to the right due to aging and shifts down a little bit, maybe because there's been some death, et cetera. So we're really concerned with how these age histograms are changing with time. Okay, and so here is a video. I won't show the whole thing for the sake of time. Here's a video that we've made to show these changing histograms in action. So there's a lot going on here, but at the top we have, uh, sorry, at the top we have diapause egg uh, histogram, and the post-diapause eggs, non-diapause eggs below, and then bugs. So right now the eggs are sort of hanging out. Okay, yeah, they just started developing in April, May. And then they go into, they hatch and they move through the instars 
moving through the instars. And then once they get to the red area on the right, they will start to lay eggs. And then you'll see some diapause eggs appear here in the upper left. And so we have the temperature profile below. The vertical bar here denotes the current time in the simulation. So we can track the temperature to see how we expect the population dynamics to sort of be changing. And then at the very bottom, we have the total, sorry, we have the total population size. So the green area is the eggs, and then the other colors represent the bug life stages. So in purple, we have the instars, and then gold, the immature adults. And then finally in red, we have the egg layers again, and right, the cycle we see has repeated, and we've come back to the, the diapause eggs in the upper left. Okay, so we have these nice movies that we can look at to really see the age histograms in motion. Okay, so now what do we actually want to use these age histograms for? In addition to just, just being able to follow them, uh, as we did in the previous slide, we want to derive an approximation to the SLF reproductive number R0. So in the abstract, the definition of R0 is the number of lanternflies present in a certain year per lanternfly present in the previous year, all in a fixed location. So if R0 is greater than one, the population will grow. And if it's less than one, the population will die out. So this is, of course, a binary measure of establishment potential in that sense. But moreover, if R0 is greater than one, the actual magnitude of R0 will tell us how fast the population is growing. So if it's very, very the bigger that it is, the faster the population will expand. Okay, and just a little bit about the mathematical derivation of this number. So to derive this number, what we do is we look at the age histogram in one year, for instance, like in the plot on the left, and then we compare it with the histogram exactly one year later, the plot on the right. And we basically look at the mapping that sends this histogram on the left to the histogram one year later on the right. And we look at the eigenvalue spectrum. And <coughs> This gives us an approx a concrete approximation to the reproductive number. So in this case, um, we basically multiplied the one year histogram by two to get the second year. So we would produce a reproductive appro number approximation of two in this case. And the really cool thing about our mathematical method is that it allows us the, um, it allows us the ability to uh, derive an approximation to the reproductive number that is to a very large extent um, independent of the conditions of the lanternfly's arrival in the location. So how many there were, or exactly what time of year it was, or exactly what happened with the temperature profile in the first few weeks after it arrived. So it's really, in a sense, a general measure of the suitability of the environment to host an actual population. And so finally, I'll just show you a, a map that we have produced for our approximate reproductive numbers. So we have one at each dot that you see. In blue is where we expect the population to die out. And in red is where we expect the population to grow. And so the interesting thing, of course, is this band in between the two. That's where the reproductive number is near one. And that is basically where we expect control measures to be most effective. Because the, even if the population, even if the reproductive number is above one, it's only a little bit above one. So we would expect that a little bit of control would be able to just take the population out and get that reproductive number down below one again. Okay, so what are we working on right now? Conducting this, this analysis of the reproductive number across the United States. And then uh, when we have a good grip on the reproductive number for the stationary model, we're going to synergize with the work of Nadej, who's going to talk to you in a moment about her spread modeling to get a more complete full model of the, the growth and spread dynamics coupled together. And then we're going to work on optimal control of both the stationary model and the spatial spread model. So we'll be able to say, go to Napa Valley and pick out the GPS coordinates of any of these vineyards and predict what we expect the dynamics to look like there and to see how best to implement control methods in those locations. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, special thanks to the PDA and the USDA for all of your support of our research. And of course, um, many thanks to my colleagues on this project and the whole iEcoLab team. Okay, and I will hand the mic over to Nadej now who's going to talk to you about spread modeling. Thank you, Stephanie. So, hello, 
everyone. So I'm Nadej Beloir. I'm a postdoc at Temple University at the IECO Lab 2. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about the dispersal of the hmm? okay, the dispersal of the spotted lanternfly, sorry, uh, using spread records and landscape genetics. So first I want to distinguish the two types of dispersal uh, that I'm interested in in the context of this invasion. First, there is this diffusive spread that's the the continuous expansion of the invasion from the introduction site. And the second is the jump dispersal, and it's the establishment of satellite population away from this main invaded area. Um, that is often due to or linked to transportation, but not, not always human transportation. It's important to distinguish these two because they, they since the spread mechanism are, mechanisms aren't the same, the control strategies are not necessarily the same. So we need to, we need to distinguish them. So in the case of the spotted lanternfly, we assume that there is a human transportation, at least for some of these points. Um, and the thing is, how can we distinguish that from the diffusive spread? And fortunately, we've got um, spread records. So for each year, we can uh, measure the distance between each gray point and the introduction site and look for gaps in the distribution. Uh, so on a, on a histogram of spread distances, basically, it's looking at the first gap in the distribution. And everything that's before uh, this gap is diffusive spread. Everything that's after are, is, is, a, is a jump. So we've got a map of the locations where spotted lanternfly have jumped in the past. And if we have a look at the radius of the invasion over time, we can see that the diffusive spread um, is growing slowly over the years. And from 2018, when there is the apparition of jump dispersal, the radius of the invasion highly increases. So it, jump dispersal is really important in the dispersal of spotted lanternfly. That's how uh, spotted lanternfly can reach areas that are uninvaded and very far from the, the main invaded area. So if we have a look at the characteristics of the jump locations, um, because our, our hypothesis is that they are transported, they are they, they hitchhike, sorry, uh, we measure the distance between all of these jump location and transport infrastructures. So major roads, railroads, and ra uh, airports. And we found that all these jump locations are situated very close to transport infrastructures. But the question is, how significant is that? Because we can assume anywhere we are in the US, we are somewhat close to a road. So for that, we built a null distribution. Oh, so I'm going to explain that quickly. So uh, we've got on average, the, the distance of each uh, jump population to the nearest major road. And then we simulate a data set um, with random spread over the same geographic extent. And for each of these points, we measure the distance to uh, the nearest road. And then we take the average and we've got this first point. And then we repeat that again. We simulate random uh, spread of the spotted lanternfly. We measure the distance of each point to the nearest road. And we take the average. We've got a second point and we repeat that 10,000 times until we've got a distribution, a null distribution of a random spread of the spotted London fly. Then the important question is, um, where is the observed uh, average compared to this null distribution? So if it is within uh, the 95 person con confidence interval that is here uh, represented by the vertical lines, it means that the, the position of the, the location of this uh, jump location is random. It's not different from, from the random distribution. And if it's outside of this confidence interval, it means that there is a strong um, statistical association between the location of this jump and transport infrastructures. So let's have a look at the results. Here for the first uh, graph, we look at the major roads. Uh, here you find the simulated means. And here is the observed mean. So as you can see, uh, it's not in the 95% uh, confidence interval of the simulated means. Uh, so it means that uh, the, the jump locations are found very close to transport infrastructure. And this is not a random pattern. 
Same thing for the railways and same thing for the airports. So the conclusion is that we've got a proof that there is a, a statistical association between the fact that uh, we find spotted on the fly away from the main invaded area and the the presence of transport transport infrastructures. So that's a that's a hint for the fact that they hitchhike uh, using human transportation. But there are questions that are unanswered by spread records only, and that's where landscape genetics are very useful. So I'm going to explain very quickly the principles of uh, landscape genetics. Um, imagine you've got three different populations, A, B, C, and in each of them you've got individuals uh, represented by different colors, and these colors represent uh, genetic markers. Um, we can um, predict what is the origin of population C between population A or B based on the genetic similarity between these two populations. Um, then if we want to have an idea of um, the extent of dispersal of the pathways of invasion, we can compare the genetic distance uh, between populations to the actual geographic distance between them. So this population A doesn't have any color, it just has the, the orange color in common with the other uh, populations. So it's more genetically distance, distant, maybe that's because of um, the geographic distance between them. Or maybe that's because there is an impassable barrier between them. So we also test for the effect of landscape features between populations. Uh, and altogether, these measures um, are helpful to understand the patterns of the dispersal patterns for the spotted lanternfly and to inform management decisions. Because if we've got a, um, if we if we know there's a particular pathway for the invasion, then we can. Uh, focus management decisions on this particular pathway. So last year we were in the field, we sampled uh, location, the black dots. Uh, so in the introduction site, uh, there's Philadelphia somewhere here, uh, Harrisburg here, and also satellite populations like Altoona, Pittsburgh, and Winchester in Virginia. And we're currently doing the lab work. Uh, so, um, extracting tissue uh, from, the, from the individual, extracting DNA and using next generation sequencing, we are um, obtaining genetic markers to do all these analyses. And there are also very uh, cool stuff to do with these genetics um, analyses, but I don't have time to go through it. So it, it just uh, involves evolution during the invasion and also uh, extracting um, spatial components for improving the, the mathematical models, uh, including a spatial, yeah, a spatial component in the mathematical models. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank uh, all the people who contributed to this work and uh, the USDA and PDA who funded this research. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, but yeah, to all the presenters at uh, Matt's lab. Uh, we might have time just for a question or two. I saw there were some, I don't know Siva was keeping up, so that was great. <laughs> the questions and the, and the question and answer. But uh, yeah, I don't see any in the different, um, in either the chat or the questions and answers, but thanks again to everybody and for your presentation. And then so I'll move on to the last presentation of the day, which is, um, Devin Gatos with uh, USDA PPQ. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, yep. Can you guys see? Yeah, it's just not presenter view yet, but okay. it's up. Yeah, there it goes. Yep. Okay, good. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Greg said, I'm Devin Gatos, and I'm an agriculturalist with USDA APHIS, Plant Protection and Quarantine. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the work that I've been doing with geospatial forecasts of pests and pathogens, and then how we can apply this to spotted lanternfly. But before I get too deep into it, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that a lot of the work I'm going to be talking about today is part of a cooperative agreement that we have with the Center for Geospatial Analytics at North Carolina State University. These guys have a long history of modeling biological invasions and making decision support systems out of these models. 
prior to my time at AFIS, I was part of this research group and I contributed a lot to the development of the system that I'll be talking about today. And now that I'm at PPQ, I'm more interested in how we can apply it, you know, especially for pressing cases like spotted lanternfly. Okay, so let's take a step back and think about geospatial models of pest spread. So luckily Matt Helmus's group already, guys, already got you guys primed and thinking about what we can do with forecast, which is great because I think that there's a lot of potential uses for forecast and there's a lot of different kinds of forecast out there. So to start, we've got species distribution models like this map from Wakey et al here on the left. These models are a static representation of where a pest could ultimately establish based on environmental conditions. They're very useful for understanding how widespread the pest may become and which areas might be most at risk, but they don't tell us anything about the timeline or the pattern of spread. So they're spatial, but they're not really temporal. Then we've got phenological models like the one here in the middle. These kinds of forecasts tell us when we're likely to see different life stages of the pest emerge based on temperature and seasonality, which is very useful for thinking about when to do surveillance and treatments. But these forecasts don't tell us anything about how the pest is likely to spread, so we're still missing a big part of the puzzle. And then that brings me to spatial spread models like the one here on the right. These kinds of models simulate pest movement across the landscape, and they have both a spatial and temporal component. Like the other models here, they're based on field observations of the pest, the environmental conditions, and what we know about pest biology. But these kinds of models help us answer different questions about the patterns and the timeline of spread, which can be very helpful for assessing the situation. So I'll be focusing specifically on these types of spread models today, um, but I think it's important to understand that these different approaches are very, very complementary. And ideally, we should be using all of them to think about our pest responses. And I want to note that all of the examples shown here are for spotted lanternfly, so we already have these tools at our disposal. Matt's group just presented a lot of really good information on modeling and spread modeling in particular, um, but for this talk I'll be focusing specifically on a spread model called the POPS modeling framework developed by this group out of North Carolina State. POPS stands for Pest or Pathogen Spread, and we call it this because we can customize it for different organisms. So it's more similar to the generalist types of models that Seba was just describing. The model itself is made up of several functions with different parameters, and you can add or remove functions or change parameters to fit different species. So for example, in the case of SLF, that lethal winter temperature for eggs is very important for thinking about where it could ultimately establish. So in this case, we just added in a new function to capture this new aspect of the biology. And then as we expand this to other species, we can just continue to develop new functions and build on the same framework. And this is how we were able to use the system with the different species pictured here, including spotted lanternfly. So essentially, you know, on that generalist to specific scale, it's a generalist model, but then we make it more specific by adding in these functions. We're able to do this at least in part because the model itself is data-driven, meaning that we're calibrating the parameters directly from the pest distribution data itself. Basically, we're using a machine learning approach where we run the simulation with a random parameter set, and then we compare the simulated outputs to the actual data. Depending on how well they match, we tweak those parameters and we run it again. And we end up repeating this process hundreds of thousands of times, and this will give us the best parameters that match the data that we have. And then as we get new data from the field, we repeat this whole process. So I think the key thing here is that the model is always learning from the data, and it's generally getting better with time and with more data. And then the last thing that I think it's important to highlight is that this framework lets us test different scenarios of SLF spread and control, but I'll come back to that in more detail here in a minute. All right, first, let's take a moment to look at how the simulation works. The model takes data on plant and host density, weather and environmental suitability, and known pest locations. At the core, the model relies on three functions. Reproduction decides how many pests leave each cell, dispersal decides where they go, and establishment decides whether the pest will survive and establish a new population in that cell. At each of these steps, the density of host, the habitat suitability, 
and the weather conditions in that time step impact how likely the pest is to survive and reproduce. These three functions make up the core of the spread model. And then, like I mentioned, we add in other functions that moderate how these work to fit that species' unique biology. This process then repeats itself at every time step, which could be a day, week, month, or year, depending on the organism. And in the case of spotted lanternfly, we're using a month. And you'll end up with a map like this one showing the probability of infestation in every pixel in every time step. There's a lot of flexibility baked into the system, and I think that one of the benefits of that is that you can test out different scenarios of SLF dispersal. For example, we can look at spread under different assumptions about species biology, and I think a good relevant example right now is the host association. As people are finding that SLF can complete its life cycle on hosts other than Ailanthus, we can add in these other hosts to the model and see how that will impact the predicted spread patterns. Same thing with environmental conditions. As our knowledge of environmental requirements changes and shifts, we can change those conditions in the model and see the impact on spread. Additionally, we can look at specific hypothetical conditions. For example, what if the weather this year is especially poor for SLF survival? Or on the flip side, what if this is a particularly good year for dispersal? We can start to tease out these sorts of hypotheticals. And then lastly, like Stephanie was just saying, we can examine what would happen if it got to a new location. So for example, what if it were introduced to my hometown of Raleigh, North Carolina? What would the spread look like from this point? How fast would that spread be? Which areas around Raleigh are the most high risk? We can ask these kinds of questions with this framework, and I think that it could help us be more prepared for these kinds of events. We can also look at different treatment scenarios. So in the same way that we're adding in functions to capture different aspects of species biology, we can also add in functions to simulate treatments. These treatments remove either the host or the pest from the data, which then changes those model predictions and allows us to compare different scenarios. I think that this kind of thing can be particularly useful for thinking through big picture questions about treatment strategies. So for example, what if we prioritize treatment A versus treatment B? Or what if we change our budget? Or what if we focus on the core population instead of these outlying populations? However, for this to be an accurate representation of the system, we need to have a really good understanding of how these treatments reduce pest populations at a site. So it's still really important to do these kind of site level studies of treatment effectiveness, like the ones from Penn State and from PPQ. Those efforts are going to be really critical for informing how these treatments work in the model. And at this point, for spotted lanternfly, this isn't, this isn't something that is fully defined yet because we don't have all of the data we need. But PPQ is planning some studies for this upcoming year, which I think will help us define how these treatments work within the POPs model. Okay, so here's where we get to the interactive part. Those scenarios are very useful, but it's generally tough to create them in a code-based environment. So we're developing a website to make it a lot easier to interact with this model, and I wanna show you how this works. All right, so to start off, we wanna visualize the data that we have. These are the detection locations in Pennsylvania. We can scroll through the different years to see how this has changed through time. We can also display different layers like the host data, rail lines, intermodal trucking, airports, seaports, et cetera. Um, basically, whatever things are helpful for decision making, because this is just extra visualization. All right, now let's zoom into a specific area and consider some treatments. There's two de general types of treatments, either host removal or pest removal. And then we can break these up further, for example, into different types of pesticides, like bifenthrin or Bavaria bassiana. Um, and then these will have different parameters for things like efficacy and cost, which changes how they work in the model. We've got a point and click draw tool so that we can draw in whatever treatment shapes we need, um, which can be very helpful for these irregular shapes like around rail lines. And this lets us be as detailed as we want with this. So we could really zoom in and get very fine scale here, or we could do what they're doing here and just take a quick look at the whole area around a rail line. All right, so they're doing the same thing up in Erie. 
Okay, but sometimes you don't want to do everything freehand, and it would be easier to have predefined shapes, especially something like a circular buffer with a specific distance. And this can help us be a little bit more fine tuned and accurate than the freehand version. As we're adding in all of the treatments, the cost is being estimated in the little cost wheel to help us keep some perspective about what's feasible as we're defining these scenarios. And for each of these treatment polygons, we can go in, we can change the type of treatment, the cost, the timing, et cetera. So we can get fairly specific with each polygon. Okay, so now let's go ahead and run the forecast. By clicking this button, this will move us forward one year to 2021, and it'll just take a few minutes to run. Once it's done, we get some statistics over here on the right, comparing our treated scenario to a scenario without any treatments, which can help us evaluate that treatment effect. We can go in and change the visualizations to look at the probability, the average, the run with the least spread, the run with the most spread, all of which can, I think can be really useful for an analyst who's trying to understand the whole picture. And then we can go in and add more treatments based on what we see in the forecast. So right now in the model, we're in year 2022. And basically we're able to step through each year and apply yearly treatments, just like you would in an actual management program. And this is important because the effect of the treatment sort of compounds over time. So as you go back in and you continue to treat, you're gonna get a greater effect over the several year period. All of these things could technically be done within a code-based environment, but it would be a lot harder, even for a seasoned coder. So I think this website is really opening up this functionality and it's letting us explore the model and define scenarios in new ways. And the one area that I think that this could be particularly helpful is for when you're working with stakeholders. The idea is that different stakeholders could come together to test out scenarios and as they're doing that, they're learning about the system, they're learning about control options, but they're also learning about each other. When we've done this in the past with different pests, we found that this can be a very productive exchange of information. And I think it could be really useful for improving communication between different stakeholder groups. However, there are a couple of model improvements I'd like to make to the POPS model before I think it will be fully ready for this kind of stakeholder engagement. Things like defining how the treatments work and adding in a network model to better capture the movement along rail lines. So right now the model is only looking at natural dispersal, but we know that these human mediated dispersal events are very important. And so we're already working on adding that kind of network model for rail spread. But having said that, moving forward, I'm interested in doing some of the scenario testing with concerned stakeholders. So if you're a stakeholder and if you think you have a good use case for this model, or if there are some scenarios that you're interested in testing out, please feel free to reach out and we can get a good discussion going. My email is at the end of the presentation. And of course you can also always reach out to Greg Para and he'll get us in contact because Greg's great. So with that, I can take some questions if we have them. If not, you know, I can let you guys get out of here a little bit early because I know it's been quite a long day. So I really, if you, appreciate people sticking around this long. So, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Yeah, it still says there's uh, 200 people still here. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. All right, so there's any questions for Devin? I see any pop up in the chat or in the questions and answers. I'll just wait a couple more minutes to see. It's the end of the day. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Devin. All right. All right. Thanks, Greg. All right. And Dana, are you still on? I am still here. I, I didn't too, know if you want to do, do too something. Information is too interesting to leave. So, yes, <laughs> I'm still here. I know. I just want to make sure sometimes you have a lot of other things going on. Uh, no, I just want to see if you um, if you want to do any concluding remarks. Or, yeah. I, I would. I appreciate that, okay. Greg. Um, yep. First, I want to thank everybody who presented today. Um, a lot of really good information. I'm really glad to know that there are so many people working to try and help us find the answers that we need um, for mitigation um, and control. So thank you all very much for all the efforts that you're putting in. Um, also wanna thank um, Cornell with Brian and Nancy, uh, keeping up with the chat and the Q and A. So thank you both very much, uh, Cornell hosting for all of us. 
Um, and then, <clears throat> Greg, you've done a great job facilitating for the entire day. So thank you for all your efforts there. And you'll see on your screen now um, the group of people who worked together uh, to put the, the Spotted Lanternfly 101 on last week and then uh, the, your three days this week. So I want to give a, a big shout out to them and all the work that they did in planning the summit and making it making it a success. So I hope all of you have enjoyed it um, and hope you will be joining us tomorrow and Wednesday. There are still some slots available, so please sign up. Um, and as I mentioned, you'll hear Heather Leach tomorrow. She'll be talking about some of the work she's been doing in GRAPE um, during the extension talk. And then there's a communication talk. So what's been working, what's not been working, uh, learn from those who have experience. Um, and then on Wednesday, we have operations. So you're going to hear how different states are handling this, how USDA is working on it. And then in the afternoon, we've got stakeholders and the impact that it has on their business or the potential impact it could have. So again, thank you all for joining us today. And I hope you have a nice evening. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dana. Hey, thanks, Dana. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Matt.